hello 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 okay so we are now live on a different link woo isn't that fun uh, so apologies for everyone joining us now and apologies for everyone for the lateness um, I am going to do a few bits and pieces of technical things to get people um, over onto the right link and uh, we will be with you very very shortly uh, apologies 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 uh, and hopefully that will be the first and only uh, fuck up on today's live stream. Um, please do join the new link. I've just popped it in the YouTube chat. Well, actually, you can't hear that if you're on the old link because you are not seeing a live stream. Um, thank you for those of you who have already made the transition over to the correct live stream link. Um, I don't know what's happened. I can see there's some people coming into the to the to the live stream please do um pop in the chat when you've arrived um we're running a little bit behind schedule um because of these technical difficulties but i am going to be bringing in our first guest very very shortly um if you are watching on the live stream please do pop in the chat on the old link let people know where you are um, and also please do uh, let people know on socials on hashtag bright green live that the link has changed once we've got the first interview out of the way i'm going to then move everyone over onto the new link i'll sort out social media i'll sort out pushing people in the right direction i apologize profusely for the technical difficulties the late starting and the all-round mess that this has been thus far um i will be i'm going to be letting our first guest into the call in a moment um they will be joining us very very soon and hopefully you will be able to see their lovely and beautiful face imminently uh, apologies matthew i am going to bring you in in a moment there's been uh, a morning of technical disasters thus far um, so i'm just going to do a few bits and pieces of admin before i bring you in if that's okay um, or you've appeared on the screen, uh, so you are now broadcast to YouTube. Uh, for anyone watching, this is the first time we've done this. It's going to be chaotic, but it's going to be brilliant. I hope you're uh, in 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 your seat comfortably for a non-stop thrill ride. So I'm going to do a few bits and pieces of admin. Uh, Matthew, feel free to go off camera for a couple of moments, and then I'll bring you in um, very very soon. Um, so. Um, for those of you who are probably sitting around angrily, being like, what is this all about? What's going on? Why can't I get on the stream? Well, let me tell you, we've had a major technical difficulty. This is the first time that I've done a scheduled live stream, stream for Bright Green. And uh, inevitably, the, uh, the, the technical disaster happened. Um, so what I'm going to be doing uh, throughout the day is we're going to be interviewing people uh, from across the UK left, from social movements, from the labour movement. Um, from uh, the uh, the the wider the wider uh, left and green parties in the UK as well. There's going to be around 14 interviews. Hopefully, we're going to catch up on time and it will run smoothly from here. Uh, before I bring in our first guest, I'm just going to tweet to let people know uh, that the that the um, that the link that everyone has been looking at um, is no longer uh, working. So. Um, I will do that imminently. Make yourself a cup of tea, get yourself comfortable, um, and we will get started very, very soon. Okay, brilliant. So we have a handful of people watching. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so as we get going, it would be hugely appreciated given we've had to change the link. Um, it's just gone out on an email to our entire mailing list. Apologies for those on our mailing list. I'll try and get a, a new email out with the correct email, uh, with the correct link. Um, but please, if you are watching, do share this uh, link online so that people can see where we're actually streaming from rather than the old link. So uh, with that chaotic start out of the way, I am absolutely delighted to bring in our first guest for the day on the very first episode of Bright Green Live. So first off uh, today, we're going to be joined by Matthew Hull. Now, for those of you who don't know, Matthew is the uh, trade union liaison officer for the Green Party of England and Wales. He's also the chair of the Green Party Trade Union Group. And we're going to be talking over the next few minutes about uh, the Labour movement in the UK and how Greens can relate to it. Uh, so welcome, Matthew. How are you doing on this extremely chaotic morning? 
Um, I'm, I'm great. I'm suddenly feeling more stressed than I was, but no, this is great. Um, it's an honor to be the, the, the very first guest. And I'm sure in, in a few years, we'll all look back on it and I'll be immensely proud. So yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And no matter how stressed you are, you are undoubtedly less stressed than I was five minutes ago, uh, but the stress is slowly subsiding. We're getting there. Um, so uh, please do, if you're watching, pop some questions in the chat on YouTube or on the hashtag Bright Green Live on social media, and we'll try and pick up some of your questions as well. Um, but to kick us off, Matthew, um, what do you think that the current wave of strike action means for the Labour movement? So that's a really big question. Um, I'll try and sort of answer it in brief and hopefully we'll be able to dig down into it a bit further. Um, I think, first of all, it means that people are really angry, really angry at the sort of multiple crises that we're experiencing and the way that that is sort of cashed out in our daily lives. Um, angry about how wages have been falling um, for decades, really, but especially over the last decade of Tory misrule. Uh, angry at how social housing hasn't been built in many areas um, for years and years and years. Angry at the increasing prices of energy, of food, of rent, um, of the cost of living in general. And I think um, for the trade union movement, this is a really important moment because that anger that people are feeling um, is starting to sort of turn into action and it's starting to be expressed um, in political terms perhaps in ways that we've not seen um, for a very, very long time. I think another thing that's really important from the Labour movement's perspective is that we're seeing a real sort of like snowball effect. Um, we're seeing um, trade unions, particularly like the RMT and the CWU in particular, but um, looking across the movement in general uh, to my union, Unite as well, uh, we're seeing a demonstration effect where people are uh, seeing strike action, you know, in the news, um, on the streets, um, in their workplaces often, um, in a really big way, in a way that we haven't seen for many, many years. And I think this all presents, um, you know, a, a great many opportunities um, for the movement that we can't afford to let up. Um, I think we have the chance to show real um, active and, and increasingly political leadership um, bringing together the different strands um, of the campaigns against the cost, the rising cost of living, um, whether that's, um, you know, in our homes um, against right, uh, rising rent, um, whether that's in our workplaces um, against um, falling wages and worsening conditions, um, or whether that's um, against the sort of rising cost of energy. I think the trade union movement has a real chance to bring all of those strands together and play a really um, like obvious and prominent political role in a way that we haven't seen um, for many decades um, and I think that's really really exciting. So obviously you uh, part of your political activity comes from the trade union movement but also you are a Green Party member an activist and the Green Party's trade union uh, liaison officer. Um, so why do you think that Greens should be supporting unions and workers that are engaged in industrial action right now? That's a good question. And I think there's a really simple answer to this. And then there's a, a more complicated answer. I think the simple answer is it's, it's who we are. Um, Greens, when we see injustice in society, when people come to us to ask for our help, to ask for our support, to ask for our solidarity, um, we respond in the affirmative. Um, we get out with them, we stand with them, because it's the honest thing to do. And I think that's what people look to the Green Party for. They look to us for a clear voice against injustice wherever it pops up. They don't look to us to triangulate, to try and sort of get around things or to refuse um, to refuse to be honest about where we stand. Um, we need to be very clear um, that we stand on, on the side of workers because it's, it's why people join the Green Party, it's why people get involved and it's why people vote for us as well. I think the more complicated answer to your question um, is actually really interesting. And I think um, it's something like this. Um, we as Greens, as the Green Party and as the wider sort of climate justice movement, we need workers to win. Um, we need to be building um, workers' confidence, both in their workplaces, um, on the streets, um, you know, in our tenants' unions and so on and so forth. Um, and we need to sort of build a confidence um, in sort of collective action more generally. And that's absolutely critical. As Greens, we ask people to sort of take a leap of faith to imagine that a better world is possible and that it's it's not only possible but attainable if we all get together and we all work together to achieve it and to force that fundamental change um, from um, you know, from the government to force fundamental changes in the system that, that currently governs us. Um, that's an immense step to ask people to take. And I think um, we start getting people to the stage where they can place that trust in us um, by building confidence that people have in each other. 
Um, and I think that starts by asking people to trust each other, by asking people to get together and say, we deserve better than this. And not only that, but we can get better than this if we all come together and get it. And I think that's the real power, um, particularly of sort of collective action in the workplace, where we spend, you know, up to half of our waking lives, often more. Um, I think that's that's the real power of it. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important for Greens to get behind this because our success as a political movement depends on building that confidence that only trade unions um, can, can really achieve. And the other thing I'll just add before you, you come back in is that I think the trade union movement also needs political leadership right now. Um, I said in answer to your first question that uh, the movement has a real opportunity to bring together these different strands um, of anger that people are feeling at the crises that we're facing. And that's true. But I think we also need leadership on, on the political stage. We need a political party, a political movement that is prepared to stand with the trade union movement and say, no, this is right. Um, this is good. This is what we need the government to be responding to. And we need the government to be listening and most of all we need a change in government um, right now um, and we're clearly not going to get that from any of the other uh, UK parliamentary parties we're not going to get it from the Liberal Democrats surely we're definitely not getting it from the Labour Party right now who seem desperate to avoid these questions and when they do have to answer these questions they generally say oh you know um, we, we have to be sort of you know moderate we have to avoid um, agreeing to workers demands we need a party that is prepared to stand with workers um, throughout this struggle until we win. And I think the Green Party uh, is the only party that has shown that it's prepared to do that right now. So uh, there's already some questions coming in in the chat. That's brilliant. Please do send more questions for Matthew um, and we'll try and get to as many of them as possible. But before I come to the questions in the chat, one of the uh, arguments that you've made previously, and it's one that I think is, is, is potentially contentious amongst some Greens, is that uh, Greens should be supporting workers' struggles no matter what industry they're in and defending jobs in, 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 in and def when workers are standing up and defending their jobs and their pay, uh, even in polluting industries, Greens should be standing uh, so shoulder to shoulder with them, say, for example, in the avi industry, aviation industry. Why do you think that that should be the case? So if you don't mind, Chris, I'll sort of challenge the premise of your question a little bit. Um, I don't think this is actually super contentious among Greens. I think when we get down to the heart of this issue, when we cut through um, all of the spin, when we cut through um, all of the sort of buzz around this, um, what it comes down to is that Greens think that workers um, deserve decent pay, fair conditions. And we don't think that people sort of stop deserving those things as soon as they happen to have worked in a socially harmful industry. The truth is that so much of our economy right now is socially harmful. Um, many of you listening, like, um, and I'll include myself in this, have worked for organisations in the past that aren't sort of perfect. And we don't do that because we necessarily believe 100% in, in what we're doing. We do it because we need to we need to work to, to live, to survive. That's, that's the fundamental sort of position we're in. Um, so I don't think it is super contentious in that way, um, but I do think it is really important so, sort of to address the role that, um, that, that workers in sort of environmentally harmful industries have to play um, in our movement, um, because I think that they have a really, really important role to play. Um, and I think it's important for us to point out that, you know, axing pay, like cutting jobs or um, slashing pensions in the aviation industry, for example, won't keep a single plane out of the air. It won't keep a single um, drop of oil in the ground. It won't keep um, any CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, over the past couple of decades, the number of jobs in total in aviation and surrounding industries has fallen. And yet the, the um, sort of the number of flight miles that we've seen has only continued to grow worldwide. Um, so when we talk about sort of fighting the aviation industry and being prepared to sort of wind that down and transition um, to a, a more environmentally just future, um, we need to be very clear that, that our, our enemy is the aviation industry and not the, the workers in it. Um, we should never confuse um, the workers in an industry for those who, who exploit them and who profit from them. And I think um, in the process of building a political coalition that can support and drive for a just transition, we need to be bringing um, workers in these industries into that coalition. They need to be at the very heart of it. Um, after all, um, they're going to be most directly affected by any transition, but they also have the skills that we're going to need um, as a society if we want to start building the new industries that we want to see. Um, aviation um, workers, whether they're engineers, whether they're staff um, on the ground in airports, or whether they're 
um, staff, you know, in the air have immense skills. And it's only with their active participation that I think we're going to be able to successfully transition away from um, the polluting industries that we have now and towards something, something better. We've got about a dozen people watching, which um, is a shame because there were over a dozen people in the waiting room on the last uh, link. So um, what I would ask everyone watching to do right now is to firstly hit the like button on this video. Um, I want you to stroke the algorithm um, so that this starts appearing in more people's feeds. What I would also love it if you could do is if you could share the new link to this stream, preferably um, on socials with the hashtag bright green live. And of course, pop your questions and comments in the chat and we're gonna try and pick up as many of them as possible. I've got one final question for Matthew before I go to the chat. Um, and that question is, what does, what should uh what there apologies everyone my stressful morning has uh tied my tongue uh so uh i'm gonna read off my my sheet if that's okay uh because apparently i can't uh do sibilance this morning um so what should solidarity with striking workers look like for greens yeah i think we should have chris say that five times very quickly and see how that goes um yeah, I mean, this is this is a good question, and this is the golden question because, after all, um, you know, we you've asked several good questions, but it comes down to action. You know, what are we going to do about this as a party? Um, I think the first thing to say is that that many greens, many hundreds of greens across the country are already doing this. Right, there are some great examples that we can point to. Um, we can point to uh, Councillor Joe Bird in the Wirral, um, who supported um, workers in in her council um, in fighting for better paying conditions. Um, we can point to um, Councillor Zoe Garbert um, in Hackney, who's worked closely with couriers um, in her ward and across Hackney um, in fighting for better uh, working conditions um, in relation to, you know, the, the sort of food deliveries they make. There are so many examples that we can already point to. I think in terms of things that we want to be seeing more of, and um, I'll certainly be pushing for more of um, with the trade union group uh, and in my position on the Green Party executive, um, I think we need this to get much, much bigger and we think we need it to get much, much more coordinated. Um, I want to see um, as um, sort of industrial disputes sort of continue to grow and to um, to progress. I want to see Greens um, supporting uh, trade unionists sort of on the street, using our leadership in communities, assisting with things like fundraising, um, like sort of you know practical support on the ground, the kinds of things that really do sustain um, strikes, to sustain sort of disputes over months and months and months, exactly the kind of thing that we're going to need to see, but that often falls beneath the radar. Um, and I think we need to see that on a more sort of um, sustained basis. Um, so what I'm going to be looking to do is to assist um, local and regional Green parties to start doing this in a more sort of substantial way, um, using the influence that we already have when we have councillors in, in council chambers, but also encouraging local parties who don't already have councillors um, to start doing some of that fundamental organising work um, to support, to fund, um, to sustain um, trade unions and striking workers um, as they continue in their struggles. Um, and I think that's that's what it's going to look like. It's a very complicated picture. I don't think it's something that anyone can summarise in a few seconds or even a few minutes. Um, but there's clearly a lot of work to be done. Um, and I think we need it to be more coordinated than ever if we're going to provide that sort of political leadership that I talked about earlier. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. So I'm going to take a couple of quick questions from the chat. I'm aware we've kept you longer uh, than intended because of the late start. And I've got another guest, guest uh, joining at 10.45. So I'm just going to uh, run through a couple of the ones that we've got come in. Um, so this one has come in from Finn White. Thank you so much, Finn, for your question. Um, so how do you think that the trade union movement can intersect with other movements like those for anti-racism and trans rights? Uh, that's a really good question, and um, I don't claim any sort of special expertise on this, um, but I will give it a go. I think that um, the trade union movement has, you know, I think in many respects a really, really proud history, um, particularly in the past um, few years, past few decades of working with um, and, and, and working within uh, movements against racism and against um, homophobia, transphobia and all forms of, of discrimination. I think although um, although the trade union movement often came to these things too late, um, it was, you know, 
it, it should have like it should always have happened sooner. I think the trade union movement has nonetheless been sort of ahead of the curve in many respects um, in sort of ultimately um, listening to those voices that needed to be listened to and, and taking the fight to discrimination. Um, I think the trade union movement and the TUC across the board um, is broadly speaking um, sort of definitely ahead of the UK media and definitely ahead of the UK government in terms of supporting um, trans rights. Um, I think that's really good. And I think that when we're fighting for those, um, you know, those things um, within our own organisations like the Green Party, we should be pointing to the trade unions and saying, look, um, this is where the UK's workers, this is where the biggest civil society organisations in the UK bar none are. Um, and we should be we should be proud of that. Um, I think uh, I think it's really important for trade unions to be using their sort of active and increasingly visible role to support these movements. I think we need to make sure that our own um, trade unions don't sort of lapse into a more sort of conservative stance. You know, when the UK, you know, the UK's sort of right wing media goes after um, goes after anti racist movements when they go after um, campaigners um, for Black Lives, campaigners against um, police brutality and, and, and murder by the police. Um, the trade unions shouldn't um, shouldn't be quiet. Um, in fact, we, we should be proudly um, in support of those movements. And we should be offering them practical support as well. Um, after all, um, trade unions are some of the biggest and, and sort of often best equipped movements on the UK left, and they should be using those resources and that equipment um, to support movements that don't have all of those things already. Um, and so I think those are some of the things that we can we, we can start to do as a movement. Thank you so much, Matthew, for being our very first guest on the very first episode of Bright Green Live. I know there are more questions in the chat. We're not going to have time to take them, unfortunately, because of the late start. Um, but we've got an amazing lineup of guests who you can stick questions uh, in for coming up soon. So thank you so much for joining us, Matthew. Thank you very much for having me, Chris. So uh, apologies for the chaotic start to your Sunday morning. Uh, you should have seen the incredible, uh, motivating, inspiring introduction that I had lined up to kick off this live stream at 10 a.m. on the dot uh, without the frantic energy that was brought as we were bringing uh, Matthew into the call. So I'm going to give you a little bit of that now um, in place of doing it earlier. Um, so. I'm aware that we're sort of, you know, half an hour into the show already and I haven't really explained what it is. Um, so Bright Green Live is a new monthly show that's going to be bringing you interviews with people from the trade union movement, from the UK's Green Parties, from social movements and the arts. It's going to be broadcasting on the second Sunday of every month, uh, hopefully on the link that we've circulated in advance or in this kind of chaotic uh, second link instead, if that goes wrong again. Um, but we're going to be bringing some of the most amazing, inspiring, interesting guests right to your living room or your bedroom or your train or wherever you're watching this from. And today we have one of those amazing lineups, which I'm just going to quickly run down so that you know what's coming up today. So next up, in about five minutes time, we have Anna Oppenheimer, uh, Anna Oppenheim, sorry, from uh, the Labour Campaign for Free Movement. She's going to be talking to us about the Labour Party's policies on migration, what they currently are and what they should be. After Anna, we have an incredible guest, which is Jean Lambert. Now, Jean was a MEP for London um, for, uh, I think, getting on 20, no, I think, yeah, it was 20 years. Um, and she is going to be talking about her friend and colleague, Keith Taylor, who sadly died at the end of October. We're going to be talking about his life and his legacy and the impacts that he had, not only um, uh, within the Green Party, but, uh, you know, across Europe in his role as an MEP. We've then got two guests who are going to be joining us simultaneously. We have Jay Kerr from No Sweat, the anti-sweatshop organisation. And we have Kaing Zha Ong, who is the president of the Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar. They're going to be talking about the campaign to kick Western brands out of Myanmar as a result of the human rights and labour rights abuses that have been initiated um, since the military coup. Kicking into the afternoon, we will have Emily Apple, who is an editor at The Canary. The Canary is a um, left-wing online 
website and um, they have just really excitingly relaunched as a cooperative so we're going to be talking to her about why the canary has decided to go down that route to launch as a workers co-op um, and uh, kick out the bosses um, after lunch uh, we will be having a short little break in the middle for lunch um, we're going to be joined by jane baston um, who is the co-chair of the young greens we're going to be discussing the state of the student movement and the role of the young greens within it um, following her, we've got Anthony Slaughter, who is the leader of the Wales Green Party. The Wales Green Party has just set up a new uh, body with Plaid Cymru to make the case for an independent Wales. We're going to be talking about that body, what it, what it is, what it's going to be doing, how it's going to be making the case for Welsh independence. We've then got Vix Lovian, who is the uh, Green Party's education spokesperson. The conversation we've just had with Matthew about the ongoing industrial disputes is going to be a theme that's going to run throughout that conversation with VIX too, because teachers unions in the NASUWT, the NEU and the NH the NAHT are balloting for strike action and there are major issues in our schools and we're going to be talking about all of that. We then have another uh, guest who's going to be talking about the Labour Party. We have Chris Saltmarsh who is the found the co-founder of Labour for a Green New Deal and a climate activist who's going to be talking all about the Labour Party's climate policies, where they, again where they are and where they should be. Um, to uh, complement the conversation we're having with Anna at the start in a few minutes time, we've then got Banali Hamdash, who's the Green Party's migration spokesperson, who's going to be talking about the um, the government's current uh, anti-migrant rhetoric and policies, the impact that's having and what the Green Party's response should be. Uh, closing off the day, we've got two final guests, the first of which is Guy Ingerson. Now, Guy is a uh, Scottish Greens um, activist who was behind the motion that was passed to uh, cut the Scottish Greens' ties with the Green Party of England and Wales over um, issues around transphobia within the Green Party. Uh, he's going to be talking about that, why he, why he proposed that motion and what the impact of it is. And finally, our headline act, our main event, right at the end of the day, in the evening, it will be dark. Uh, you'll be knackered I certainly will be knackered um, is uh, our main event is Zach Polanski who many of you will know is the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales and we're going to be talking about the constitutional crisis the country is currently going through how we fix it and what a new green democratic settlement would look like so that's our amazing lineup over the next uh, seven and a bit hours uh, there are let me just check uh, there are currently 13 people watching this stream. That's not enough. We need to hit 20 early in the morning. Let's get this stream shared. So please do like this video, share this video on socials, preferably with the hashtag Bright Green Live. I can see people have already done it on Twitter. I can see people have already done it on Mastodon, that new uh, quirky little place that some people have popped over to. Say hello in the chat um and uh and, and make sure that you subscribe to the channel too that'll get more people watching this hearing from the fascinating conversations that we're having today i can see two important two more people have already joined since i said there were 13 people watching so clearly that is working um so throughout the day i've got some questions that i'm going to be putting to the guests but uh, please do also put your questions in the chat and let us know what you want asked as well. We've already had some brilliant ones um, for, for Matthew that we had at the start of the day. Um, there's plenty more um, that you can stick in the chat for as well. Um, so thank you to Rosie for saying that it's a great lineup. Much appreciated. Ben Samuel for your questions, Matthew. Sorry we didn't get to it. And Finn White um, for being the first questioner read out on bright green live now without further ado i can see that our next guest has entered the waiting room on the old zooms so i'm going to let them in and um when they have arrived we'll kick ourselves off with the next interview so our next guest uh, is the amazing anna oppenheim who is from the labor campaign for free movement anna you're broadcasting live on youtube how are you doing Hello, hello, I'm good. How are you? I am very well. Slightly stressful morning. We had uh, the biggest tech issue you could possibly imagine, um, but we oh, are no. moving forward and we are live now. Um, so I'm going to kick you off uh, with the first question, Anna, which is that so over the last few weeks, we've had key figures uh, in the Labour front bench, including Starmer, uh, Keir Starmer himself, 
uh, making a number of kind of deeply reactionary statements around migration. So, you know, in his conference speech, Keir Starmer talked about a points based immigration system. You've seen, um, you know, Rachel Reeves talking about p more people needing to be deported. And that's the pot problem with the current Tory immigration policy. Um, Starmer again has said that, you know, the NHS is over reliant on migrant workers. And you had Stephen Kinnock the other day talking about reintroducing ID cards. Um, what do you, some of these things appear to be Labour policy, some of them don't, but they all appear to be bad news. What do you understand the Labour Party's current migration policy to be? To be completely honest with you, I'm not even sure the front bench knows what its immigration policy is. As you've already said, a lot of these announcements are not actual policies. They're dog whistles, they're kind of vibes, they're meant to reassure people who are anti-immigration. Uh, but very few of them are anything concrete, like the ID cards thing. Yvette Cooper then came on the news saying it's not actually policy. Um, truth is, we don't know. Like talking about points based system, like a points based system is a very vague term that actually means very little. It means not not free movement. It's basically a dog whistle signaling there's going to be some kind of tough on immigration arrangement, um, bringing to mind Australia that's famous for its brutal border regime. But in practical terms, it doesn't actually say very much. Um, I think, basically, Labour wants to avoid the topic altogether, um, send kind of mixed signals, obviously, when Keir Starmer stood for leadership. He stood on progressive pledges, including to defend migrant rights. Now, he seems to be rolling back, but uh, with very few specifics. Um, so fundamentally, um, I can imagine if Labour does get into power, being very susceptible to pressure from either side, because immigration is simply not a topic that they seem very ideologically committed to, uh, to having a specific vision for what the system should look like. So I'm going to come on to, I guess, that, that question about pressure and how uh, the Labour Party's position could be shifted. But um, naturally, so you're from uh, Labour Campaign for Free Movement. Obviously, you take a very different perspective on migration to that which has been put forward by the Labour front bench. Um, so what what would your ideal of an immigration system look like? So as a campaign, um, we have a motion that we've been putting forward to local parties and to Labour Conference nationally as well, which kind of lays out some of the key policies that you would want to see. I mean, firstly, ending all hostile environment measures. Uh, we don't actually know what Labour's current policy is on the hostile environment. It's not been clear, but things like, you know, right to work checks on restrictions of migrants using the NHS, like all of that needs to go. Um, ending detention. Nobody should be in prison just because of where they're from. Um, I think that's that should be very clear. Um, giving asylum seekers the right to work, it makes no sense that there is refugees in this country uh, who've been around sometimes for years waiting for their claims to be processed, who can't even get a job. Um, a very important one, abolishing no recourse to public funds. So a policy that um, means migrants are not able to claim benefits um, if something goes wrong. Um, you know, not able to kind of claim housing support, that means a lot of people end up being homeless and destitute. Uh, we saw the impacts of that in the pandemic when people lost their jobs, uh, like that policy needs to go. We also talk about giving migrants the right to vote. I think that's an important one because politics shouldn't just be something that's being done to us, you know. Very often we see panels on immigration um, with full of white English men um, with no actual migrants involved. We think migrants are people of agency. And that's why the right to vote um, for people who, you know, live here, pay taxes here, have to follow the laws here. It just makes sense for us to also have a say. Um, then we're also talking about pursuing free movement agreements, uh, possibly tied to trade deals. Obviously, our campaign launched um, during the kind of Brexit debate um, where EU free movement was still on the table. Um, now, you know, whether that's free movement with Europe or with other countries, we think a kind of beans should not have more right to move than a human being does. And finally, you know, I think it's important for the Labour Party and for our movement to challenge reactionary narratives. Um, when the Tories, you know, go on the news talking about migrant invasion, using language that provokes terrorist attacks, Labour should be not just criticizing them on competence, but actively pushing back. Because what people think about immigration is not a result of you know, what impacts their lives. Um, 
immigration numbers, there's not like bring immigration numbers and anti-migrant sentiment. What does shape public opinion is what people see in the news. And that's why it's so important to have alternative voices um, in the Labour Party and beyond. So before I come on to the next question, for people watching, uh, please do pop questions in the chat on YouTube or on social media, and we'll try and pick up as many of them as we can in the time that we've got. Um, so you talked a little bit earlier about, um, I guess, you feeling that the Labour Party will be susceptible to pressure on migration from either side, um, particularly, I guess, the, the next Labour government. Um, I guess the, the, the counter argument to that is that, you know, the there's a massive gulf between the kinds of policies and uh, vision that you've kind of articulated there and what the Labour Party is currently um, kind of pushing from its leadership and from the front bench. Um, and also over the last um, two years, you've seen uh, the uh, hollowing out of the left within the Labour Party. You've seen uh, masses of left wing members either leaving or being kicked out of the party. Um, so what does the strategy look like in that context for shifting the Labour Party's position on migration? There's a few different sides to our strategy. Um, firstly, you know, what we've always done is been kind of speaking inside the party, speaking to members, passing motions in local parties, passing motions at conference, um, writing to kind of like labor specific publications like Labour List, making that argument from the grassroots. And there's also a lot of good stuff that's happening locally immigration. We've previously done work with local government. Um, to get, um, you know, for example, councils to fund free school meals for migrant children um, or to remove um, home office officers uh, to not collaborate with hostile environment. Um, in my constituency Labour Party in Camberwell and Peckham, we've got Labour councillors and, and the party itself uh, supporting like anti-rage networks. Uh, that kind of local, local work is also very valuable. Secondly, we have a kind of parliamentary strategy. We've previously um, written to all Labour MPs and candidates. I will be doing this again, asking them to pledge to support migrants, trying to have these conversations with individual MPs. And we have had, um, you know, very vocal supporters, people like Nadia Whittam, who's been with our campaign for a very long time, um, Paul Sweeney, the MSPs in Scotland, um, Clive Lewis, um, various sort of high profile Labour figures who have been making that case uh, that we're advocating. But then as well as uh, trying to kind of gain more support within the party, I think it's also important to speak to the country and speak to our society. Um, and that's why we've organized protests. We've uh, gone on protests recently um, at the Manson Detention Center. Um, sometimes we organize kind of labor blocks to go on pro-migrant protests. Um, yeah, try to kind of get in the news beyond just labor um because as i said like labor is susceptible to what's happening on the ground and to shifts in public opinion and we know that public opinion and immigration can change very easy very very quickly um depending on the kind of stories people hear so yeah speaking both out on inside and outside of the party is what we're trying to do so uh my final question to you um before i bring in uh, any questions that come in from the chat um so a lot of people who will be watching this stream will be either members or supporters of the Greens. And some of them will be thinking, um, look, the, the Labour Party, um, again, is, uh, you know, playing into the right and the Tories game on migration, just as they did um, in the 2010s under Ed Miliband or as they did under Blair and Brown. Uh, this is the Labour Party reverting to type. And actually, if you if you want a party that supports um, free movement, if you want a party that supports mig migrants, then the Green Party is the party that offers that. Why are they wrong? I wouldn't say necessarily they're wrong. What I would say is that realistically, um, progressive change in this country will happen through a Labour-led government. Obviously, that's not the only way a change happens, right? We need activism on the ground, but we also need a government that's at least susceptible uh, to pressure from the grassroots. Um, with the Tories, I mean, they're dead set on attacking migrants, um, partly even to distract from their own economic failures for how much they're failing working class people. They want to direct anger towards migrants, that's their ideology. Whereas a Labour government 
could be um, more open to being influenced. And, you know, realistically, we've, we're under first price of post, right? Like, much as there is a lot of wonderful people in, in the Green Party who do brilliant work, um, realistically, um, it will have to be at least a Labour-led government that will introduce progressive change in this country. I mean, the other argument I make is that, um, you know, la Labour has been historically and is the party of trade unions. And I think if we're making the argument about migrants also being workers, the argument that the way to stop undercutting wages is not to close the borders, but is to organize a strike. I think it's important to be active within the kind of labor movement and the political representation of that has historically been the Labour Party. Um, so that's the reasons why personally I'm a Labour member and why I think it's important to, even though it can be an uphill struggle and be frustrating, um, engage with the kind of labor movement we have. So I said it was my last question, but actually what you just said there has is, is, is triggered another one. Um, so you talked there about you know trade unions and the labour movement playing an important role in this question. And over the last few months, we've seen the PCS play a, a quite important role um, in resisting the government's um, anti-migrant policies, um, because of course the PCS represents and is the union for people who work um, in the border force. Um, and so they have opposed um, uh, for example, the, the the attempts to push back boats, uh, have opposed the Rwanda deportation policy, um, all the kind of most hideous aspects of the um, the kind of government's policies. Um, so, what what would you like to see trade unions doing more of um, in in fighting for a fairer migration system? No, you're you're completely right. Um, you know, without uh, workers, um, no deportation flight can take off. Um, no attention center can function. There is no deportation raids without the people who implement that. And, uh, you know, equally in the NHS, we've seen doctors and, and other NHS staff organizing against the hostile environment, making a case for healthcare to be truly universal. Um, I think it's, it's massively important for unions to take on that fight, to say, firstly, we don't want to be complicit in any anti-migrant measures, but also those with, um, you know, maybe lesser less of a direct link. Um, you know, we've seen, um, for example, the um, God, Firefighters Union, <laughs> FBU, uh, consistently take a very progressive um, pro-migrant position. The Bakers Union equally, um, you know, making the case they represent all working class people, regardless um, what the passport says. Um, and yeah, I think the more the more we hear that, the more um, you know, here the case that uh, the enemy is is not, you know, a neighbor, uh, a colleague with foreign accent. The enemy is exploitative bosses and the Tories. Um, the more we can really unite people and win, win not just for migrants, but win for the entire working class. Thank you so much, Anna, for joining us this morning. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I'm sure that's triggered lots of thoughts in people who are watching, um, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us, Anna. Thank you so much. So uh, that was Anna Oppenheim from the Labour Campaign for Free Movement. I am sure that uh, there were many things in what Anna said that you uh, found interesting, engaging, potentially things that you agreed with, potentially things that you disagreed with. Let us know what you thought about that conversation in the chat um, and on socials on hashtag bright green live. So things are starting to run a little more, bit more smoothly than they were earlier in the day and we still have an amazing lineup of guests to come so please do uh, stay tuned for all of that our next guest is um we're incredibly privileged to have jean lambert the former mep for london she's going to be talking about her former friend and colleague uh, the late keith taylor who sadly died at the end of october we're going to be discussing his impact and his legacy on the green party on the uk on politics more broadly and of course on the whole of the european union as he was a legislator in the european parliament so she's going to be joining us at 11 15 for that conversation so stay tuned for that in the meantime please do let us know what you think about the conversation we've had already in the chat i'll read out some of your comments um, as we go along there's 14 people currently watching what i would love for all 14 of you to do is to hit that like button on the video stroke the algorithm make the algorithm happy and let's get more people watching this video you could also share this stream on 
uh, socials on hashtag bright green live and that means that more people will be seeing the show throughout the day of course uh, we had a slight drop off in the morning because of the problems with the link so make sure you share the link that we are now streaming from so people can find it um so uh, we're going to take a short five minute break because i've got some admin to do in the aftermath of the uh technical difficulties we had at the start so um you're going to see my bookcase for five minutes i'm going to be dashing around trying to sort things out and we're back in five but please keep watching please keep sharing let us know what you think in the chat um have a start a conversation there hit that like button and of course of course of course subscribe to bright green so you never miss out on any of the videos we are putting out. I'll be back in five.
Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome back to the first ever episode of Bright Green Live. Now, unfortunately, I had a massive jazzy thing that was going to be like back in five minutes. And unfortunately, uh, for some reason, that didn't work. So instead, you just got my name. Um, if any of you were confused, my name is Chris and I didn't introduce myself at the beginning of the stream. So my name is Chris. I am the editor of Bright Green and I'm going to be hosting Bright Green Live all throughout the day. Um, so we're going to be streaming until 6 p.m. So make sure you stick around uh, for the amazing lineup of guests that we have with us today. I'm just going to run through again who those guests are because it is an amazing lineup. Up at 11.15 in about 10 minutes time, we have Jean Lambert. Now, for those of you who don't know, Jean was an MEP for London for the Green Party for 20 years. She worked closely with Keith Taylor, um, who was an MEP for nine years. Keith sadly died um, on the 31st of October, and she's going to be talking about his life and legacy, his work, the impact that he's had on the Green Party, but also on politics more broadly across the whole of the European Union. We have two amazing guests at 12 o'clock. We have Jay Kerr from the anti-sweatshop campaign group No Sweat, and we have um, Kain Zar Ung from uh, the Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar. They're going to be talking about the situation in Myanmar for trade unions and the labour and labour rights, um, and why they're campaigning to get Western fashion brands kicked out of that country. We've got Emily Apple from The Canary talking about why uh, that publication has relaunched as a cooperative. Jane Baston from The Young Greens talking about the student movement and the role of The Young Greens within it. Anthony Slaughter from the Wales Green Party talking about the launch of the, um, the new body, uh, the Future Cymru Forum. We have Chris Saltmarsh from Labour for a Green New Deal, Vix Laudian, the education spokesperson for the Green Party, Benali Hamdash, the Green Party's migration spokesperson, Guy Ingerson from the Scottish Greens talking about the motion that he successfully proposed for the Scottish Greens to cut their ties with the Green Party of England and Wales over allegations of transphobia. And finally, 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 we have Zach Polanski, the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, who's going to be talking a little bit about the constitutional settlement uh, that we currently have in the UK, why our constitution is broken and how we can fix it. So that's our lineup for the day. Absolutely amazing. We've got some brilliant speakers and guests that we're going to be talking to throughout the day. Uh, there's eight people currently watching. We've had a little bit of a drop off from that break, but we can get more people on this stream if you hit that like button, if you share the stream, and if you let us know what you thought about the conversation so far in the chat. The chat has been very quiet so far. It's getting lonely here. Um, I know there's lots of you out there watching, but it would be lovely if you could let me know uh, what you thought about the conversation so far. And of course, get some questions lined up for our guests. It's much easier for me to pick up questions if they come in in advance. So please do pop them in the chat and we'll try and pick them up. You can also put your questions and comments on the hashtag Bright Green Live on Twitter, on any of the socials. Um, Mastodon, if you're into that new... Uh, quirky little world um, or on other social media platforms too and we'll try and pick up your comments and questions from there as well. Now um, for those of you who don't know Bright Green is I mean you've, you've been watching the stream so you've probably got a pretty good idea but Bright Green is not bankrolled by billionaires and big business we rely solely on the kind and generous donations of people like you. The only reason why we're able to run uh, this show the only reason why we're able to run uh, all the articles we publish on our website on the uk labor movement on green parties on social movements and the wider left is because of contributions small and regular from folks just like you so if you've enjoyed this show so far if you want to see more shows like it please do head to bright green dot org forward slash donate set up a regular donation and we can keep uh, running things like this we can improve our production values hey we might even be able to get someone else in the room to help with the tech uh, so that i'm not running it just by myself and um, the best way to make that happen is to head to bright green dot org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation of about five pounds a month or whatever you can afford so that bright green can keep running so we've got nine people watching. Uh, let's get more people in here. I can see someone's just clicked likes on the stream. Thank you very, very much. If you haven't already, hit subscribe. That means that you won't miss out on any of the other videos that we're putting out, including episode two of, um, of Bright Green Live, which we'll be broadcasting on the second Sunday of December, a very festive edition. Uh, it won't be remotely festive. It will be the same thing as this, but with uh, a whole different lineup and array of 
guests already booked for that uh, show on the 11th of December is Rhea Patel, who is a Green Party councillor in Croydon. So if you want to hear what Rhea has to say, hit that subscribe button and you won't miss out on that show. Um, so please keep your comments coming in the chat. Um, thank you, Finn. You said that you really like both guests so far. We've got a great lineup. I agree too. Uh, now, I'm sure that um, for the Green, Green Party members and supporters that are watching, um, some of the uh, contributions from Anna uh, from the Labour Campaign for Free Movement uh, might have been a little bit contentious. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what Anna said, particularly about the role of the Labour Party uh, when it comes to uh, building a fair and humane migration system. Uh, but also let me know what you thought about Matthew Hull, who is the Green Party Trade Union Liaison Officer as well, and his um, views on the role of the Labour movement and how Greens should be relating to that. Um, so we're going to be kicking off with our next interview in four or five minutes time when uh, we will have Jean Lambert, the um, MEP former MEP for London, who will be talking about the life and legacy of her friend and colleague, Keith Taylor, who sadly passed away earlier this year. I'm just going to do a little bit of admin uh, whilst I am talking, because uh, obviously we had to move over to the different streaming link. So I'm going to do some boring stuff uh, where I'm going to put some metadata, hey, that sounds fun, into the live stream um, so that uh, everything looks nice and pretty and people know what they're watching when they get to it and hopefully if i do that now uh we should be sorted and there should be a lovely thumbnail a lovely description everyone knows what they're watching and we are good to go uh, and i think that should now be done um so yeah thank you all so much for joining me this morning um it's going to be a long day but it's going to be uh, hopefully interesting, engaging, inspiring. Thank you to all of our new subscribers. I see we've got uh, three or four people who have clicked subscribe uh, to make sure they don't miss out. Um, and thank you to everyone who's been with us since the beginning um, and will hopefully be uh, joining us until six this evening when we finish. Um, I've got my second coffee. Hopefully I'll be a little bit more sprightly uh, from now on. And um, please let me know um, how you're doing and how you're enjoying the show in the chat. Um, so for those who are just joining, this is the first episode of Bright Green Live. We're going to be having interviews throughout the day from uh, until 6 p.m. with some of the uh, most important influential figures on the, the left um, from social movements, from the labour movement and so on. Uh, we're going to be talking about a whole range of things um, and uh, I hope you can join us throughout the day. Um, so what I'd like you to do is we've got Jean Lambert coming up next talking about Keith Taylor. Um, now Keith, uh, for those of you who don't know, was an MEP for uh, the southeast of England uh, for uh, nearly a decade. Um, he was a councillor in Brighton for 10 years as well and was the Greens parliamentary candidate in Brighton Pavilion since 2005. Now for those of you who um, know Keith, who saw his work, um, who, uh, you know, uh, engaged with him, were inspired by him in any way, please do pop in the chat some of your memories of Keith Taylor and um, the uh, what, what you remember of his work and his time in politics, because I think, um, you know, the, the Green Party is an afterthought for the mainstream media, for much of publishing, for broadcasting. Um, and uh, so the, the kinds of um, memorialising of, of, of important figures in the Green Party often gets neglected. And so what I think is really important is that as, um, as as people who are interested in green politics or involved in green politics, we do that memorialization ourselves. And so I would love to see some of your comments about um, what Keith, about uh, your interactions with Keith Taylor um, and uh, what what his, his politics meant to you. And we're going to get a lot of those reflections from Jean Lambert too when she joins us in a moment. Um, obviously, Jean worked with Keith for many, many years in the European Parliament, was a, a friend and colleague of him um, in there. And I would love to, to, to be able to read out some of your thoughts and comments too, um, as well as your questions. If there's anything you wanted to know about Keith's work, during his time in the European Parliament or elsewhere in the Green Party. Um, we'll put those to Jean as well um, and get her, her thoughts on those. Um, so I can see that Jean is just joined the call. So I'm going to let Jean in now. And once she's connected, uh, we'll start the conversation um, very, very shortly. 
But um, as I said before, our next guest is Jean Lambert. And Jean was a, a MEP in London for two decades. Uh, she was uh, one of the first Green Party MEPs elected at the same time as Caroline Lucas in 1999. And she also worked for nearly a decade alongside Keith Taylor in the European Parliament. Um, Keith Taylor was a, uh, a Green Party MEP for the South East of England um, and also a councillor and um, had a number of other roles within the Green Party. Um, he sadly passed away very recently and we invited Jean on today to talk a little bit about the life and legacy of her friend and colleague Keith Taylor and share that um, with you all today. Um, so thank you very, very much for, for, for joining um, us today, Jean. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so you're among one of the people who worked the closest with Keith over his political career. Um, how was Keith as a colleague for you in the European Parliament? Thinking about this, and I think the first word was came to mind, but actually was fun. Um, it, you know that we obviously do did a lot of very serious work in the European Parliament. Um, you, you know, as, as members there, and of course we, you know, with uh, with our constituencies, with the party NGOs, but but fun. You know that if if you were talking to Keith, there would there would be a joke somewhere in there. Um, you know, and even when we were sort of discussing really quite serious stuff. Um, you, you never lost that sort of, I don't know, that, that sort of human element that um, somebody who, even on the smallest things, who would notice, you know, sort of people's new haircuts, new hair colours, whatever. Um, somebody who, who re you got the feeling really enjoyed being with people and also sort of working for people. So I think that that sort of that warmth, that personality, that humanity, I think, well, you know, what I, I remember most, most strongly. Um, and I think you know, a lot of people would say he was a team player. He had a really good team of staff around him. I think all of us know that um, as an elected representative, if you're lucky enough to have staff, you're as, as good as the staff you've got. You know, they're, they're the ones that actually make ideas happen, make things happen. Um, they produced the reports. They it, and team, it, you know, Keith had a good team who were really happy working for him. And it's interesting how many of them at the Brussels end are still working with the Green Group in some way or another as as you know professional advisors. So that sort of work that they were doing in Keith's office, the depth of that and the the detail there, I think, has really sort of carried through. So I think that also says something about him as as an MP and effectively a politician in in that sort of close relationship with this with his staff. It's really lovely to hear the the kind of reflections about Keith, and I think um, you know a lot of uh, a lot of people I think were hit quite hard by hearing of um, of Keith's passing. Um, you know, for for me, uh, you know, I was I joined the Green Party in twenty ten. Um, so um, he'd just become an MEP and he was a major fixture of, you know, every Green Party conference. We'd see, uh, you know, Gene and Keith uh, with the, the MEPs for breakfast. We'd see, um, you know, uh, his work within the European Parliament uh, being, you know, one of the kind of um, the, the main successes and achievements of, of the Green Party of England and Wales. You know, we'd had elected representation in the European Parliament for, for many, many years. Obviously, we we no longer have that, that privilege, uh, no longer being in the European Union. But Keith was there in the European Parliament for a decade, uh, nearly a decade. And um, obviously he would have uh, influenced and impacted on uh, lots of pan-European legislation through his role as, a, as an MEP. What do you think some of his biggest achievements were within the European Parliament? Well, there, there are two ways in the sense that you, you have power in the European Parliament. One is the direct work that you actually do on legislation. And the other is the influence that, that you have. And that influences within the parliament itself, but also sort of within the, the wider community and the wider constituency. And I think part of the um, one of the, the, the things that Keith was able to do was actually to really link that. That if you look at some of the things that that he himself sort of talks about being proudest of, and there's there's a book that we did, I'll do an advert, at the end of our legislative period, which was, yes, the Greens for a better Europe, absolutely. Um, you know, if you look at Keith's chapter within that, and the book was his idea, he wanted to, to have something substantial to, to leave to 
you know, show the mark that in the sense that that we'd made as, as Greens with from the UK within the European Parliament. Um, there are pieces of legislation, for example, that I think one of those that he was proudest of was, which I mean, it, you know, sounds ridiculous in the sense of why on earth was this even an argument? Was about the amount of sugar that you could actually put in baby food. You know, where there was a real push from the industry back in about sort of 2016 to change the sort of figures in a piece of legislation going through to actually increase the amount of permitted sugar. And Keith is somebody who was very concerned about obesity, about child health, about food quality, um, you, you know, really sort of led, as it were, the, the sort of campaign within the parliament and the legislative change in the parliament to resist um, that increase. And so I think you know, that's something which it seems very small, but of course has really quite an impact on the lives of so many, so many children um, and their future development. So that would be one area. Um, work that he did on the sort of um, car emissions, clean air. Uh, clean air was an absolute passion for Keith. Again, one of the reports that he, he did with the money that we're fortunate enough to have had as members of the European Parliament to produce reports, to produce information. Um, you know, for him, quite a lot of that was about clean air, air quality, and again, what it does to people's health. Um, and as we know, you know, the impact that that has, again, particularly on children and lung development. So the work that he did on that, um, work that he did as well on disability access, um, and the wider issues around access to mobility, access to travel. So the Accessibility Act was one of the last things that um, you know, was coming through as equality, part of the equalities legislation of the European Parliament. And again, you know, Keith was very active, groups rapporteur in the trans, um, shadow in the transport committee on that in terms of um, making sure that mobility was accessible to all that it's affordable um you know but particularly about the disability access dimension of it so those are some of the things and again you know through the influence he was very active as the vice chair of the cross-party group on animal rights animal welfare and there you know he he was a real champion in in the sort of campaigning work that the legislative work being done in parliament on the um the banning of cages for with chickens most recently for for rabbits that's a big industry in parts of the european union um you know to improve the quality of of the, of the way in which animals are treated and of course domestically did a lot on um, campaigning against live animal transport because that's a particular issue for you know his his constituency um in the southeast of England. So there's a longer list, it, but you know, that's yeah, that's some headlines. There is a huge list and um we'd I'd love to go into a little bit more detail on some of it. But um before I um put another question to you, I just wanted to for, for people watching, um please do pop questions for Jean in the chat on YouTube. Um I'd love to hear uh, also your comments and reflections um, on Keith's time as an MEP and also his wider work in politics and the Green Party. Now, you mentioned, Jean, that book, uh, Greens for a Better Europe, and I recently reread um, Keith's chapter uh, in it um, the, the other week, and it is an amazing read uh, to, uh, you know, hear his journey um, in politics, um, but also the, the kinds of his um, assessment of, uh, you know, what makes a good politician, of um, you know how to be effective and also the the kind of impacts that he's had, and I was also um, uh, coincidentally um, a couple of days ago, um, I was in the Oxford City Council Green Group room clearing out a bunch of old uh, leaflets and uh, stuff that had been in there for forever and we needed to, to clear out, and um, I found you know half a dozen uh, reports that Keith had produced as a as an MEP on everything from energy, from animal rights, and so on. And um, yeah, I mean, a, a huge, a huge body of work that he did um, during his time in the European Parliament that, um, that, that that's, that's really influential and impactful. But he also um, was a major, major figure within the Green Party of England and Wales for many, many years outside of the European Parliament. Now, I've said that I think that Keith is probably one of the most important figures in the Green Party's history for a number of reasons. So he was um, one of the first Green councillors in Brighton and Hove. 
Um, he, when he joined the Green Group in Brighton and Hive, it was a group of three. Um, and when he left office as a councillor to join the European Parliament, the following year, the Greens took control of the council, which shows you the, the scale of growth over that, that period. He also did a stint as principal speaker, which for those who've been around the Green Party for a while, um, is the kind of precursor to the leader that we have today. And he was the Green Party's parliamentary candidate in Brighton Pavilion in 2005, uh, when he received the then highest share of the vote um, for any parliamentary candidate for the Green Party ever, um, before Caroline Lucas went on and took the seat. Um, in 2010 so obviously he's 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 he, he had a huge uh role in in the green party over many many years what do you think his impact has been on the green party itself i would agree that you know there's a, a considerable impact and particularly i think in that that period of growth with the work that you know he did in brighton i mean he would say that it wasn't just him but you know he was certainly part of of that work that's done which you know, for the Greens, I think that what has what has happened in Brighton over the years, um, I mean, it has been immeasurably, it, it, you know, has really been important for us because apart from anything else, it's shown that even with the electoral system we have, it's possible to get elected, that it's possible to get elected to a, that point where you can actually take control and be there as a minority group, you, you know, so none of the, the question of about sort of having been in an administration for a while and learning, um, you know, it was real sort of learning on the job. And I think, therefore, that, you, you know, Brighton has been almost a, a sort of, how can you phrase it, almost a sort of political learning um, lab for, for us. Um, at, at times, I think, you, you know, people in Brighton, well, Brighton Green Party themselves might have had their heads in their hands, but for a lot of the time, it's been really powerful to see them come back, back and be in there again as, as a minority administration, I think is, is amazing and really important for us. And therefore, the role that you have as somebody like Keith in that, in that, in helping to build that, helping to build that credibility, to build that relationship with your electorate that have, have, makes people feel that they can really trust you and trust you to deliver and that you're able to speak to them in a way that they understand and feel, feel your, your passion for actually making the place better and that it's not about you and your role and your position or whatever, but it really is about actually making life better for the people who live there, I think has been really important. And Keith being there as one of those sort of building blocks and showing how we can actually develop as a party, de develop electoral success, gain that confidence of voters, I think has been absolutely really important and critical for us in helping I think the party to survive some very difficult periods um, and to show that you really can develop and that you know there is um, an electoral path for us not only an electoral but that is really important people can trust you and that you can deliver even in some of the most difficult circumstances. And I think having that real grounding in the, the local authority also meant that when he was there at the European Parliament, he also still had that connection back, the connection back with Green councillors and helping that to grow. And of course, following the, the work that Caroline had done in the constituency to be out there across the region. And in that sense, Southeast different to London, which has its own sort of elected level. But for the South East, you're the one green regional representative. And therefore, you have to make that count. And so, as I say, a lot of the work that he did on anti-fracking campaigns, on social issues around the, the horrendous rise of food banks, as well as the clean air, um, the animal welfare, all these sorts of things, I think, showed people that Greens really did have a breadth of vision and were prepared to stick with something and to deliver. So I think he's been really important for the Green Party's development. I couldn't agree with that more. And we've got some lovely messages that have come through on the chat. Um, so Finn has said that um, after hearing that uh, Keith had passed away, he came across, they came across a video of Keith promoting LGBT Pride Month and it was really lovely to see that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Keith was obviously a huge uh, advocate for human rights for uh, uh, both both domestically and internationally. Um, I wonder if you had any reflections on his on his work on on human rights issues. 
Well, yes, and I mean, in fact, sort of being there on Pride, some of those pictures and so on are wonderful. He, he was did, I think, like a party with a purpose. And the, in terms of, the, of the, the human rights issues, where he was on the development committee for a while and did, you, you know, led on a, a, an opinion from that committee on the, the issues about the impact of the financial crisis on the world's poorest. Um, he was at the UN as part of a parliament delegation to make some of those points as well. Um, in terms of, you know, decent, equitable, fair um, development. And, of course, was a very strong supporter of the Palestinian cause and, you know, had been to Gaza. He was a long-standing member of the, the Palestine um, delegation within the European Parliament. So in terms of issues around diversity, equality um, and international equality and solidarity, Again, you know, a lot of work there and a real burning passion for that, that you could really hear when he spoke about it. If you look at some of his speeches from the parliament and all of them are, you know, recorded in in, um, in script, even if you, you can't see the, um, the films, you, you know, that when you look at that, even within a minute, he had the ability, that, which was all we're allowed, um, were still allowed in the European Parliament a lot of the time you know you can still whack, pack a punch in a minute if it's if it's there with passion and you've got a clear message and and that was Keith he thought very carefully about what he said in the Parliament to make sure that every second that he had really counted in terms of delivering the passion and the message that, that he had so you know an effective communicator there as well. So finally, before before I let you go, Jean, I wondered if you could share what your favourite memory of Keith was. Oh. Sorry to put you on the stop. I know it's a big one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you know, the, the memory that you want to leave in other people's heads, not not just your own. Um, I th I think it would be probably, you know, it sounds, sounds bizarre, but... Strasbourg, he, he had a hotel that he stayed at regularly, which had a very good restaurant. Those who know Keith know that he loved cooking, really appreciated sort of, you, you know, the effort that went into that. And being there at dinner with him, it was a hotel that a lot of other parliamentarians stayed at. And always how, if you had dinner with him, it was never just you. There were always conversations with everybody else who would be coming in and out because he was always open to talking to people just about, you know, any of the political groups from the UK, any of the politicians, always happy to see them, to talk to them, hear what they were saying, and they were always happy to keep, talk to Keith. So that sort of convivial dinner, but with a political brain working the whole time, um, I, I, I cherish those. I cherish those as a memory and I, I will miss them. Thank you so much, Jean, for sharing uh, so much about Keith's life and legacy and uh, the, the political impacts and also the, the, the personal elements of your relationship with um, what was, I'm sure, a great colleague and friend. Um, our thoughts at Bright Green obviously go out to uh, Keith's friends and family. Um, it's a huge loss to the Green Movement, but um, hopefully we can continue to remember and honour the legacy of Keith and continue the, uh, the journey that he took the Green Party on. But thanks so much for joining us today, Jean. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to everyone um, who is watching and for the lovely comments that have come in uh, about Keith. Um, as hopefully you've kind of ascertained from the conversation that Jean and I have had, uh, Keith was a towering figure within green politics and within European politics um, in his work as an MEP. Um, and his uh, he will be sorely, sorely uh, missed. Um, lots of people have shared lovely memories about Keith on Twitter and on social media. Um, and on Bright Green, we've also published an obituary from myself, but also from Faley McCafferty, who is the um, the current leader of Brighton and Hove Council, who obviously worked very closely um, with Keith, with with Keith being from uh, Brighton Hove and being based there and being one of the the first Green councillors in that city. So. Um, if you if you want to learn more about Keith, uh, then you can head to Bright Green's website and read those. Um, also, the the book that me and Jean were talking about is, is Greens for a Better Europe. It's a brilliant read. It's got uh, chapters from uh, the MEPs that served um, from the Green Party uh, during the 20 years that the Green Party of England and Wales had representation within the European Parliament. There's a brilliant chapter from Keith um, who talks about his journey into politics, um, his assessment of what what politics 
uh, is and means and how to do it effectively and also some of the impacts that um, he had as a as a as a political actor both in terms of um as a councillor as a, a, a and also as a um as a member of the european parliament so uh, if you want to learn more about uh, keith's life and legacy please do read uh, that chapter um hopefully you enjoyed that conversation with with gene please do let us know what you thought about it in the chat on youtube and also um on social media on the hashtag bright green live um so we have an amazing uh, lineup of speakers still to come uh we've got interviews with um more than 10 people still to come today please do stick with us we'll be live streaming until six o'clock um just to give you a rundown of who we have still got to come to come um, very shortly, we will be joined by Jay Kerr from No Sweat, the anti-sweatshop organization. Uh, we will also be joined by Kang Zha Ung from the um, Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar. It's an amazing conversation we're going to be having. We're really lucky to have those guests. We're going to be talking about the, um, the impact of the military coup in Myanmar on labor rights, on human rights um, and trade unions. Um, and what we can do to support worker struggles in Myanmar um, and learn about the campaign to kick Western fashion brands out of that country. We've also got Emily Apple from The Canary talking about why that publication has relaunched as a cooperative and kicked out the bosses. We've got Jane Baston from The Young Greens talking about the student movement, Anthony Slaughter, the leader of Wales Green Party, Vix Lau, the, the education spokesperson for the Green Party, Chris Saltmarsh from Labour for a Green New Deal, Benali Hamdash, the Green Party's migration spokesperson, Guy Ingerson from the Scottish Greens talking about the motion that he put forward to uh, formally cut the Scottish Greens ties with the Green Party of England and Wales over transphobia. And finally, we have Zach Polanski, the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. So stay tuned for all that. Uh, they will be coming up very, very shortly. If you haven't done already, please like this video. And um, if you could let us know what you think about the interviews we've had so far in the chat, that'd be brilliant. Also, any questions um, you have coming up for, uh, any questions you have for the interviews that we have coming up um, so that we can start putting those to um, to the uh, the guests. I'm sorry, I, I can see Raphael asked a question in the chat that I didn't get to ask Jean. It came through a little too late. So if you want to get a question asked, put it in the chat in advance. You know who the lineup of speakers is. Um, so you can uh, let us know. Um, also, if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. It means that you won't miss out on any of the videos Bright Green is putting out, including the next episode of Bright Green Live, which will be taking place on December the 11th. Um, we have, we'll have another amazing lineup of guests, um, interviews and so on. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all there. And please, of course, do share this video. There were some technical issues at the beginning, so some people didn't get on the right link. Uh, that's entirely my fault, but I want to ask you to help me rectify that. And if you could do so, please, by sharing the, 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 the live stream link on social media on the hashtag Bright Green Live. And it means that more people will be able to see the amazing uh, interviews and guests that we have coming up throughout the day. I've got one last bit of admin to do because unfortunately an email went out to our entire mailing list with the wrong link. Uh, so I'm going to take a five to 10 minute break uh, in which I'm going to uh, alleviate that problem. Uh, and we'll be back again with more interviews very, very soon. Thank you so much. And I'll see you very, very soon.
Well, hello, hello. We are back. We are back on the YouTubes. Welcome back to episode one of Bright Green Live. And for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Chris. I am the editor of Bright Green and I am going to be hosting the, um, the rest of this episode up until 6 p.m. So please do stick around. We've got an amazing lineup of guests um, and uh, we will be having interviews throughout the day. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who has watched so far and for um, for your patience as we've dealt with some technical issues. Um, apologies to those on the Bright Green mailing list who've only just received uh, the correct streaming link. Um, I hope you're now able to join um, and we'll see you very, very soon. And it's a pleasure to have you. Um, so we've had three amazing guests so far. We kicked off the day with Matthew Hull. Uh, the Green Party's Trade Union Liaison Officer, who was talking about the, the Labour movement at the moment and the role of the ongoing wave of strike action we're seeing across the country and how Greens should be standing in solidarity with them. We then had Anna Oppenheim from uh, Labour Campaign for Free Movement talking about the, um, the Labour Party's migration policies and what they currently are, what they should be and how we um, can pressure the Labour Party to adopt a less reactionary approach to um, to migration um, and just uh, before we had a quick break we heard from Jean Lambert. Jean of course was a Green Party MEP for 20 years in London um, and she was talking about her late colleague Keith Taylor and his life and legacy. Um, you can rewind uh, the live stream and watch any of those interviews and we'll be kicking off with our next interview very very shortly. Um, we have still an amazing lineup of guests to come. We still have uh, Zach Polanski, the Deputy of the Green Party, who will be joining us this evening. We have Guy Ingerson from the Scottish Greens, who's going to be talking about the motion he proposed for the Scottish Greens to formally cut their ties with the Green Party of England and Wales over transphobia. We have Benali Hamdash, the Green Party of England and Wales migration spokesperson. Chris Saltmarsh from Labour for a Green New Deal and the author of the uh, brilliant book Burnt. Um, talking about Labour's um, climate policies, where they are, where they should be. Vix Lauthian, the Green Party's education uh, spokesperson, the leader of the Wales Green Party, Anthony Slaughter, Jane Baston from the Young Greens, and we also very, very soon will have Jay Kerr from the anti-sweatshop organisation No Sweat, and we have Kain Zar Ung from the, from the Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar talking about labour rights in Myanmar and why campaigners are calling for Western brands to stop uh, sourcing their products from that country in solidarity with the labour movement there. Unfortunately, one of our guests, Emily Apple from the Canary, has had to drop out, um, but we will be uh, we will still be having all the other guests um, and we'll find another time to speak to Emily, I am sure. So there will be a little bit of a rejig of the programme. Apologies for that, um, but we'll uh, still be able to get all of our guests in um as the day goes on so um if you just joined us you won't have heard me yet tell you that you need to in the chat let us know your thoughts on the interviews we've had so far put in any questions for our guests please do pop them in and in as in advance as you much as you possibly can it makes it easy for me to pick them up you can also put questions and comments on social media using the hashtag bright green live we'll pick up those um if we can as well if you haven't already please do like the stream uh, it will stroke the algorithm make the algorithm happy mean that the video will appear in more people's feeds and we'll get more people watching it's got 15 likes so far i think we can get to 20 before our next interview starts so make sure you hammer that like button right about now we've got a dozen new subscribers who have um subscribed to the channel um since we started streaming let's get more people subscribed if you subscribe it means that you'll get a notification whenever we put out a new video you won't miss out anything that we're putting out including the next episode of bright green live and all the other content we put out which has in the past included interviews with candidates for um for uh, Green Party uh, leadership positions. It's included, um, you know, debates with MPs, with uh, prominent figures from the left and a whole bunch of other stuff. So if you hit subscribe, you won't miss out on any of that stuff. So we've got 10 people watching. <clears throat> Please let me know how you're doing in the chat. Please give me any feedback, any thoughts, any comments on the interview so far. Um, also, any questions for me? I'm happy to take questions too. Uh, so uh, let me know. Um, uh, yeah, let me know whatever you want in the chat 
and we'll read out some of your comments and questions throughout the day. Uh, it can get quite lonely when you're sat doing a live stream. Uh, so please do keep me company uh, throughout the day and we will uh, come to as many of those questions and comments as we possibly can. Um, so in about five minutes time, we will be joined by Jay and Kang, and uh, we're going to have a really fascinating discussion about the uh, labour movement in Myanmar, the impact that the military coup has had on workers' rights and the labour movement there. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the brands that are currently um, still operating and sourcing from factories in Myanmar and why uh, campaigners are calling for uh, those brands to stop doing that in solidarity with the labour movement. Uh, so stay tuned for that at 12. Uh, ben has asked in the chat, do we have a podcast? No, we don't currently have a podcast. It's something that's been on um, the on my agenda for a while. Um, unfortunately, uh, as you may or may not know, Bright Green isn't a wash with cash. We don't have the backing of billionaires and big business. So if you want to see a Bright Green podcast, the best way that you can do that is to head to bright-green.org forward slash donate, set up a regular donation, and it will fund not only the content that we're already doing, so these uh, Bright Green Live episodes, the interviews we put on our YouTube channel, all the articles we publish, but also exciting new projects like uh, a podcast in the future. I think I first floated the idea of doing a podcast about three years ago. It hasn't come to fruition yet, um, but at some point we would love to do that. So please do uh, donate if you can. We can hopefully make that happen. Um, so if any of our uh, guests that are coming up later in this afternoon are currently watching on the live stream, um, it would be lovely if you could get in touch if you're able to do a slightly earlier slot. Uh, the reason for that is that Emily Apple, one of our guests, has unfortunately had to uh, drop out. And uh, it'd be great if we can read you the type table a little bit so you get an even flow of interviews throughout the day. So if any of you are watching, please do let me know. I think I've reached out to some of you, but just let me know um, if you can. Uh, so we've got 13 people watching, 16 likes on the stream. Let's get that higher. Hit that like button. Please share the stream on socials on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Um, if you're enjoying the interviews that we're doing right now, it is undoubted that other people will be enjoying them too. It would be lovely to have more people watching. I would love for us to hit uh, at some point uh, this afternoon uh, around 30 people watching live. I don't think that's out, out of the uh, bounds of possibility, but it'll only happen with your help. So please do share the stream and um, we can uh, get more people watching this because I think the conversations we've been having so far have been fascinating and it'd be lovely if more people could see them. Um, and of course, if you haven't already, hit subscribe. Um, so for those, I see a triple more people joining. For those of you who are joining just now, we have an amazing lineup of speakers throughout the day on the first episode of Bright Green Live. Um, we've got interviews with uh, people from across uh, the UK's Green parties, from the labour movement, from social movements, campaigners and so on. We're going to be talking about a whole range of things um, and hopefully the conversations will be um, engaging, inspiring, uh, and so on. So um, our next two guests have arrived who I'm going to let into the waiting room right now. Um, and as they are connecting, I will just um, give you a little bit of background as to, to, to who we've got joining us and why. So we have two incredible uh, speakers and guests uh, joining us uh, imminently. So uh, we have Jay Kerr from No Sweat. Uh, you might be able to see uh, on the stream uh, wearing a very on-brand hoodie. Uh, so No Sweat is a, uh, a, a campaign against sweatshops and international solidarity with uh, garment workers. And we also have Kainzar Ung, from, who is the president of the Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar. And we're going to be talking about labour rights abuses in Myanmar, uh, the political situation there, <clears throat> and what people in the UK um, can do to support them. So firstly, uh, just, to, just to bring you in, Jay. Jay, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm really pleased to be here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting us um yeah look forward to getting into the conversation thanks so much jay uh brilliant to have you too and kind how are you doing today i'm good i'm good thank you brilliant so we're going to start things off um with kind and we're then we'll bring jay in to talk about some of the uk context if that's okay um so recently the uh the the, the kind of political situation in myanmar has has dropped off the uh, the radar really of the UK media. It's not being covered and picked up as much um, as it was 
say a year ago. I wondered if you could uh, tell our viewers a little bit um, about the, the current political situation uh, there. Yes, um, now the situation is um, very bad. The, since the military staged the coup on the 1st of Hawaii, 2021, the my country has become the victim of a genocide military Honda. The military is, have been committing uh, attack, discriminate attack against civilians and uh, with the planes and helicopters and destroying 10 of villages and towns in the process of burning alive 10 of people. So they are killing people across the country. The number of fatalities has reached more than 24,000 since FAY 2021. So th this action of the military, the banning and um, attacking people across the country has uh, displaced more than 1.3 million people by September 2022. So we have more than 26,000 buildings and houses, uh, in, including religious buildings have been destroyed by the military. So that the troops, military troops, loot the property of the civilian. And uh, now in cities in the many, many, uh, many uh, regions and division, we have a lot of um, the robberies and the kidnapping. So many crimes happening. Yeah. So and also we have now um, uh, the the M fighting M struggle fighting between the military and the ethnic M groups. And also we have the Beta Farm Forces in Myanmar in many uh, many townships and cities. Uh, the people at the front forces is formed by the civilian who were uh, involved in the protest last year peacefully, but the, the military attack, uh, they arrest these uh, protesters very brutally so that the thousands of people have to flee from their home and uh, they, they don't they cannot go out of the country. They ran to the ethnic area and uh, ethnic group having a thousand of people. And uh, we, they, they face a lot of problem feeding those people in accommodation. And the uh, military continue attack on the villages and township made the, those people decide to get uh, M tra uh, military training so that they they got the training and now uh, go back to their uh, townships and villages and form people at the farm forces to protect their own people, even in the Yango, big city in the country. So now in Myanmar is like in the civil war. So we lost a lot, we have lost a lot of employment and economic recession. So everything is destroyed by the military. So you've 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 really eloquently described the kind of political situation there, and I'm sure our viewers um, really appreciate you sharing that. And you know, it's it's very shocking to hear and to to, to kind of hear laid bare like that. Um, obviously, you're a, a kind of trade unionist. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what the impact of the coup has been on the labour movement in Myanmar. Yeah, the the coup destroying freedom association in Nagala de Bagini, and. Uh, since the coup, we trade union uh, do not accept the military coup, and uh, we make an announcement. We don't accept it. We will not work with them. So we withdraw from the travel die mechanism, and we organize our members and from the uh, different sector, including garment uh, sector, and uh, workers members from the construction sector, mining farmers. And uh, we, we workers had uh, they joined the civil disobedience movement. So last year we have about 20 million people were on the street. So that in also the industry zone, uh, they are bigger demonstration. So that's why Malachi crushed down them very brutally to control the situation, to maintain the power. So um, 
since the last year in uh, March, the military handing down the trade union uh, leaders and members houses also at the workplaces, even though they search in the works in their villages. So that, uh, and also the military asked the employer, the factories to uh, provide the trade union members and leader list together with their photo and addresses. That's why many of our leaders from the different, at different level, from the factory level to national level, have been handed. So many of the, our members are in hiding now. So the, the member may remain at the workplaces, they are under pressure. They, they are under threat. So because of the uh, trade unions are uh, under operation, the workout rights situation has become very worse. And uh, now we, we have um, no right to freedom association, no collective bargaining right. And uh, we used to had, have a lot of collective bargaining agreement at the factory level. Now all are announced cancer by the embryo. So now worker are being less and uh, we found a lot of wage exploitation in uh, many factories and uh, forced labor is back now. And uh, forced labor mean uh, factories, they ask the worker to work overtime without pay. Uh, they, how they do, they increase the uh, production target which is worker cannot meet within eight working hours. So the workers are pressured to meet the target and uh, to work uh, overtime without pay. And also workers are asked to work on Sunday without pay. So now the worker only get the um, minimum wage, which is $1.3. No, now it's uh, like, um, one point dollar per day because of now inflation is very high. So workers are starving while they are working. So and also physical uh, insult in uh, power uh, harassment facing at the uh, workplace. So the pregnant women they are not now getting the uh, the right for the. Uh, leave or cash benefit. No workers are allowed to take leave or holiday. So, and they are not paid to work on those days. So, um, we hoped uh, the brands, international brands, to can protect their worker rights. So, last year, I knew FM uh, worked with some brands to protect the worker rights. But uh, we trade union face a lot of problems. We, we got a life threat to the trade union leaders in some cases after we raised the issue. So we have to move the workers to another place. So they lost job and they, so a lot of problems face. That's why um, now for the workers, there is no way for them to raise their um, problem at the factory level because union can no longer operate. And also we don't have a rule of law. So there is no system can break the worker right. And the industry are under martial law now. So when we have uh, many cases like worker, we, which are exploited, cut, not informing the workers, so worker went on strike to get their salary or wage cut. At the other time when workers raised their voice in uh, trying to go on strike, the military present a soldier present at the factory. And then the wife finished one day or two days, but they don't get any such military cook. So that's why we are saying we, the military group, group is also embryo group. The embryo are using the political uh, situation to exploit workers. So we have a forced labor, child labor back now.
So I'm going to uh, bring Jay in in a moment, and um, I've got sort of one question for you uh, before I go to any questions that come through in the chat, Kang. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that and for really clearly putting across the kind of situation that's facing workers and the, the labour movement um, there. Um, now, obviously, uh, there's been a, a long tradition of <clears throat> international solidarity with workers and the people of Myanmar in the face of military oppression. Um, you know, there were cam international campaigns around, for example, Pepsi's involvement in Myanmar in the 90s and so on. Um, what do you, uh, we, we've got viewers watching, many of whom are, you know, politically active, many of whom are trade unionists. Um, how, how do you think that people um, internationally and in the UK in particular uh, can stand in solidarity with uh, the workers of Myanmar and the people of Myanmar in the, the situation that you've just described? Uh, I was to Kaiser, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I lost you. You were frozen. I don't know the connection from your side of my side. Yeah. Apologies. Not... I'll, I'll I'll try again. So I was just asking um what you what do you think that people internationally and in the UK can do to stand in solidarity with uh, the workers and the, the people of Myanmar? Yeah, we need the solidarity action from the uh, people from UK. And uh, yeah, regarding with our set down, we, we need, we want the people from UK to inform the fashion brands. Uh, they cannot do due diligence in Myanmar. They cannot product uh, worker rights in Myanmar, but they do exploitation. So that's why uh, they have to stop business operation in Myanmar. So the many brands, they are uh, saying they can stay do due diligence at their best. That they initiate the EDI did a, so that the EDI report is released and um, it's clearly said the due diligence, brands cannot do due diligence in Myanmar. That's why EDI is recommending to the member brands to review their existing in Myanmar. So that uh, we, it is very clear, uh, they cannot protect the worker rights, cannot do due diligence in Myanmar, they have to leave now. And then another thing is that it, they are, Existing in Myanmar is an obstacle for the, the our democracy movement because they are supporting the military financially. So they pay taxes and other costs as an obligation to the military. And also they, they are uh, paying the do the supporting the military and that they go. And um, they are given the legitimacy to the military. Because Myanmar people do not recognize the military as a government. And uh, the, the military is uh, killing people across the country. So the, they are, the brands are, re the brand are responsible for those actions because they are supporting to the military is uh, supporting killing of people in Myanmar. So that's why they have to, so the, we want the uh, people from UK to push the Office of Financial uh, and Sanction Implementation in UK to, block, to stop the military buying fuels because the, the fuels are dual goods. The military is using uh, not only, military is using this uh, fuel to do the air strike. So that uh, we, we have to block the military buying the fuels. That's why we need help from you. Please take the 
the the office for the financial sanction implementation to work on that. And then people from Myanmar, we have people losing job like 1.2 million in Myanmar, according to ILO, uh, the report. And also farmers, many farmers across the country have to flee from their feet, so they cannot grow anything. So we lost income, but we face a lot of problems, but we continue fighting. The, our movement needs to So not only do the trade union, so please help us, support us. We need solidarity from you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. So I'm going to bring in Jay now. Um, but before I do, um, I just wanted to remind people that if you have any questions or comments or thoughts um, on the conversation so far, please do um, let us know in the chat and we'll try and pick up as many of them as possible. And also on social media on hashtag Bright Green Live and we'll try and pick those up too. Um, so Jay, um, as I introduced earlier, is uh, from No Sweat. Um, and it's been uh, no sweat has been leading the campaign to uh, pressure brands to uh, pull uh, pull out of sourcing uh, from factories based in Myanmar. So what I wanted to ask you, Jay, just to kick us off is um, why at the moment is, is are you making that demand? Yes. Yeah, so historically, this isn't a kind of demand that no sweat would make um, as an organization. We're, we're an anti sweatshop organization. And historically, we don't call for boycotts. We. The, the reason behind that is if people in the West sort of hear about, say, you know, a brand like Nike use exploiting workers in a country like Myanmar, and we call for a boycott, then the potential impact on the workers is often negative. So, you know, the, if, if a brand gets bad press in the West, they will simply cancel the contracts with the factories and move to another factory elsewhere, probably continuing the same conditions. And the workers that you were trying to support by calling for that boycott lose their jobs. The caveat to that is when brand, when workers themselves are calling for the boycott, when it's not simply you know do gooders like us sort of like calling for calling for a boycott on behalf of people that we haven't connected with, it's actually coming from the people on the ground in the country that are producing the goods that demand in this, and this is the case we have with Myanmar. So when the coup first happened, we sort of put the word out through the labour movement and the NGO movement to say we need to come together and put, a, put out a joint statement to condemn the coup and we did that but we felt very sort of helpless in terms of what the next steps are and we waited tentatively to see what had happened and very quickly the mass uprising happened which is like one of the most historic uprisings in the country's history then the, sh the shooting started the repression started and again it was just like watching with the world in horror as to what was going on so from that point it was like okay we need to take a next step what are the people on the ground calling for? And this is where we got in touch with Kai Zayao and uh, other trade unionists in the country to say, what are your demands? What do you want to happen? Yeah. It took about six months, I think, for the unions to get to the stage, but it sort of like very quickly became clear that as the oppression increased and the conditions in the factories deteriorated and the uh, brands, Kai Zayao mentioned earlier, that the tripartite system broke down, which was something called ACT, there's an issue, I can't remember what they are, it's something that action, something, something. But it's essentially, it's a group that brought together brands, trade unions, uh, and the government in a tripartite system to develop better conditions in the garment industry. Because of the situation of the coup, the trade unions decided they had to withdraw from that. There was no way they could work with the military government under these conditions. They didn't acknowledge the military government, so they were suspending that. In that process, the, the conditions in the factories deteriorated and the brands eventually came to a conclusion that there is no ability to do due diligence and brands need to leave. That's where we come in in terms of saying that's what you're demanding. We support your demands and we will raise we will amplify your voice in the UK and in the West generally to try and um, make that happen, to put pressure on the brands to do this. So this led to the formation of something called the Myanmar Military Never in Fashion Campaign, which was something we set up with a group called Global Women's Strike that we're still very heavy, heavily involved with. Um, this brought together about 200 organisations around the world to put out a sort of follow-up statement from the first one to say, this is the conditions now, six months in, 
this is what the brands call this is what the trade unions and the workers are calling for we we support them and brands need to take note so since then we've been building pressure on them to say you know let's you need to withdraw this is what you need to do to make this happen and this is how you need to go about it and the key word in that or the key phrase in that is responsible exit because the situation like you know harking back to what i said about the um you know nike or someone simply cutting and running and going to another factory in another country and continuing the same conditions it's that cut and run attitude that brands have historically had any time a flare-up of sort of negative press around their uh, supply chain conditions that we're trying to avoid we don't simply want them to leave and make the situation worse they need to have a responsible exit um and we can go on to talk about what that feels like but i feel like i'm ranting at you so i'll let you get the next question <laughs> yeah so we, we we can come on to that um but before we do i just um it might be useful for our viewers to hear what brands are currently still operating in Myanmar and which have pulled out as a result of the campaign so the main brands we've been focusing on, um, which are mainly the, you know, there's brands from around the world, especially in the States that people have never, never heard of. So the brands are focused on those that you find on the UK high street. They are H&M, Next, New Look, Adidas, Zara, and then Marks and Spencers, Tesco's, Primark and Aldi. The last of those, Marks and Spencers, Tesco's, Primark and Aldi, are the ones that have recently announced that they're going to withdraw from uh, production in Myanmar. They've all set different target dates to close things down, but essentially they've made that commitment not to invest any more money in buying from the country. H&M, Next, New Look, Adidas and Zara have ignored that. Now, in... I think it was August this year, the Ethical Trade Initiative published a report, an in-depth report they've been working on through for like about a year into the situation in Myanmar, which essentially was looking at validating what the trade unions are saying about forced labour and uh, yeah, the conditions that Kaiser has just taken us through. So they said, OK, this is what the trade unions are saying. We have we the Ethical Trade Initiative works with brands as a kind of uh, multi-stakeholder initiative type thing to promote ethical trade, essentially. So they, they, they wanted to give their brands concrete evidence as to why the trade unions are, are saying this and advise them in what they should do or, you know, give them options in what they should do. So they brought out this amazing report, which essentially concluded totally in support of what the trade unions in Myanmar were calling for. They highlighted the forced labour conditions, which essentially slavery. They highlighted the um, fall in wages, as we heard earlier, wages getting down to well below international poverty levels. Like workers are literally working seven days a week and living below the poverty line after a seven day working week with forced labour on top of that, you know, working up to 12 hours a day. These are conditions that people are facing. They documented that and presented to the brands and off the back of that, at least two so far, Marks and Spencers and Primark following that were the ones that committed to leave. The holdout ones are H&M, Next, New Look, Adidas and Zara. And so now the focus for us in terms of campaigning is focusing on them in particular. There are other brands out there that we will look at as well, but those are the target ones that everyone will recognise. So we'll, we'll, we'll come on in a moment to talk about um, sort of how people can support the campaign and can to, can help put pressure on those brands but you mentioned earlier the this idea of a responsible exit um contrasting with what you've kind of described as brands often doing uh, what do you mean by that and what does that look like for a brand to to pull out of a country like Myanmar? that as a term means different things to different people um the brands themselves the ones that have pulled out have especially tesco's and uh, sorry uh, primark and mark spencer's have acknowledged making a responsible exit our concern is their idea of responsible and our idea of responsible might be different. So, which is usually a case of corporations, <laughs> but um, the, the the basics they're going to ask for, and Kaiser could probably give us more details because she's certainly, she's the one on the ground negotiating this stuff. But essentially we're talking, following basic labor laws, making sure the workers get severance pay and not just cutting and run, you know, don't just cancel your orders and leave and don't pay your bills which most of these brands did during the pandemic. They certainly, you know, when when the world shut down, their profits were impacted. They did not care about the workers. They just cut their cut their uh, supply lines and said and tried to save as much profit as they could. Now they're very much invested in caring about their workers, so they say. So they're talking about responsible exits. 
what we see as a responsible exit is putting your money where your mouth is. If you're going to leave, if you're going to pull out and you don't want to contribute to, you know, the, the detrimental situation that Kaiser's outlined in the country, then you need to invest in a fund. These brands need to invest in a fund that the workers can draw on to maintain a basic income. Essentially, we're talking about, a, you know, a, a, a fund they can put some of their billion dollar profits in, you know, brands like H&M, well, let's take Primark, for instance, had a pre-tax profit of a billion dollars last year. The minimum, the legal minimum wage, from what I remember in Myanmar, is $2.50 a day per worker. So it's not like they couldn't afford it, you know, if you do the basic back of the envelope calculation, it's nowhere near a billion dollars for the the several, you know, the tens of thousands of workers that might be impacted under their watch in Myanmar. So if they can invest in a fund, then they're actually taking responsibility for the people that make their clothes and the people that contributed to that billion dollar profit they made in the first place. So that's what we see as a responsible exit. Now it's down to negotiations. The trade unions like Kaisar and the uh, International Federation of Myanmar along with their global partners like the um, in, like Industrial and the ITUC, will be working to negotiate with brands how far they can go, get them to come over to our view of what a responsible exit looks like. Yeah, thank you. And so um, for people watching, how can they support the campaign to get brands to pull out? Um, on our website, so nosweat.org.uk, there is a campaigns page. Uh, when you see it, you'll see a, a fist that says campaigns. You click on that and then scroll down, you'll see the Myanmar campaign, Myanmar Solidarity campaign. On there, there's some uh, small things that you can do in terms of social media. So there's a, well, there's a, there's a email template where you click a button and send all the brands automatically an email, asking them to make a responsible exit and putting out the demands. The, the, the demands are very much in line with the Myanmar military never in fashion campaign, which if you type that into a URL at .org.uk or .org at the end, you'll go to that website and see that um, and see what exactly what the full demands of the campaign are. Um, but essentially, you can click that button. It will send the brands an email on the No Sweat website. There's also a uh, section where you can tweet directly at the brands with sort of suggested template tweet or you can copy and paste them into instagram and do the same thing essentially the more people that clog up the you know the social media of these brands with these kind of messages the the more impact you have because they certainly listen to this stuff their social media presence is something they care about a lot arguably a lot more than the workers who make their clothes so people getting taking that action and um, putting pressure on them Beyond that, in the summer, we had a demo, a sort of walking demo down Oxford Street, which I'm sure we'll be doing again, um, targeting some of the brands like H&M and Zara. We'll be putting messages out, keep an eye on the No Sweat website for information about that and come and join us on the street. Or if you want to get more involved, send us a message. We can organise coordinated demos around the country. If you're not London folk centred like we are, or you know, based in London, you know, dotted around the country, we've got activists that we can hook you up with to organise our own demos and stuff like that. And I've popped the links to those two websites in the YouTube chat so people can follow through them and hopefully be able to take action right now as we speak. The last thing I wanted to ask you, Jay, um, was if you could tell our viewers about the Garment Worker Solidarity Fund and how people can support that. Absolutely. Um, before I do that, I did want to mention one really important resource that I don't know if you're people behind the scenes be able to get up a, a link. It's the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre. They've been working with Kaiser and trade unions to create an online tracker where they're tracking abuse kind of in real time or updating regularly. So as abuse in the garment factories is being made, is being you know, outed through the trade unions underground network, they are creating an online tracker that links that abuse with the brands that are um, sourcing from those factories. So you can see exactly what is going on in, in detail through that website. So it's definitely worth something people should check out. Um, in terms of a financial practicality, we set up a what is called the Garment Worker Solidarity Fund, which part of our T-shirt project where we source ethical T-shirts from wholesale uh, for wholesale in the UK from uh, unionised factories in Bangladesh. We use the profit to go into this Garment Worker Solidarity Fund, which we've been running for a few years now. At the moment, that is targeting uh, the tra trade unions in Myanmar to help support funding for their to keep their underground movements going. So again, if people go to nosweat.org.uk, you'll see on the campaign section, there's a link to the Garment Work Solidarity Fund, and you can make a pay uh, 
transaction. It's, I think it's linked through PayPal, but you don't need to be a PayPal member. You can just have a credit card or a debit card and make a transaction. All that money, 100%, 100% of that money is being sent out to trade unions in Myanmar. It's just a mechanism to get, get money out to people who need it. Thank you so much, uh, Jay and Kleinzar. That was brilliant. And uh, as I said, all the links uh, that you just mentioned are in the chat so people can go away and uh, take action and make a donation. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Uh, that's been really enlightening um, to hear not only the uh, the scale of the issues that you're up against in Myanmar, but also the kind of practical things that uh, we can do in the UK to stand in solidarity with you. So thank you so much both for joining us today. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you so much. Um, I found that a fascinating conversation for people watching. I hope you did too. Uh, it would be lovely to get your comments and responses to that in the chat or on Twitter or on other social media platforms on the hashtag Bright Green Live. I'd love to hear what you think. Um, and please do um, follow through those links <clears throat> um, in the chat as well. Uh, to take action. No Sweat are an amazing organisation. Uh, they do brilliant work fighting for the rights of garment workers across the world. Uh, and it was a real honour to have um, Kangzar from the uh, Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar joining us as well to talk from direct on the ground experience of what's happening there um, and how we can support the resistance to the military coup and the labour movement um, that uh, that is fighting for workers' rights. Um, We've got 11 people watching. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please, if you haven't already, hit that like button um, so that uh, we can feed the YouTube algorithm and get more people watching. Uh, we've still got an amazing lineup of guests coming throughout the day. Please do let us know what you thought so far in the chat. Let us know any questions you have for our guests that are coming up. Also, happy to answer questions myself. Uh, we've had some already. Please do send them in. Happy to ask, answer anything uh, that you want. So get them coming in in the chat right away. Um, just going to do a quick rundown of what we've got coming up today. Uh, so we have still to come Zach Polanski, who is the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. He's going to be talking to us about the current crisis in the UK's constitution when we've had, you know, three prime ministers in three months. We've had the, um, you know, the just recently the government stuffing the House of Lords with, uh, well, not the government, rather the former government, Boris Johnson, stuffing the House of Lords with cronies, with advisors um, and uh, uh uh, less than pleasant newspaper editors. We have Guy Ingerson joining us from uh, the Scottish Greens. Uh, he is one of the people that was behind the motion uh, to get the Scottish Greens to sever their ties with the Green Party of England and Wales, uh, 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 tongue-tied again, uh, over uh, the issues of transphobia within the Green Party. And he's going to be telling us why he proposed that motion, what it means and what um, he wants to see and others want to see the Green Party of England and Wales doing to tackle transphobia. We have Benali Hamdash, the Green Party's migration spokesperson, who's going to be talking all about the scale of the reactionary anti-migrant policies and rhetoric we are currently seeing from our current government uh, and also talking about what the Green response uh, to that should be and what a fair and humane migration system would look like. Vix Lauthian, the Green Party's education spokesperson, is going to be talking about the, the problems um, are within the school system and also why the trade unions in the education sector, the NEU, the NASUWT and the NAHT are balloting for strike action right now. Um, we also have Anthony Slaughter, the leader of the Green, Wales Green Party. Um, he's going to be talking a little bit about the Wales Greens, but also about the Future Cymru Forum, uh, which is a new body that's been set up jointly with the Wales Green Party and Plaid Cymru, uh, which is looking to make the case for Welsh independence. So we're going to be talking about Welsh independence, what the Future Cymru Forum is going to be doing, and also um, uh, a little bit about where the Wales Green Party is at right now. And finally, we have Jane Baston from the Young Greens, who's going to be talking about the student movement, what the Young Greens' role in it is, and what the current direction and trajectory of it is. Now, unfortunately, we had another guest lined up, which is Emily Apple from The Canary. She was going to be talking to us about why The Canary has just relaunched as a cooperative, kicked out the bosses and put workers in charge. However, unfortunately, she's not able to join us. So we're going to get her on a later episode. Um, so what that means is, is we've got a little bit of time uh, extra that we weren't expecting. So what I'm going to try and do with that time is... Uh, go a little bit more in depth into some of the interviews that we um, have lined up.
Um, unfortunately, Emily was lined up next. So what I have done is I've reached out to some of our other guests and asked if they can come on for a slightly earlier slot. If you haven't already, please check your WhatsApps. Uh, if you uh, are watching, uh, I'm thinking particularly of Anthony or Jane, it'd be great to have you on a little earlier so that we can talk for a little longer and we can keep the show running throughout the whole time we are on air with lots of interviews and engaging conversations. So please, if you are watching, get in touch and we can get you on a little bit earlier. Um, also others who are on later as well, would be great to have you drop in earlier too. Um, so uh, with that in mind, uh, you know now the scale of the uh, guests uh, that we have uh, for you today uh, running up until six o'clock. Uh, we've got five and a half hours left of the show. Uh, this show is only possible because of the kind and generous donations of people like you. Bright Green doesn't have the backing of billionaires and big business. It relies on you folks. If you've enjoyed the interviews that we've had so far, and um, if, you, uh, if you've enjoyed the, the interviews that we've had so far, if you're looking forward to what's still to come, then please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation. Um, it would make a massive difference in terms of what we're able to do with these shows on Bright Green Live, also the other interviews, videos and so on that we're putting out uh, in the coming weeks and months and our ongoing coverage of the UK's Green Parties, the Labour Movement, Social Movements and the Arts on our website bright-green.org. If you are able to donate, please do head to our website bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation. I have breaking news, which is that Jane Baston is able to do slightly earlier. So she's going to be joining us from half one, according to my phone. Uh, so uh, I changed the schedule, uh, but hopefully that means that we'll be able to squeeze everyone in. It'll be a nice smooth running afternoon and we will um, be able to chat for a little longer, which would be great. So um I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, I'll be back in about five, ten minutes and we'll then uh, head on with the rest of the stream. But please, in the meantime, do hit that like button, hit subscribe so you don't miss out. And please, whilst I'm away, send me loads of questions in the chat. I would love to have a nice long conversation with you. Uh, I can see there's over a dozen people watching right now. There's over a dozen people who could send me a dozen questions. That's 144 questions. Get me 144 questions. I'll answer every single one um, uh, when I'm back. Thank you very much. I'll see you very, very soon.
Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. You are watching episode one of Bright Green Live. We are halfway through the show. Thank you so much to everyone who's joined us so far. Thank you everyone who has um, liked the video, who has shared comments and questions in the chat and also on social media on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Please, those of you who are watching now, do so. Uh, I would love to get your thoughts on what you've heard so far. We've had some absolutely amazing uh, guests uh, already. I would love to know uh, in the chat uh, who's your favourite been uh, and also what you've learned so far and what you're taking away from the interviews and the conversations we've had thus far. Uh, we still have um, over half a dozen guests to come. And uh, we have some absolutely incredible people who are going to be speaking to you about a whole bunch of things, including the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, Zach Polanski, talking about the state of the British Constitution. We have Chris Saltmarsh from Labour for a Green New Deal, talking about the state of Labour's climate policies, where they are and where they should be. We have Vix Lalvian, the Green Party's education spokesperson, talking about the ongoing issues in the school system and the, um, the issues, uh, the reasons why the trade unions in the school sector, the NEU, the NASUWT and the NAHT are currently balloting for strike action and a whole bunch of other speakers and guests still to come. The next guest we have is Jane Baston, who is the co-chair of the Young Greens. She'll be talking to us about the student movement, where it currently is now, what the Young Greens role within it is um, and how we can support the struggle of students. That's going to be coming up very, very soon. Before we get there, um, Please do pop questions and comments in the chat, questions for Jane, questions for the other guests, questions for me, and we'll get them all read out and answered as many as we can. Also stick them on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Now currently, Bright Green has 389 subscribers. That's not, not many, but it's not bad. We could get a whole lot more. And the way that we can get a whole lot more is by you right now, if you haven't already, hitting that subscribe button. We've already added over a dozen today. We can get to that 400 number, um, I reckon, by the end of the day. So please do hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. So we've got some comments that are coming through in the chat. Uh, we've got a question coming in for Jane, um, and uh, I'll put that to her when she is on. We also have a question from Rich Turner Music. Um, Rich asks what's the strategy for the may elections and indeed if the sunak government collapses at the rate of one minister a week um so what i'm going to do with that question rich is i'm going to put that to zach polanski he seems like the uh, best person to put that to but i'll have a little go at it as well um so i guess the the the, the back end of the question uh seems to be suggesting that you know we might have another collapse of the government. Um, you know, we've seen <laughs> the collapse of the Boris Johnson government, then we saw the collapse of the Liz Truss government, and now we're seeing Rishi Sunak uh, being hit by a number of um, either resignations or scandals on his front bench. Um, there's still the looming prospect that we could have an early general election before it's required to take place in 2025. Um, so I guess if we're thinking, what's the strategy for, uh, if there is a general early general election, um, I think, well, I'll answer that in two ways. I'll answer that firstly, um, I guess, from uh, the, well, three ways. Firstly, I'll, I'll answer it from uh, the perspective of the Greens. So what do I think the Greens should be doing uh, strategically in the run to a potential early general election? I mean, from my perspective, I think there's uh, a real obvious political window at the moment that has been left open by the Labour Party. So under Keir Starmer's leadership, obviously, the party has moved substantially to the right uh, since where it was under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, um, particularly on social issues, but also on economic issues. Now, on economic issues, you know, the, the speech we got from Labour Party conference and the speech that he made to the TUC Congress, um, we got an indication of some soft shifting towards the left on some issues. So, for example, you got the announcement of the, uh, that the next Labour government would form a new publicly owned renewable energy generation company. Uh, we got a commitment around uh, working to end outsourcing in local government. Uh, at TUC Congress, um, Keir Starmer committed to uh, repealing anti-trade union laws, particularly the 2016 Trade Union Act. You know, those are all like relatively good when it comes to an economic offer. Um, however, there's still massive, massive gaps in that economic offer. And we've seen that particularly over the last few days, I think with um, Labour front benches refusing to 
come out in support of uh, the pay demands of uh, striking workers. Um, so refusing to say that they would um, support the pay demands, for example, of the Royal College of Nurses, which is just successfully balloted for strike action um, with nurses having suffered pay real term pay cuts for years and years and years are now uh, fighting for a proper inflation busting pay rise. The Labour Party is saying that it won't uh, deliver that. There are also on a whole bunch of other issues when it comes to uh, workers rights, when it comes to pay, you know, we've seen uh, the Labour leadership saying uh, well, or, or preventing uh, front benches um, from joining picket lines. Um, although they seem to have wound themselves back a little bit from that, that appears to have still been for quite some time the kind of position of the Labour Party that that the Labour Party won't stand so shoulder to shoulder with the workers that are fighting for um, for economic justice. So I think there's a clear political window for the Greens to present the the radical progressive vision uh, that the Green Party has um, for the economy. Uh, a total transformation of the economy in the interests of uh, people and the planet away from the interests of profit, big business and capital. Um, you know, putting forward that radical agenda, whether it be, you know, frontlining our policies for a £15 an hour minimum wage, for uh, supporting the uh, the trade union movement in its industrial disputes, for uh, supporting the public ownership of our public services in general, not just, for example, as Labour have, have, have touted a renewable energy company, but also uh, call it, uh, supporting the public ownership of uh, raw mail, of water, of energy, of public transport. Um, really sorry, I need to sneeze. So apologies in advance. <laughs> um, that was highly embarrassing. Um, yeah, so supporting the public ownership of <laughs> public services, but also uh, those areas of utilities and transport, but also crucially the NHS. So Labour has been particularly weak on um issues of nhs privatization and outsourcing you know west treating has repeatedly said that you know uh that that, that, that the labor government would rely on uh, outsourcing and private involvement in the nhs i think clearly that gives the greens a window of opportunity to be talking about, about radical vision um for the economy and that being a compelling vision for the economy in the current context where you know people are experiencing um the the, the prospect of of energy bills that they can't pay of uh, uh of um, you know making the choice between heating and eating when they are um you know facing a situation where they're paying uh massive bills to private water companies who are pumping raw sewage into our rivers um you know all these things that and, and alongside that the issue of inflation and the fact that people haven't had a proper pay rise for many many years i think it's very clear that there is a a series of economic solutions to that and that there is a party that is offering that that's my perspective as a green party member and that's my perspective as you know what i would be talking about uh in terms of the greens in a, in a general election scenario i think the other thing that i would say is that earlier i said that the labor party is uh moved substantially to the right on social issues and i think that's abundantly clear when you look for example at the party's policies on migration now we had anna oppenheim earlier from the um cam labor campaign for free movement, putting across the case of uh, their campaign group and, and the, the kind of the left Labour migration position, uh, left Labour activists position on migration and what they're pushing the leadership to adopt. But the leadership at the moment of the Labour Party is, you know, that they are trying to outflank the Tories from the right on migration. You've seen that at Prime Minister's questions where uh, Keir Starmer has sort of suggested that the, the Labour Party needs to be more competent uh, sorry, that the government needs to be more competent when it comes to administering a, you know, a racist, reactionary, oppressive migration system. You've seen them talking about, you know, you've had Rachel Reeves and others talking about how the idea that the problem with the Tories' current migration policies uh, isn't that they are wrong, that they are unjust, that they are uh, oppressive, that they are racist, but actually that they're not deporting people quick enough. And you've seen from benches like Stephen Kinnock floating the idea of ID cards. Like, this is a a program which is deeply right-wing, deeply reactionary, and we've seen where this leads the Labour Party before. So in 2015, the Labour Party was taking a similar position on migration. In fact, it was it was less aggressive and hostile than than the one we're seeing from Keir Starmer's leadership. So under Ed Miliband, you know, the 
the um the the ed stone <laughs> if you remember the ed stone carved into stone the words controls on immigration printed mugs with controls and immigration on it um and took a very hard line on immigration to try and outflank the tories from the right or to neutralize the issue of migration it didn't neutralize the issue of migration it pushed more people into the tories because if you're talking about uh, migration from the rights point of view then you were obviously going to push people in that direction what it also did was it pushed people in the greens direction because the greens were saying loud and clear that we're a party that supports migrants we're a party that um uh says refugees are welcome and so on and so on and so on and so i think if we're talking about the green party strategy in the next election for me it absolutely has to be those two things it has to be a radical economic agenda and it has to be um it has to be talking about uh migration and other social issues from a progressive standpoint um that combined with a effective ground campaign in a number of key constituencies uh, to uh, to start to get more Caroline Lucas elected, I think is the key. Now, I think about five minutes ago, apologies, this was a very long answer, and I'm sure Zach will be much more pithy than me. Um, but I, I said that I'd answer it in two other ways, a couple of other ways as well. So I think from the Labour Party's perspective, in terms of their strategy, I think. Uh, and obviously I'm not a Labour Party member, but if I was in the Labour Party, the sorts of things that I would be doing would be talking up uh, what 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 a, a, a Labour government could do when it comes to, you know, literally how much money people have in their bank accounts, how they pay their bills, how they make ends meet, how they make work work for people. Um, and I'd be, be hammering the economic agenda because that's going to be dominating a lot of the uh, the the next general election. We assume um, now that the, 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 the Tories will want to fight on culture war issues. And the problem that I've just sort of described the Labour Party is that they're at the moment trying to Either neutralise the culture war issues by, uh, by 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 pushing reactionary narratives, or to outflank the Tories from the right. That's a very difficult. Uh, um, I, I don't think that's that's an effective strategy for the Labour Party. So if I was the Labour Party, I would be avoiding doing that. I would be taking a progressive position on those issues, and I'd be putting forward to, um, constantly hammering uh, the idea that the Tories have, you know, led to the decimation of public services and um, people's uh, the, the amount of money people have got in their pockets. Um, so that that answers the first part of that question. The, the second part of that question about um, you know what if we get a general election and if the government collapses. Um, so we've got some great questions coming in on uh, from Ben Samuel. Thank you so much. I think the first two of those uh, are for probably best place to go to Jane. So I'm going to put those to Jane when she joins us later on. Um, we've got a question about. Um, Great question about air pollution and uh, some of the questions on young people and students. So I'll put those to our guests. Um, but if you have any other questions for me, let me know and I'll try and answer them as best I can. And I'll try and be shorter than I was on that one, but um, hopefully it went somewhere to answer your question. Uh, but please do put them in the chat. Let us know what you think about the interviews we've had so far. Uh, put questions uh, for our future guests coming up and make sure you like the video so that uh, it appears in more people's feeds as well. For those of you just joining us, this is episode one of Bright Green Live. We're going to be having a series of interviews with guests throughout the rest of the day. We've got about half a dozen guests left to come. Uh, including uh, Zach Polanski, the Deputy Leader of the Green Party, Jane Baston, uh, the co-chair of the Young Greens, who's up next. We have Benali Hamdash, the Green Party's migration spokesperson, who hopefully can talk about some of the things that I was just talking about as well. We have Chris Saltmarsh from Labour for a Green New Deal and others to join us too. Uh, so please do get questions in the chat ready for them as well as getting questions in the chat for me if there's anything you want to hear my views on, uh, which you may or may not want um so uh ben said looking forward to hearing more of the arts in short breaks between interviews um i'm not entirely sure what that means but um nonetheless uh those of you who will have seen the promotion for this will have seen that the uh, the Bright Green Live has been billed as uh, a series of interviews with people from across the left, but also from the arts. Unfortunately, we didn't really get anyone from the arts joining us on this episode. We're going to make up for that big time in future episodes. So we're going to have uh, people from musicians to authors, poets, that kind of stuff, discussing uh, the arts and the political uh, aspects of the arts as well. Um, so hopefully we will have those when you join us in the future. The best way to make sure that you can uh, keep uh, following Bright Green Live, catch up the future episodes, is to hit that subscribe button if you haven't done already. It means that you won't miss out on any of the future episodes that we put out. Um, brilliant. Well, we've got about 20 minutes to go until Jane joins us. Um, so I would love to hear, if you haven't already, if you could let me know in the chat 
uh, which interviews you've enjoyed the most so far and also um, which uh, you're looking forward to the most, anything you've learnt, uh, any questions for the guests, uh, how you're feeling uh, on this fine sun Sunday uh, afternoon. It's very beautiful and sunny here in Oxford. It's a lovely autumnal uh, sunny day. I'm quite sad to be sat here, but I'm not sad to be sat with you guys. Uh, so please pop your questions and so on in the chat. Um, in the meantime, um, just to remind you for those who don't know, Bright Green is a online publication that is uh, designed and built around providing coverage and commentary on the UK's labour movement, its green parties, social movements and the wider left. We produce news content, we run comment pieces from key people, we produce videos and, and so on like this. Um, you can find all of our right written uh, coverage on our website bright-green.org if you haven't already you can also keep up to date with us on all the socials so we're on facebook at facebook.com forward slash bright grn uh, we are on twitter at twitter.com forward slash bright grn we're on instagram at bright green online and we're on mastodon too we're one of the early uh, adopters uh, i don't know how to tell you where we are on mastodon because that website is still a maze to me but we are bright green we're on the uk server you might be able to find it if you search the hashtag bright green live you should see see the posts from us there or toots as i believe they're called on mastodon uh which is the worst name for anything ever uh but you can find us on there follow us on there too so follow us on the socials uh, you can find all of our written content on the website. Please do your, keep your questions and comments coming in. We're going to be kicking off with the interview with Jane at uh, 1.30. For those of you who are expecting an interview with Emily Apple at the Canary and weren't online earlier, uh, unfortunately she wasn't able to join us today, so we're going to get her back on on a future episode to talk about why the Canary has relaunched as a cooperative, a workers' cooperative, kicked out the bosses and put the workers in charge. Uh, we're going to be doing that uh at a future episode because unfortunately she couldn't join us today but we will have jane uh at the earlier than um promoted time of 1 30 we'll hopefully get to have a little bit of a longer conversation i can already see there's there's a, there's a there's a load of questions in the chat for jane so i'll pick those up with her and the questions that we've got for her as well um so stay tuned i'm going to take another five minute break and then we'll be back for jane at half one thank you so much see you soon
Hello, hello, hello. We are back with episode one of Bright Green Live. We are halfway through the show. Um, and we have had dozens of people watching so far. Uh, it's been brilliant to have you all. We've had an amazing lineup of speakers and guests. Uh, please do pop questions and comments in the chat for our speakers and guests. The next of which is Jane Baston. Now, for those of you who don't know, Jane Baston is the co-chair of the Young Greens, which is the youth and student branch of the Green Party of England and Wales. Jane's going to be talking to us a little bit about the role of the Young Greens in the student movement, the state of the student movement right now. Um, and we've got some great questions already in the chat for Jane. Please do keep them coming um, and uh, also pop them on the hashtag bright green live now we are on 390 subscribers we started the day on 372 we've got 18 new ones let's hit that 400 mark if you haven't already hit that subscribe button right this second and let us get to 400 it will make a massive difference to bright green but most importantly most importantly most importantly what it will do is make sure that you don't miss out on any of the upcoming videos that we have going out in the coming weeks and months including of course the next episode of bright green live on December the 11th. Uh, so hit that subscribe button and you won't miss out at all. Also hit the like button. There's 21 likes on the stream. That's nowhere near enough. Let's get more and more of you liking it. Feed the algorithm. Let this appear in more people's feeds and they will uh, get to enjoy the interviews as well as you. The other way you can do that is by sharing the stream on social media, preferably using the hashtag Bright Green Live. It means that if you've enjoyed these interviews, other people will too, and then they'll get to see them as well. So we're going to be kicking off with our next interview very, very shortly with Jane Baston earlier than the advertised time. That hopefully will mean we get to speak to her for a little longer. We then have a great lineup of speakers still to come, including Zach Blansky, the Deputy of the Green Party of England and Wales, Guy Ingerson from the Scottish Greens, Chris Saltmarsh from Labour for a Green New Deal, and many, many more. So stay tuned. We're going to be here till 6 p.m. Um, I'm going to be very tired by then. So you owe it to me to keep watching, uh, but please do keep comments and questions coming in the chat. We have a flurry of questions from the non-stop question machine, Ben Samuel, most of which appear to be aimed towards Jane, which I'll put some of those to Jane. Um, I'll also um, uh, maybe put some of them to our other guests as well where it's relevant. Um, there's some internal questions about the Green Party, there's some questions about the student movement, there's some questions about student issues. Uh, please do keep questions and comments coming. I would love to hear um, who you're looking forward to the most and what you have enjoyed most so far um, in this stream. We've been going for uh, a long old time now, three and a half hours, uh, just about that. Uh, we've had uh, amazing guests. We've had Matthew Hall from the Green Party Trade Union Group. We've had Anna Oppenheim from Labour Campaign for Free Movement. We've had Jean Lambert, uh, the former Green Party MP. We've had Jay Kerr and uh, we've had Kain Zah Ong from uh, No Sweat and the uh, Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar, respectively. Uh, they've said some fascinating things, some inspiring things, some interesting things. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the chat and on the uh, on the live stream. No, on the socials on the hashtag bright green live um i'll just check the hashtag see if anyone has anything interesting to say um so brixton was my home uh said that we're doing a great job and they're enjoying the interviews and they're looking forward to the interview with banali hamdash um i'm looking forward to that interview too uh, so Benali is the migration spokesperson for the Green Party, he's a councillor in Islington um, and a long-standing Green Party uh, member and activist. Uh, don't miss out on that. Um, we have another comment from on the Twitters uh, from uh, Finn White. Finn says that Matthew Hull was great on the live stream today and they were really impressed with Matthew's answer to the question about trade union, the trade union movement intersecting with other campaigns. Matthew talked about the uh, the role that trade, union, trade unions have played in campaigns for racial justice, um, LGBT rights and so on. Um, we've also, uh, yeah, got loads of comments coming in. Uh, please do keep them coming on the socials on hashtag Bright Green Live and in the chat on um on the youtubes 
Uh, I need to stop saying the YouTubes. That is not good. Uh, Rich Turner um, on Mastodon. If you're on Mastodon, we're at Bright Green on the UK server. Rich Turner said um, that England's win over Pakistan in the T20 World Cup has set them up nicely for the afternoon. So they're now switching over to the Bright Green live feed for some real politics. Uh, that is what you will get here on this stream. So very, very shortly, Jane Basson will be joining us. She's the co-chair of the Young Greens. She'll be talking about the student movement and the Young Greens' role within it. Uh, if you're interested in hearing what Jane has to say, please do um, uh, let us know in the chat and also let us know any questions that you have for Jane when she joins us. I've got some questions lined up. There's some great questions already in the chat, but I would love to have more to put to her as well. So we're going to be kicking off with that interview in about five or 10 minutes time. Um, and uh, hopefully you will enjoy it. I can see someone's just liked the stream. Please do like the stream if you haven't already. Um, and uh, we'll get going with that interview very, very soon. Um, one of the earlier interviews we had was with um, Jean Lambert, uh, who was the MEP for London for 20 years. Um, and she worked closely with Keith Taylor for nine of those years, who was an MEP for the southeast of England. Sadly, Keith Taylor passed away very recently, and she shared some of uh, her experiences of working with him, some of the memories she has, some of the impact that he's had on not just the Green Party, but the whole of European politics in his role as an MEP. And uh, you can scroll back in the stream and watch that. She was on at 11.15, um, and... Uh, it's a really moving moving conversation, I think, because she was one of the people who worked close, most closely with Keith, who, to my mind, is one of the most important uh, figures in the history of the Green Party. He was um, one of the party's uh, principal speakers, uh, which was a precursor to the role of leader. He did that for two years alongside Caroline Lucas. He also was a councillor in Brighton Hove uh, for a decade. And when he started as a councillor, he was one of just three uh, Greens in the, the city council. And when he left, a year after he left, uh, the Greens were running the council. He was also the parliamentary candidate in 2005 for the Greens in Brighton Pavilion, which uh, in that in that year, he won the highest share of the vote that any Green had ever won in a parliamentary election uh, at that point. And five just five years later after after that, he uh, Carol Lucas went on to win the seat to become the first ever Green MP. Uh, he also had a huge impact on the uh on legislation in the european parliament with uh you know him him playing a key and leading role on issues from air pollution to animal rights uh to human rights and international justice and i'd really recommend you going back and watching that interview with gene because uh, i learned a lot from it it was incredibly moving and uh, it's important that we remember um uh the the people that uh have you know been fighting for a just and better world and the reality is that uh, much of the mainstream media won't do any of the work to 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 memorialise people like Keith, uh, who have been uh, who've played an active role in, in in green politics and the Green Party for for for, for many many years. Um, and I think it's so it's important that we memorialise uh, that too. So please please do go back and watch that interview. You can also catch the interview we did with um, we had with uh, um, Kai Ung. Uh, and Jay Kerr from the uh, in in Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar and No Sweat. Um, that was an incredibly moving interview as well. I think the uh, the conversation we had there was about the, the political situation in Myanmar right now after the military coup that took place, the, um, the impact that's had on the labour movement and how in the UK we can act and stand in solidarity with workers uh, in Myanmar who are who have suffered under the, the brutality of that military regime. We've got 10 people watching. Thanks to those of you who have just joined. Um, for those of you who are new here, you are watching episode one of Bright Green Live. My name is Chris and I am the editor of Bright Green and I am hosting right up until six o'clock when the, uh, the sun will go down and the evening will begin. We've got an incredible lineup of guests, including Zach Polanski, the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, Chris Saltmarsh from Labour for a Green New Deal. Uh, we're going to be talking about a whole range of issues over the next um, four and a bit hours. Um, the first of which is going to be uh, about the student movement, the state of the student movement, and crucially the role of the Young Greens in that student movement. The Young Greens is the uh, the youth and student wing of the Green Party of England and Wales, and today we'll be joined by Jane Baston, um, who is the co-chair of the Young Greens, and she'll be joining us 
very, very soon in just two or three minutes time. So hang on for that. If you have questions for Jane, if you have thoughts on the student movement, if you have thoughts on the stream so far, please do pop them in the chat and we'll pick up and read out and ask the questions that you have um, for our guests and also for me. Also would love to hear your thoughts on what, um, what we've discussed so far today. Now, um, I've mentioned it before, but for those of you who are newly joining, Bright Green Live is a new monthly uh, show. We're going to be running it on the second Sunday of every month, the next of which will be taking place on December the 11th. We've started to get some of our guests lined up for that show too, uh, the first of which is Rhea Patel, who is a counsellor in Croydon. She's also the equality and diversity, they're also the equality and diversity spokesperson for the Green Party of England and Wales. Uh, and they're going to be talking about tackling transphobia within the Green Party, among other things, which will tie in nicely to a conversation we're having later today with Guy Ingerson from the Scottish Greens, who's going to be talking about the motion that he put forward to the Scottish Greens conference to get the Scottish Greens to sever their ties with the Green Party of England and Wales. So those conversations hopefully will be illuminating and we'll, we'll look at how how we tackle issues of transphobia within political parties and specifically within the Green Party. If you haven't already, please do uh, like the stream. Uh, please do hit that subscribe button. We're getting achingly close to 400 subscribers. Uh, that would be brilliant for uh, Bright Green in terms of uh, the amount of people we're able to reach on YouTube. It helps to feed the algorithm, means that these videos appear in more and more people's feeds. But it also crucially means that you won't miss out on anything that's coming up, uh, any of the videos that we're putting out in the coming weeks and months, including the next episode of Bright Green Live. You'll get a, pop, you'll get a little notification on your phone or your laptop. Uh, which will tell you when we're going live. It will tell you when we put out new videos, interviews with um, uh, key figures from across the left um, in the UK and elsewhere. Uh, hopefully, very, very soon, we're going to be running a series of video interviews with the candidates for uh, the Green Party's internal selection for its candidate for the Mayor of London. Uh, we'll be doing that, um, hopefully, in the coming weeks. Um, so if you don't want to miss out on that, if you want to uh, hear from the people who want to be the next Green candidate for mayor, for London Mayor, hit that subscribe button and you won't miss out on those. If you haven't already, follow us on the socials. Bright Green um, uh, is on Twitter, at BrightGRN on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash BrightGRN on Instagram, at Bright green online and on mastodon or at bright green on the uk server i think that probably gets you inf information to, to find us on mastodon not particularly familiar with that platform and it is very very confusing so coming up next we have jane baston who is the co-chair of the young greens she's going to be joining us and talking about the current state of the uk student movement and the role of the young greens in it if you have any questions for jane please do pop them in the chat i can see there are lots of questions there already we'll try and get through as many as possible and you can also tweet them on the hashtag bright green live um jane will be joining us in around one minute and i can see that jane has just joined the call so i'm going to let jane in and as she's connecting i'm just going to say once again that jane baston is the co-chair of the young greens of england and wales and she's going to be joining us right now to talk about the role of the young greens within the student movement and the state of the student movement in the uk more broadly thank you very much jane for joining us and for joining us half an hour than earlier than than build and um, how are you doing jane I am um, I'm doing okay I'm a tiny bit achy from being out on protesting yesterday um my feet hurt a little bit but I'm doing all right how are you <laughs> I'm good I didn't manage to get out yesterday but uh I am probably equally as tired uh from the four hours I've been doing this for um already so uh, we said we're going to talk about the role of the Young Greens in the student movement. We've also got a bunch of questions that have come through in the chat which I'll try and pick up as well but to kick us off um I wonder if you could just explain what you think the role of the Young Greens is right now in the student movement. Yeah, um, big question. Um, <laughs> so um, for anyone watching that doesn't know, the Young Greens is obviously the youth and student wing of the Green Party. Um, and I think kind of our place um, in particular is about being almost a political voice for the student movement. Um, obviously, Labour has moved much more to the centre um, and don't really talk about students and young people don't seem to care about them that much. Um, and I think for the Young Greens in particular, we want to be there raising the issues and talking about the things that are impacting students. Um, 
there has been a lot of upheaval for students over the last couple of years um, throughout the pandemic from being kind of locked in halls, um, from having to pay for halls that they weren't able to access um, to all of the changes that happened throughout the pandemic. Um, and there's not been a huge number of people speaking for them. Um, and I think that's kind of our place um, as the Young Greens is to try and be a voice for those people um, and also to kind of push the party as well into, into talking about young people in particular um, and to be talking about the things that are impacting young people and students because often uh, the things that are impacting the wider population, for example, uh, the housing crisis that's currently going on or the cost of living crisis um, have a particular impact um, on students. Um, so, for example, cost of living crisis is impacting everybody, um, but students have been living in poverty for, for years um, at this point because of things like uh, maintenance loans not going up. Um, and it's something that is really having a very acute impact on students in particular. Um, and I think being a political voice for them is really important um, and bringing them in as well. Um, I think we also have a place in terms of um, organising within the student movement. Um, the student movement um, does a lot of organising, a lot of bringing people together, um, a lot of grassroots um, campaigning. And I think we really have a place there as well in terms of supporting that and amplifying it as well. Um, things like um, the occupations that are currently happening um, at the University of Leeds. Um, and I'm sure that there will be others that pop up across the country as well. Um, showing them solidarity, amplifying their voices. So that's kind of where I would say that we stand at the moment um, in terms of the Young Greens and the student movement. So for people who aren't familiar with the student movement, um, to give a bit of context, there's uh, a, tr a long running tradition of political organisations, whether they be linked to political parties or um, otherwise, of working and organizing uh, within the structures of the student movement to um, to obtain political office within them uh, and to organize in them to um, to gain gain influence in the formal structures and by formal structures I mean things like for example uh, NUS the National Union of Students or individual students unions um, or in some instances, the kind of more radical um, uh, organisations on the, the the sort of left fringes of the the student movement, and they they've historically done so uh, um, often through their own banner. So, for example, Labour Students for a long, long time was uh, the core organ organisation within NUS, winning uh, officer positions, and also at students' union level, winning lots of positions across the country, and basically uh, having major influence over the student movement through. Uh, the institutions. Um, the Young Greens over for a long time has kind of struggled to replicate that and struggled to uh, gain those positions of influence and power within the student movement. Um, why do you think that is and is there something changing on that front? Yeah, um, so I think there's a couple of reasons for this and I think obviously if we look kind of back in the history of the Young Greens there have been kind of times where we've had little bits of that, that kind of that power and that influence. Um, so for example, uh, I think it was back in 2015, 2016, when we had two Young Greens elected to the block of 15 within the NUS. Um, there have been obviously sabbatical officers elected across the country um, who are Green Party members, yourself being one, Chris, uh, me also being one, um, although I will admit that I only joined the party a couple of months before taking up my role as, as an officer, and it was definitely a sparing moment for me um, to kind of um, sign up to the party when I was like, I've got a full-time job. Um, and I think for, for the Young Greens in particular, I think part of it is that we don't necessarily organize within those structures because we organize outside of them much more. Um, and for us, I think that's partially because we want to change education for the better and we want to improve it. And often that's not possible to do from inside of it. Um, and it's something that I've definitely experienced as, as an officer myself, as somebody that currently works at a student union as well, changing things like the NUS um, or things like the Office for Students abolishing the office for students and the way it works and the way that it regulates the sector or scrapping something like the education act of 1994 is not necessarily possible to do from inside the student movement you can be really angry about it you can be really loud about the impact that it makes 
But the limitations put on things like student unions means that you can't necessarily make that change. And I think for the Young Greens, um, we're very much have been focused on doing that organising outside of the student movement to change the student movement. So, for example, getting political power so that we can abolish things like the, the 1994 Education Act, which limits what student unions can do. Um, and I think that's where a lot of our energy has been going into, into the more electoral, political organising, rather than focusing it so much on the internal organising of the student movement itself. Um, I think that's one part of the answer. I think the other part of it is that we haven't had the capacity to do it um, and we haven't necessarily had the drive to do it. And I think I think that's shifting slowly. I would like to think it is. Um, obviously, our Green Students Committee only restarted. I should know this because I was elected as the co-convener when it restarted two years ago. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was two years ago um, and is still kind of finding its feet a little bit, figuring out where it fits and what it's kind of been doing. Um, so, for example, um, it's been running, as you know, Chris, you've come along to some of them, um, events to support um, left wing candidates who want to stand for student union election. Um, we've been doing things like that. But I think there is more work to be done there, particularly around the education piece um, in terms of the power that those structures hold. Um, being a student union officer is an incredible opportunity. <laughs> it's exhausting. Um, it's great fun. It gives you a lot of power and you can make a lot of change with it. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily something that we've been kind of educating our members about, bringing them in to that side of organizing and using those formal structures. Um, so I think it's kind of twofold. Um, and I think in terms of the capacity, I think that is changing. Um, I think we are slowly building up um, a kind of grassroots young greens group who hopefully will go on and take on these positions we've got some really really strong young green university groups and local groups that hopefully will look at taking up these positions um, that's obviously only just started to come back after the pandemic group organizing was very difficult when it was all online um, so I think we're really hoping to kind of push that forward um, over the next kind of what nine months and then obviously next execs to pick that up. So I'm going to come to some questions in the chat in a moment, but I have one final question for you um, from myself. And so over the last sort of decade, 12, 15 years, uh, the student movement has lost battle after battle after battle when it comes to uh, policies that have uh, attacked students that have um, you know, uh, transform the relationship between of students from uh, a someone receiving a public service and an education uh, towards being a consumer of a product. Um, you know, you've had the trouble. You know, we had the introduction of tuition fees, then you had the troubling of tuition fees, and the troubling of tuition fees again. You've had cuts to the maintenance grants, uh, attacks to disabled students allowance, and, and so on and so on and so on. And the student movement um, has has lost all those defensive battles. Um, even in spite of the the mass mobilisation of the the student uprising of 2010 2011, how do you think that the student movement can move beyond this and can get to a point where it builds uh, enough power that it can win not just offensive demands but can also win a transformation of our education system? Yeah. Um just listening to you you read out that that huge list of like losses is like slightly like gutting um and and very kind of it makes me want to just go and like cry a little bit in a corner um because yeah it it has been a gutting really is the only word I have for it um to constantly kind of lose this battle for a better educational system um and I think it's something that we need like we need to acknowledge the fact that we have lost and the fact that the, the movement has been very much hollowed out, um, particularly if you look at things like like the NUS and the way that its structures have recently been changed. Um, but I think in terms of how we how we rebuild that, um, and I think it's there is a lot of change going on in the student movement right now um, in the way that we view organizing and the way that we do organizing as well, and the way that we bring students into that and bring students together. Um, interest really interestingly actually coming from the NUS itself um, and the NUS kind of changing its focus from being 
more of a political lobbying organization that's in the ears of kind of MPs and things like that into trying to build a very grassroots movement of of students um, across the country. Um, I think part of what we need to do is bringing people together, not just in the student movement, but across the country. You know, um, one of the people that I speak to at the NUS um, talks about the, the strategy to bring your nan in, uh, which I really love, um, about kind of how you how you bring your parents and your grandparents and those people who may not care about education until their grandchild goes to university. Um, so I think it is partially about building that really kind of wide grassroots movement that is pushing for a, a better educational system that does serve students, that isn't just about the, the, the transactional cost of I pay you money and you give me a degree. Um, I think it's also about changing about how we look at education um, and how we look at university degrees in particular, um, because this is obviously a narrative that very much comes from the Tory government is the fact that university students are overeducated left-wing activists um, who they probably don't like um, or they very definitely don't like um, and I think it's about changing that narrative about what education is worth um, and why a university degree is so radically transformative for people um, I'm not sure if that answers the question at all, but I think it is coming back and I think it's very much building it from the grassroots level, um, which is definitely happening at universities across the country. You know, we've seen rent strikes happening over the past, past couple of years. We've seen more um, protests from students. We've seen um, an increasing number of occupations. I know I mentioned Leeds, um, but Burbeck, I think, is also um, fighting back against the cuts that have just been announced to their university as well. Um, and I think it really is about students taking the lead and students building that together um, into a grassroots movement across the country. So I'm going to come to some questions from the chat now. Um, for those watching, if you have questions, please do put them on the ch in the chat uh, or on socials on the hashtag Bright Green Live, and we'll get them put to our guests in this instance to Jane. Um, so I've got a couple of questions um, that I want to put you put to you from Ben Samuel. Um, so Ben has asked, um, what are the current uh, campaigns that the Young Greens is prioritising right now? Yeah, good question. Um, so we've kind of got three for this year. Um, so one of them is about um, electoral reform. Um, so we really want to be pushing for um, votes at 16 um, and for better um, voting systems. Um, votes at 16 is something that is particularly important to us um, to be pushing for, to be pushing for local councils to be passing those types of motions, um, and in Wales in particular, um, to make sure that under 18s know that they can vote um, in, in the local elections. Um, so that's one. Um, the second one is kind of cost of living, um, as would probably be expected. Um, so pushing for better support for all young people um, in light of the cost of living crisis. Um, and then the third one that we're looking at is educational reform. Um, so this comes into a couple of different areas. Um, so one is about pushing back against the marketization of education. Um, so that's looking at things like scrapping tuition fees, reintroducing maintenance grants, making sure that postgraduate researchers are paid properly as well. Um, and then the other side of that is um, for us is looking at schools and colleges um, and looking at exams <laughs> and looking at alternative forms of assessment that we can have. We know that exams are, no matter what Michael Gove says, they are not a good way of assessing people. Um, they really don't reflect what people can achieve. Um, so we really want to be looking um, this year in particular at what those alternatives are so that we can start campaigning really strongly for them. So those are kind of our three focus areas for this year. Um, but you're welcome to get in touch with our campaigns officer if you want to find out more. And uh, those campaigns have gone down well with our viewers uh, so far. Finn White says yay for votes of 16 and boo <laughs> for exams. We've also had a very retro shout out from Ben Samuel uh, for a former Young Greens campaign. And uh, Hannah Albrook, a previous Young Greens co-chair, will be very happy to see this. Uh, but Ben says that they are a big fan of the uh, Save the Bees campaign, which the Young Greens ran uh, ooh, getting on about eight years ago now, I think. Um, I've got a question, another question from Ben, and then I've got some other questions I'd like to come to. So, um, 
Uh, so Ben Samuel asks, uh, what is music to your ears as students and young people that you hope to hear from the Green Party leadership? Oh, um, I think the best types of conversations that we have with the Green Party leadership are where they come to us and they ask us what the big issues are that are impacting students and young people um, and they want to hear it from us in particular. Um, for lots of young people and for lots of students we often get the case where people will try and speak over us and speak for us um, and having those types of conversations with the leadership is really really appreciated. Um, in terms of policy um, I really love it when people talk about scrapping tuition fees um i think that's a really big one um i think at the moment in particular talking about the housing crisis and how it's impacting students um there are numerous cities across the country where students are homeless um and students don't have anywhere to live um or they're not able to pay their bills um recent nus research has shown that a large majority of students only have 50 pound left um for the whole month after paying their rent and their bills um and that's not acceptable in any way shape or form to have students living in poverty um so i think those are kind of the two big policies i would say at the moment um but also anything that is about stopping the marketization of education um but coming to us and listening to us about what we're experiencing as young people and amplifying our voices is really the key thing from the leadership which i will say they are very good at doing um and we do really appreciate it when they do that so i've got another question this time from finn white uh so it's like more personal question i guess so finn asks uh how do you stay motivated as a young person involved in politics especially in a political system that doesn't listen to young people very often yeah it's a really good question and hi finn um finn's our under 18s officer um on the young greens exec um so first of all i get a lot of sleep um i think is a really important thing for me personally um and i think for me in particular, with the work that I do with the Young Greens, the thing that keeps me motivated a lot of the time is the people that I work with. Um, so we have an executive committee who are incredible um, and we work with our Democracy and Accountability Committee and our Green Students Committee. Um, and I do a lot of work with our student groups and our university groups and our local groups across the country as well. Um, and being able to go and talk to young people who are active, who are inspired, who are radical in their policies, who are pushing for change, who are organising together, coming together, um, is, is, I think, the thing that really does inspire me um, and really does keep me going. Um, I will quite often um, come to a Young Greens executive meeting after a day of work and feel a little bit grumpy and like, oh, I just want to go to bed. Um, and then 20 minutes later, we'll be laughing on a Zoom call and having a great time um, while also discussing very serious Young Greens Executive Committee business. Um, but it's those types of things that I think really do keep me going. Um, I think the other thing as well is that right now with the Tory government, it can feel really, really difficult to imagine a different type of world and to imagine a better world. Um, and I think knowing that we have young people who can imagine that, who are pushing for that, who are creating for that in the cases um, of our Young Green councillors, um, is one of the things that keeps me going to be able to support them and to push for the type of future that we want um, and the type of future that we know that we can have um, if only we can get the Tories out of government. Obviously, lots of steps after that, but that's the first one. Um, so, yeah, I would say talking with other people and working with other Young Greens is the really big thing for me. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Jane. It's been an absolute pleasure. That's all right. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. That was Jane Baston, the co-chair of the Young Greens, which uh, for those of you who don't know, is the youth and student branch of the Green Party of England and Wales. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, that conversation. Please do leave them in the chat box on YouTubes. Uh, that's another time I've said YouTubes. Uh, I need to kick that habit. Uh, and also on the hashtag Bright Green Live on the Twitters. 
and on the Mastodons and on the Facebooks and on the Instagrams, wherever uh, on the socials you are. Um, thank you to Finn, to Philippa, to Ben, to others who have commented uh, in the chat uh, on that uh, conversation, filling questions. We've got an amazing lineup of speakers throughout the rest of the day coming up. Uh, so please do um, keep your questions and comments coming uh, as we bring them to you. Um, we'll read them out. Uh, we've got a dozen people watching. Uh, we can get more than that. Please do share the stream. Please do hit that like button. And of course, do subscribe. Um, I can see Jane lingering in the call. You are welcome to leave if you wish to, uh, unless you want to hang around and watch behind the scenes the rest of the interviews. But we will be here a while. So, um, so I'll let you get on. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, Jane, and for everyone for watching. Um, so that was Jane Baston a little earlier than um, Build. Uh, we've got uh, Philip Davis says, go Jane. And awesome to see this up and running, Chris. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, and Ben Samuel has said that it's great to experience the new technology of the YouTubes. Uh, I think a comment perhaps on uh, my age and me saying the word YouTubes and also my inability to use the YouTubes uh, this morning. Uh, we also have some comments that have come in on uh, the Twitters. Um, so Vix Lalvian says, keep watching. It's a fantastic way to spend your Sunday afternoon. Thank you very much, Vix. Vix will be on the uh, stream from 3 p.m. talking about the problems facing the school sector um, and why trade unions in the education system are currently balloting for strike action. We also have a comment from uh, Meg Foster uh, on Twitter's. Uh, Meg says, enjoying tuning into the bright green YouTube feed and listening to the brilliant Jane Baston with Vix Lovian coming up soon after. Pop it on and listen in. I couldn't agree more. Please do pop it on and listen in. Um, so just to give you a rundown of what's coming up, we have still to come Anthony Slaughter, the leader of the Wales Green Party, Vix Lowthy and the Green Party of England and Wales Education Spokesperson, Chris Saltmarsh, the co-founder of Labour for a Green New Deal, Banali Hamdash, uh, the Green Party's Migration Spokesperson, Guy Ingerson from the Scottish Greens and Zach Polanski, the Deputy Leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. If you're enjoying these conversations and interviews, then please, 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 other people will enjoy them too. So make sure to share the stream and to uh, tweet on the hashtag Bright Green Live so other people can uh experience the conversations we're having but also if you like the video it means that it'll appear on more people's feeds on youtube so more people will uh, see it on the algorithm uh that dictates where videos go on the youtubes uh so uh if you like the video it'll help us out a great deal there and more people will see it so we have coming up next on the show we have anthony slaughter the leader of the wales green party he will be talking about the future cymru forum which is a new body that's been set up jointly between the wales green party and plaid cymru to make the case for welsh independence we're going to be talking about Welsh independence. We're going to be talking about Future Cymru Forum, what it's doing, the relationship between the Wales Greens and Plaid Cymru, and much, much more coming up at 2.30. Um, in the afternoon, we've got much smaller gaps between the guests. Uh, unfortunately, that was a result of uh, one guest pulling out, which is why we've had these slightly longer gaps during the um, the first half of the show. In the second half, it's going to be rapid fire. You're not going to be able to take a breath because there's going to be so many interviews being flung at you left, right and centre. So please do stick around at half two. Anthony Slaughter is going to be kicking off. Uh, then we've got Vic Slavia and Chris Saltmarsh and so on, as we talked about earlier. Um, please keep your questions and comments coming in the chat. Um, as before, it's much, much easier if your questions can come in advance for the uh, guests that we have coming up. But also, um, please do ask any questions you have to me about Bright Green, about anything else that's going on in the world, going on in the world, about my favourite food, films, books, uh, and so on. Happy to answer everything and all. Um, and of course, uh, if you've enjoyed this stream so far, um, then you will want to watch the next episode, which is coming up on December the 11th. Uh, if you want to watch that episode, then the best way to make sure that you don't miss out is to hit that subscribe button. It means that you'll get a notification when the video goes live in a month's time uh, and you won't miss a thing. I'm going to take a quick five minute break and uh, then we'll be back for more and we'll be back with Anthony Slaughter very, very soon. See you soon.
Oh, hello, hello, hello. We are back on episode one of Bright Green Live. Uh, we've just heard from Jane Baston, who was the Young Greens co-chair of... Uh, she was the Young Greens co-chair. Uh, the Young Greens being the official youth and student wing of the Green Party of England and Wales. There's been loads of lovely comments for Jane in the chat and on Twitters. Uh, please do keep those comments and questions coming in. Uh, Peter Barnett says, thanks to Jane Baston, a very interesting and engaging performance. Thank you, Peter. Um, so for those of you who are just joining us, you are watching Bright Green Live, episode one. We have a great lineup of interviews still to come. Um, it, very, very shortly, we'll be joined by Anthony Slaughter, who, uh, for those of you who don't know, is the leader of the Wales Green Party. He's going to be talking to us about Welsh independence and the new body that the Wales Green Party and Plaid Cymru have jointly formed to make the case for Wales, Welsh independence. We're also going to be talking a little bit about why support for Welsh independence is lower than support for Scottish independence and a whole bunch of other things. So you can catch uh, him very, very soon. Please do pop questions in the chat for Anthony. Uh, it's easier for me if they come in a little further in advance that I can screen them and get them asked. So if you've got anything you want to see asked to Anthony, please do pop it in the chat. I'd also love to hear your thoughts on the interviews we've run so far, who have you enjoyed the most, what have you learned, and um, what are you looking forward to coming up. So far we've had amazing uh, guests including uh, Matthew Hull from the Green Party Trade Union Group, we have had Anna Oppenheim from the Labour Campaign for Freedom for free movement. We have had Jean Lambert talking about um, her former colleague, the uh, sadly departed Keith Taylor um, and her experience of working with him. Uh, and we also had uh, Jay Kerr from No Sweat and we had Kaiser Ung from the uh, Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar speaking about the situation facing trade unions and workers in that country since the military coup. You can scroll back in the stream and watch those um, as and when you want to um, and we'll be having more guests very very soon as i said before please do get the comments and questions coming in the chat and uh, also if you have any comments and questions for me for bright green for anything please do pop them in the chat as well and i will do my best to answer them um, i'm going to give a shout out to um to some of our main contributors thus far in the chat, Finn White and Ben Samuel, you've been brilliant, firing questions off left, right and centre. Please do keep them coming in. I can see one's just come in for Anthony. Um, I'll put that to him when he joins later on. We've also had some great comments uh, and questions on the hashtag Bright Green Live across various social media platforms. Please do keep tweeting on that, um, on that hashtag with your comments and questions. Uh, and please do share the stream. It means that more people will be able to watch it. Lots of people have found the stream from, from Twitter and from elsewhere. So please do share it. And we can get more people uh, hearing from our brilliant guests. Um, in the meantime, if you haven't already, hit that like button. It means that uh, we will... Uh, what will we do? <laughs> you can see that I'm getting tired. I'm four hours in. Uh, my, my brain is working a little slower than... Um, than it was previously. I'm on the fourth coffee. One per hour appears to be my approach today. Uh, what the like button will do is the like button will help us out massively on the YouTubes. It means that more people will see the stream uh, and it means that uh, more people will be able to watch the interviews, enjoy them and engage with them. Uh, also, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. We're now on 391 subscribers. We're nine away from that big 400. Uh, we have added nearly 20 today. So please do keep those subscriptions coming in. It means you won't miss out on everything that's coming up in the future including the next episode of Bright Green Live, so make sure you hit subscribe. So, for those of you who aren't aware of Bright Green, we are an online publication that focuses on coverage of the UK's Green parties, the Labour movement, social movements and the wider left. We provide news coverage, we provide a uh, space for comment pieces from key figures, uh, in those movements and we provide video contents just like this video content just like this we will be hosting bright green live as a monthly um, show on our youtube channel but we also host other interviews uh, and content on here as well um, the reality is that bright green uh, is slightly strapped for cash we don't have uh, the backing of billionaires and big business we rely solely on the kind and generous donations of people like you so if you are able to please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation so we can keep running interviews videos and so on just like this 
um, and uh, you can get the content and the interviews and the conversations that you really, really want to see. Um, so coming up later in the show, we have got uh, our main event, our headliner is Zach Polanski. Now, Zach's going to be primarily talking to us about the current uh, constitutional crisis we have in the UK, where, you know, we've had three prime ministers in three months, where we have had uh, Boris Johnson and his resignation on us, stuff in the House of Lords with more cronies, political advisers, and uh, we have the, the mess of our political system where uh, the prime minister can change between elections, the entire political programme of the government can change between elections and the public and the people don't get a single say in it. So that's going to be talking about what's going on with our current constitutional crisis, but also what a green uh, new con democratic settlement might look like and what we need to do to achieve it. He's going to be coming up at 10 past five. So you need to keep uh, stay here until then to hear from the wise words of Zach. But in the meantime, we have a, uh, a plethora of other brilliant guests including Anthony Slaughter, who's on very, very soon. Vic Slaudian is going to be talking about the problem in the education system and also why trade unions in the education system, including the NEU, the NASUWT and the NAHT are currently balloting for strike action. Uh, we have Chris Saltmarsh, from, who's a co-founder of Labour for a Green New Deal and also author of uh, this book here, uh, Burnt. Uh, fighting for climate justice, which is a brilliant read. I would really recommend it. He's going to be on later today talking about um, the Labour Party's current climate policies, where he wants the Labour Party's climate policies to go and how uh, people can pressure the Labour Party uh, both from within and without to adopt those policies. And finally, we have Guy Ingerson, who is a member of the Scottish Greens, who proposed the motion to Scottish Greens Conference to formally sever the ties between the Scottish Greens and the Green Party of England and Wales. He's gonna be talking to us about what that motion means, why he proposed it, and what he wants to see from the Green Party of England and Wales on trans rights. So an amazing, amazing lineup of people still to come. Uh, so please do stick around. Please do keep your comments coming in the chat and share the link as, um, as I've been asking you to do so all morning and afternoon, uh, it will really help us out massively. Um, so I'm actually going to go back to one of the questions that we uh, had in earlier. Um, let me just scroll through and find it. Uh, so Rich Turner Music, a lot earlier on, asked a two-part question, one about general elections and one about local elections. And the, the question you asked about local elections is what's the strategy for the May elections, which I assume refers to the 2023 local elections. Uh, and I'm assuming that he's referring to the Green Party of England and Wales uh, and its strategy um, in those local elections. Let me know if I'm wrong about that. Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at that question um, before I will put it to, to Zach Polanski later on in the show as well. Um, I think from my perspective, in terms of the Green Party strategy in the run up to those uh, important election 2023, I think the first thing that we really need to bear in mind is the point in the electoral cycle that these elections are coming is uh, that the seats that are up for election in 2023 are those that will last up in 2019. Now in 2019, for those of you who don't know, we, uh, or the Green Party rather, uh, achieved a record um, a record uh, success in the local elections, gained more seats than ever before. Uh, the number of councillors the Greens had doubled overnight. And we, we won, in, the Greens won in lots of places. Uh, naturally, the, the party was targeting, was intending and hoping to win, but also there were some uh, seats that the Greens won that were, uh, less obvious uh, that they were going to turn green. And what that means is that in 2023, the Greens are going to have a record number of defences. So there are going to be more seats that the Greens are going to be defending in a local election than in ever any other point in the party's history. So I think one thing to bear in mind with those elections is a little bit of expectation management. So the reality is that since 2019, uh, the Greens have gained uh, significant numbers of councillors at each election. So in 2019, gained nearly 200 seats. Uh, in, 2020, in 2020, the local elections were cancelled as a result of the COVID pandemic. In 2021, the Greens gained, I think, around 100. And in 2022, uh, the Green Party of England and Wales gained around 50 or 60 seats. Those are massive gains in historical terms for the Greens, which traditionally the party has gained, um, you know, even in its best years, uh, between sort of 5 and 15 
seats per election. In the last four years, that's changed dramatically. And in 2023, a lot of those seats are going to be defended. And that poses a real challenge for the party because uh, it's going to be defending over 200 council seats across the country. And so the space for making new gains, in addition to making sure that the party hangs on to its existing seats, um, is going to be very, very challenging. So what I would say um, f from, I guess, a, a question from the, 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 the initial question, which is about strategy, for, from my perspective, I think that it's going to be very challenging for the Greens to make massive gains at the next elections uh, because of all those defences. So I think strategically for 2023, what we should be able, what we should be looking to do and what we should be looking to manage in terms of expectations is that we should be looking at relatively modest gains whilst also holding the, uh, the, the, the seats that we already hold. Now, there are going to be some exceptions to that. There are going to be some places where actually the prospects of, us, of the Greens gaining lots and lots of seats is quite significant. And, you know, there's really interesting places around the country that have got elections next year, which could see significant gains. I mean, the most obvious one, the I guess the, the one that um, that takes all the limelight is Brian Hove. And the reason it takes the limelight at the moment is because, uh, you know, the Greens are in minority administration. It's the second minority administration uh, in, in Brian Hove. Um, it's also the only uh, city in the country still, uh, or again, council in the country rather, where the Greens are in sole administration, so they're not in administration with another party. Um, there is the real prospect of the Greens gaining seats in Brighton Hove and getting closer to winning a majority, which means more of the Greens programme can be implemented. That's really exciting. There are other places across the country too, where there is the prospect of gaining lots of seats, um, but there are also places where there's going to be a real hard fought battle to keep hold of the ones that the Greens have already got. Um, so I think it's going to be an interesting year. And I think like for, 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 for newer Green Party members who are used to <laughs> the kind of new, new way of operating where, you know, we uh, we win dozens and dozens of seats across the country each year. Uh, it might be a little bit of a shot to the system if that doesn't happen again. But I think putting it in its historical uh, context, putting it in its uh, the the point in the electoral cycle that we are, uh, making very small and modest gains net is probably a good position to be in for the Greens this year. Uh, in 2024 and 2025, I think that's when you're going to start looking at returning to the the um, the the, trip, the, 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 the triple figures or close to triple figure gains for the Greens in the local elections. Now, that, of course, like implies that politics is static. Now, what we've learned over the last few years is that you basically can't predict anything in politics uh, because everything is moving so quickly and fast. And there are lots of the, you know, the, 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 the tides of politics and the tides of history move in strange and mysterious ways. And things could well change before that. Um, you know, at the moment, uh, look, looking at national polls, the, the Greens have have, ha have suffered a bit of a dip over the last few months, but in, in the last, cu last couple of uh, days, you've seen a significant uptick, probably tied to the fact that you know, more people are thinking about the climate crisis as a result of COP27 going on and, and so on. If that is able to stick, if that poll rating continues in the run-up to the, the 2023 local elections, I think you could be looking at a more substantial set of uh, local election gains uh, in 2023. Uh, I'm not sure if that answered your question, Rich, um, but hopefully it did. And hopefully I've now answered both parts of those that question, and I'll put it also uh, to Zach Polanski at the end of the show, who I think will be best place to answer it. Um, so please do keep questions and comments coming in. Uh, our next guest, Anthony Slaughter, will be joining us very, very soon. Um, we've already got some questions coming in for him. That's brilliant. Please do get more in uh, and I'll put them to him. We're going to be talking about Welsh independence. Uh, we're going to be talking about a new body that's been set up between Plaid Cymru and the Wales Green Party to make the case for Welsh independence. And we might talk a little bit about uh, the, um, the state of the Wales Green Party, its electoral prospects and so on um, as we go. Um, please do hit the like button on the stream if you haven't already. I can see it's still ticking up, so please do hit it. It helps us with the algorithm, means more people will be watching. Um, and uh, and we will uh, continue with our guests' questions and interviews throughout the day. We're streaming until six. We've got, um, let me count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, no, six, we've got six people, uh, six guests still to come in the next four hours, uh, three and a half hours, however long it is. Um, so please do keep your questions, your comments coming in. Tweet on the hashtag Bright Green Live, um, and uh, we will put everything that you say or ask to our guests as much as we can. 
So it's like a very, very short break uh, and we're going to be back joined by Anthony Slaughter very, very soon. So stay on the stream. Keep those questions coming in. If you stick a few more in whilst I'm gone, I'll try and answer them when I get back. Uh, but if not, stick some in for Anthony and we will discuss them then. Thank you very much. I'll see you very, very soon.
Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. We are back on episode one of Bright Green Live. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for everyone who has been with us for the past four and a half hours now. Uh, let us know in the chat if you've been here since, since the beginning. I would love to see who has been uh, with us the whole time. Uh, up next, we have an interview with Anthony Slaughter. Anthony is the leader of the Wales Green Party. We're going to be talking about Welsh independence. And we also have lots of questions in the chat already for Anthony about uh, Welsh politics more broadly. So I'll put those to Anthony and um, please do keep your comments and questions coming so that uh, I can get more lined up for Anthony and the rest of our guests. We still have a stacked lineup still to come. We have half a dozen people uh, that are going to be joining us throughout the rest of the afternoon and into the early evening, um, including Zach Polanski, Chris Saltmarsh, Fix Laudian and others. Um, so get your questions and comments coming in for them. Tweet on the hashtag uh, Bright Green Live and uh, share the stream. More people will be able to see it if you share it. Uh, we've got some great questions in there for Anthony already about transphobia in the Green Party, about uh, PR in the Welsh local elections. Uh, we've got some questions about the new Senate voting system and how many seats the Welsh Greens might win at the next uh, elections to the Welsh Parliament. I'll put all those to Anthony and uh, more. So please do get your comments and questions coming in. Uh, so we, the latest update, the big, the big thing you've all been waiting for. Uh, I think nobody but me is waiting for it. Is that we are now on three hundred and ninety-three subscribers. That means we are seven, just seven away from that 400 landmark that I've been talking about throughout the day. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and we can hit 400 by the time we go off air. That helps Bright Green out massively. It means more people will see um, the videos that we put out. It will appear in more people's feeds. It will feed the algorithm. But crucially, it means that you won't miss out on the uh, other uh, videos that we're putting out in the coming weeks and months, including the next episode of Bright Green Live, which will be happening on December the 11th. We have one guest currently confirmed for that and others in the works. That guest is Rhea Patel, who is a Green Party councillor in Croydon. And they're also the Green Party's Equality and Diversity spokesperson. Um, let us know in the chat who you'd like to see us book for the next episode too, taking requests, demands uh, and desires. Please do let us know who you'd like to see booked for the next episode and we'll see what we can do. That's December the 11th. We'll be back on YouTube, so hopefully this time with a working live stream link that we don't have to then resend to all of our uh, uh, email list and on the socials. Um, apologies for those who were there this morning for that. So very, very shortly in five minutes time, Anthony Slaughter will be joining us uh, to talk about a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, if you haven't already liked uh, and followed Bright Green on the socials, we are on the Twitters at Bright G R N. We are on the Facebooks at Bright G R N. We are on the Instagrams at Bright Green Online, and we are on the new shiny toy, the Mastodons, at Bright Green on the UK server. Is that enough to to find us? I don't know. Someone tell me in the chat how Mastodons works and uh, if that's sufficient information um to find us but if you find the hashtag bright green live you should be able to see the the posts uh from us there and follow us on that uh so the other thing to, to let you know about is i'm sure you're aware bright green does not have the backing of billionaires and big business you can see that this stream is coming from my living room not from some fancy studio uh we very much rely on the kind of generous donations of people just like you so if you are able to please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation. We ask people to send us about five pound a month. It helps to keep everything running and it means that we can grow and expand and reach more people. So the kinds of politics that you want to see, we can reach more people and influence uh, the conversation in the UK and further afield. We can do that with your help. So whilst you're waiting for Anthony to join us, bright-green.org forward slash donate. In fact, I think I can get a link in the chat so that you can click straight away um, and um, you can set up a regular donation, which means that we can continue with what we're doing. I'm going to stick that link right in the chat right now. You can all hear my typing. That's great for the listeners and viewers. Um, but there you go. You can donate at that link, set up a regular donation if you can, or give us a one-off, whatever you can afford. It will make uh, a world of difference to everything that we are doing. 
So this morning we heard from Matthew Hull from the Green Party Trade Union Group about the role of uh, Greens supporting trade unions, but also uh, what the current wave of industrial action means for the Labour movement. We heard from Anna Arpaheim talking about the Labour Party's policies on migration. Jean Lambert talking about her uh, departed colleague Keith Taylor, uh, who she worked for with for nine years in the European Parliament. Uh, and others, those interviews, uh, you can scroll back through the stream and watch. Um, I'd love to hear what you thought about them in the chat, uh, what you learnt, uh, what you found interesting, what you agree with, what you disagree with, and so on, and keep the conversation going there. Uh, I'm seeing still some questions coming through. Please do keep them coming through for Anthony, and the sooner you get them in, the more likely it is that I will be able to read them out, tweet them on the hashtag Bright Green Live, and pop them in the chat. Brilliant. So we currently have 10 people watching. Uh, we've peaked at 18 today, which, I'm, I'm, you know, is, is all right, but I think we can do better. And the way that we can do better is by you sharing the stream. So if you are able to share it on your social, share it on Facebook, Twitter, everything that you have access to, WhatsApp it to your mom, uh, share it to your brother, whatever you want to do, but get this stream out there and get more people watching. Uh, I can see that Anthony has just joined the call, so I'm going to bring Anthony in without further Ado. So for those of you who don't know, Anthony Slaughter is the leader of the Wales Green Party. And we're going to be talking about a few things today with Anthony, uh, the first of which is the Future Cymru Forum. So the Future Cymru Forum is a new body that's been set up jointly between the Wales Green Party and Plaid Cymru. And it is a body that is designed to make the case for Wales independence and that's going to be the focus of our conversation but I know that we've got other chat com uh, questions and comments in the chat so we'll pick some of those up too but Anthony has now joined us so I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Anthony Slaughter today. Anthony how are you doing? I'm good thanks Chris I'm good thanks thanks for this and um, congratulations it's looked like a really interesting day when I've been dropping in and out. Well, I'm glad that you've been able to catch some of it. Um, thank you for that. And thank you for joining us right now. Um, so as I said in the intro, one of the things we wanted to talk about was the Future Cymru Forum. Uh, so I wondered if you could just let our viewers know why that body has been set up. Okay, well, what we're planning, what we're proposing to set up ourselves, Wales Green Party and Plaid Cymru, is this organisation, this body, Future Cymru Forum. The idea being it will work kind of along the lines of Commonweal in Scotland. It will commission work from academics, economists, community groups, trade unionists, to start to make the case for what an independent Wales could look like, taking the two visions the parties have, and we do have different visions of an independent Wales, but taking our radical vision, especially from our side, and almost stress testing it, getting experts and outside people to look at it and make the case you know, for the future economy of Wales, the future environmental policy, social policy of Wales, to really explore what a future independent Wales could look like. Because it's one thing, you know, there's that saying that we, we campaign in sound bites, but we have to govern. That's a bit of an ambitious word. We have to govern in policy. And so this is, it's what, all very well telling people, and we are the two, lead, two leading pro-independence parties in Wales. And it's all very well telling people we support independent Wales. People quite like what independent Wales would look like. And Wales Green Party, we've been doing a lot of work on that already. And we have some very, very clear ideas. And what's also going on in the background in Wales at the moment is the Welsh Government has set up the Constitutional Commission to look at the constitutional future of the United Kingdom and Wales's place in it. And it's invited as a political party. We obviously submitted to that and have done interviews with them as applied and other groups. So there is an ongoing conversation going on in Wales about what do we want the future of Wales to look like. And for some people, that is better devolution, increased, improved devolution. Others, it's independence. And so this is a way of just examining those issues in detail. And because the other thing that comes up quite often when I talk to pro indie people in Wales, you know, if, in, if an independent Wales is just going to mean we move control from Westminster to Cardiff Bay, but it's business as usual, then there's no point. You know? Independence, as we're seeing in Scotland, the argument of Scotland is a chance to make the case for a new way of doing things, a new radical democracy, a new radical economy. And that's what we hope to explore with this forum. I do need to clarify that at the moment we're in the setting up stage because basically the leadership, myself and Adam, and heads of policy discussed this recently and agreed that this is something we want to explore. What we do next is a working group with members from both parties. We'll draw up the terms of reference, a memorandum of understanding, a timescale. We're envisaging a two-year program of these, things, these papers and events. And that obviously has to go back to both parties' executives before it can be formally launched. 
because you know, both parties have to agree. So in principle, if parties have agreed, this is a good idea, we want to look into this. I'm, I'm really excited by it, I'm very confident that it will take off and I think it will start some really good and timely discussions in Wales. And for me as well, what's exciting about it is it puts Wales Green Party at the heart and centre of the discussion about the future of Wales, future Wales. It puts us at the big table. These, these conversations wouldn't have included us five years ago. So it's going to raise our profile. It's going to give so much publicity to our radical policies. It's also going to highlight just, I'm already finding in sort of initial discussions about what sort of economic discussions you want to have. It's already highlighting that the Green Party's policies are so way out there, far more advanced than radical than other parties. So it's exciting. I mean, it mirrors a lot of what's going on in Scotland with the Scottish government, the SNP and Greens, putting out their papers on what an independent Scotland would look like. But also at the same time, which I'm quite impressed by and want to emulate, is the Scottish Greens are also doing their own set of papers and what a Scottish Green government would do if they weren't working with someone else. And I think it's it's the future of politics. It's how politics is done in Europe. Now, this wouldn't raise any eyebrows in Europe, this sort of work. What this is trying to do is to do that important work before an election rather than after an election, trying to figure out what it was that you meant by independent Wales. So you mentioned Scotland there. And one of the things that, I mean, viewers won't, listeners won't be surprised to hear me say this, but one of the things that's quite clear is that the, the levels of support for Welsh independence are much lower than they are for Scottish independence. So if you look at opinion polls, um, you know, in Scotland, you're still seeing opinion polls suggesting roughly somewhere around 50% of the population support independence, 50%. Are opposed in Wales that that support figure is much much lower. So why do you think it is that uh, support for Welsh independence is 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 weaker than it is in Scot than Scottish independence is in Scotland? It is. It is I think the go back historical sorts of reasons how the United Kingdom formed, how Wales was assimilated, whereas Scotland chose to join. So there has historically been a stronger pro independence movement in Scotland. The SNP have arguably been more successful politically than Plaid Cymru, who up until recently were the only pro-independence party in Wales, the leading pro-independence party. But it is catching, and the other, there are other issues, differences of geography. I mean, there's a case, I don't have the figure to hand now, but a very high percentage of people in Wales live within 25 miles of the border. Lots of people cross that border daily for work in both directions. So there is a closer interrelation in some ways between England and Wales and the between England and Scotland. But it is definitely shifting. And just looking at that before I came on, recent polls for Welsh support in Welsh independence are around 30% now. And that goes up to 40% if you just narrow it down to 16 to 24 year olds. Now, 30% support for independence is where Scotland was in 2012. And that went up dramatically in the independence referendum two years later. So I think once this becomes a more tangible, once you start talking about a referendum and it becomes possible, and we see something happening in Scotland, interest will go up. But also, I think what's driven it, and it's definitely what's driven Wales Green Party towards these policies of pro-independence, is the absolute failure of Westminster government. And what we're seeing, you know, devol we're seeing a pushback against devolution. We're seeing a Westminster power grab. Westminster is trying to take back powers. The internal markets bill sort of cripples Welsh government's ability to do lots of the things that it would like to do. The Shared Prosperity Fund takes that money that we used to get from Europe and puts it in the hands of the Westminster Tory government as to where it gets spent in Wales. So there's a growing realisation that Westminster isn't working, not just for Wales, it's not working for England, it's not working for Scotland, it's not working for Northern Ireland. And that is only feeding the interest in, and that's why I think these discussions are so important, because for some people, Mark Drayton, for instance, wants Devo Max. He doesn't believe in independence, but he does want them. He is hampered by, oh, this had to happen, my battery is going to go low, so you can have to excuse me for a minute. Whilst we're waiting for Anthony to solve the battery issues, um, please do pop your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, we've had some great ones coming in already, so we'll come to those uh, in a moment. Anthony is now back. Uh, do you want to continue your thread? Or, oh, Anthony's now gone again. Um, so when Anthony's back for good, um, I will pick that up with him. But in the meantime, pop your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, I'll admire the flag uh, behind Anthony's background. Anthony, uh, do you want to pick up the thread where you left off there? Sorry. It's, oh, I don't understand this. It's not. Apologies for this. No worries. Uh, I had major technical issues this morning as well. Uh, so inevitably, uh, they've been contagious. Um, 
but uh, hopefully we will be We're there back. very, very soon. We're there. Brilliant. Um, Apologies, my pick up the phone with left off there. Apologies for my sheer professionalism there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was making the case um, that because of the Westminster power grab and people feeling increasingly disempowered in Wales and knowing that things could be done different, looking at other small independent countries. And I think also what played a part was the pandemic. We had, for the first time, people realised that the Welsh government could do things differently. And I think it was a shock to the United Kingdom government as well, that Wales and Scotland could do their own thing. I wouldn't argue that Welsh government necessarily handled the pandemic well. There's a lot of things went wrong. And Wales Green Party fully supports the calls for an independent Welsh-led inquiry into COVID. But it did underline that Wales could do things differently. So I think there's a strong yearning. And it's also, there's a lot more interest among younger people coming forward, younger people in a more progressive society. And the reality is, especially when you watch Keir Starmer lately, you can't see that being delivered from Westminster under either Conservatives or Labour. So that's why I think I'm confident we will see an increase in support for independence. So I'm going to put a couple more questions to you from me before I go to some of the ones in the chat. And just to pre-warn you, the ones in the chat are mostly about the Wales Greens rather than the yeah. Future Coming Forum in the case of independence. But um, on the latter, uh, what's the green vision for an independent Wales? It's a very long paper, which I'm happy to share. But yeah, it's, our vision is, you know, when people ask me what's independence got to do with the Green Party, it's... We're a party that believes in subsidiarity. We're a party that believes in devolving power to the lowest possible level. So why wouldn't we be in favour of independence? We would take it further because for someone living in North Wales, Cardiff Bay is as remote as Westminster. And we want power devolved to the absolutely lowest possible level. So our vision is a radical democratic, radical new democracy in Wales. And a Wales, a small, confident, open, inclusive and cosmopolitan nation working together with other small nations what you see some of the crises we face is the small nations are more agile, they can respond better. And working together, we already have signed up, Wales is a member of the Wellbeing Economy Government Alliance. At the moment that still works, but it does highlight the things that could be done. So that's our, our vision is an independent, sustainable, with a radical new energy policy, radical new economy, working together with other small countries and showing, showing just what society could be like. So my final question to you before I go to the chat is um, obviously the, the the proposals to form Future Cymru Forum uh, are seeing collaboration between the Wales Greens and Plaid Cymru, and we've seen this is this is part of a wider, I guess, uh, program of collaboration between the two parties. So uh, in uh, the local elections just gone uh, in Cardiff, you had the uh, electoral agreement between Plaid and the Wales Greens. Um, do you think that working so closely with Plaid is going to make it more difficult to differentiate in future elections? Um, actually, I don't. That's a short answer. I think um, the Cardiff one was very local. It was an agreement between Cardiff Green Party and Plaid in Cardiff, and it was very much focused on Cardiff issues. And that's been and gone. We've got people elected. We got a 17% vote share across Cardiff, which was two more than the Lib Dems and only slightly behind the Conservatives. So I think that was a valuable exercise. Future, future Cymru Forum, as I said, it is two of the absolute red lines. It is not an electoral pact. It's not an electoral deal of any sort. And we won't be issuing joint policy statements. There will be discussion papers. I can take the point that some people have that concern. But what I think, and the point we'll make quite clearly, is it's part of our strategy going forward is to stand in every election at national level between now and the Senate election and the next council election. We will be standing against Plaid Cymru in those elections as different political parties, just as the Scottish Greens stand against the SNP. So what it will do, I think, electorally, as I said earlier, it's put us at the top table. You know, we're being seen, we'll get invisibility as a party with no Senate members, with no national election representation member, we will be seen as one of those parties. And I'm seeing that a lot lately. I'm getting invited to speak to people and meet with organisations. I met recently with the General Secretary of TUC Cymru. These sort of discussions only normally happen in election time when they have to talk to everyone. But people are reaching out to talk to us now because they can see Greens in the Senate and they can see that we're going to have some say in the future. So while some people might worry that it's blurring the lines, I think it's actually going to highlight differences. 
Ne? Our, going back to our vision of independent worlds, our vision of independent worlds is unambiguously nuclear free. That is going to be a stress test for some members in five, five official policies of anti nuclear, but they do have members in the North who contradict that policy. So it's actually going to highlight, it's going to highlight our vision, it's going to highlight our strengths, it's going to highlight where we're working together. And this is very important as well. This was my experience in the Cardiff election. Members of the public outside the political bubble really appreciated, really liked the idea of parties trying to work things out together. So on this level, actually looking at what the future of Wales could be, because we've had 20 odd years of devolution and we've got the highest rates of child poverty in the UK, one in three children, 60% of the Welsh population are probably going to have severe fuel poverty problems in the coming winter. So while devolution has delivered some good, obviously we do need a major rethink. So I'm going off your question on elections here, but no, I, I don't think it's going to have any negative electoral impact. If anything, I think it will have a positive impact on our electoral results. So we're going to go to the chat now. We've had some great questions come in and they link really nicely to that last point around uh, the electoral prospects of the Wales Green Party. Um, so some of our viewers might not be aware, but there has been proposed changes to the voting system for the Senate. Uh, and one of our viewers, uh, Philip Davis, has asked, um, under the new voting system for the Senate, how many seats do you think that the Greens could realistically win uh, in 2026 in the next elections to the Welsh Parliament? Okay, under the new reforms, not only have they reformed the voting system, they've increased the size of the Senate to 190 members. Um, the voting reform is much, much more proportional. It's not full STV, which we would have wanted, which I would have wanted, which Mark Drakeford would want. It's as much as they thought they could get past the Welsh Labour Party, Welsh Labour government. And it is, does discriminate against smaller parties. It's a closed list system. Um, smaller, smaller areas for the list than we've had in in the past. When the, when the reforms were announced, Jane Dodds, the leader of Welsh Dems, called me up and said, we need to make a joint statement about how unfair this is. After speaking to several people in comms and elections in the wider party, we realised that is not a good look. We, we've been going on and on for years and we want PR. And all the public would see is, oh, no, that's not the PR we want. So it's not ideal for us, but it does work for us. In the joint constituencies, because there's um, lessening the numbers of constituencies in Wales down to 38. Was it 32? Sorry, 32, sorry. And for the Senate election to get this through, they're going to double up constituencies and have a closed list electing six people per constituency in that list. Now, I quite often get asked, because the system in Scotland is very similar, is the same as what we've been using in Wales up until now. And people will often say, how come they've done it in Scotland and you can't do it in Wales? The one difference between Scotland and Wales is on their regional list, the De Hunt system, they would elect seven members of the Scottish Parliament. In Wales, each region elected four. If we were electing seven, I would be a Senate member. We came seven from South Wales Central last time. And looking at the new system, doing the numbers, it's a shift of 2.8, 2.7%, a shift of less than 3% in Cardiff would get Senate member. So I, I am very confident that we will get representation at the Senate. To be absolutely blunt, though, we will have to target. You know, we know all about targeting. We know tar targeting works. We are going to have to be realistic. And this is, I've had this discussion with the Scottish Greens, and the important thing, as we all know, is getting that first one or two, possibly two might be possible, getting one or two across the line. Not only will that mean many more the next time there's a Senate election, we have the local authority elections the following year after that Senate election. And building on the breakthrough this year, which was, which was fantastic to see, the hard work that's going to go on in the next five years for those local authority elections to then be boosted by getting seats at the Senate will result in fantastic results for Greens across Wales in the following year. So we have another question uh, this time around local elections. And some of our viewers in England may or may not be aware that uh, there's been changes uh, for the local elections in Wales as well, with uh, local councils being able to use proportional representation for their elections. At the moment, they are run under first past the post, as they are in, in England. Um, so Sean Thomas has asked, um, how will Wales Green Party campaign to get as many councils as possible to adopt proportional representation in time for the 2027 local elections? It's... Um... A bit of a depressing one, this is, because the Welsh Government brought it in as part of their electoral reform, along with Vote 16 and the new Senate system, but they've passed the buck onto the local authorities. They've said local authority elections 
can be run under STV if the council chooses to, rather than the Welsh government just changing the law so that council councils were elected on STV across Wales. So obviously, Turkeys don't vote for Christmas. Most councils, most local authorities are one part of states in Wales. There's been very, very little movement, and it's also for a local authority to adopt STV for the next council elections. It needs a two-third majority of the council, and it has to be decided before next November. So there's been very, very little movement on it. I know that the Lib Dems put a motion to Cardiff Council calling for it, which was just roundly rejected. It's something that talking to our councils about, it's a, it's a point to make in the council chamber, calling for this and other parties like the Dems and Plaid would support you on this. We will work with Make Votes Matter as well to push for this, but to be honest, I don't see any of the councils, it's something we will highlight and we'll highlight their failure to do it, but realistically, I don't see any one of the local authorities switching to STD before the next elections. And finally, on a completely different topic, um, I've got a question from Finn White, and uh, it's perhaps timely given the pride flag that uh, you've got behind you with the Wales Green Party logo on it. Um, so Finn asks, what are your thoughts on tran transphobia within the Green Party and how you think we can solve it? We well, are yeah, just on, on the flag. We had the Climate Coalition Cymru rally in Cardiff yesterday, and we had this as well as our other banners out. And we're packing up at the end and some we can take it home and one member said, well, why don't you have it up tomorrow? So why wouldn't I? So I hope that helps show our attitude in Wales Green Party. Uh, just to be absolutely clear on this, there is no place for transphobia in the party. There's no place, no place for anti-Semitism, no place for Islamophobia. It's like Islamophobia Awareness Month, as we know this month. There's no place for it. It's got to, you know, we have, I have members who ask me that how can, how can, how do, why do we tolerate spokespeople speaking openly against policy. Fortunately, that's, you know, people have been removed from spokesperson positions. I think a lot of work has been done behind the scenes. Things are getting better. I can understand some people's frustrations that things aren't moving fast enough. But personally, it's, there is no place for it in the party and it just should not be tolerated. Thanks so much for joining us today, Anthony. It's always a pleasure to have you on Bright Green, writing for Bright Green, joining our shows, YouTube channel, everything. So thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for joining us. A pleasure. Thank you. Deal. So that was Anthony Slaughter, the leader of the Wales Green Party. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, let's get some comments and responses to that interview in the chat on the YouTubes and on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Uh, Finn says, thank you, Anthony. Agreed. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, please do get more comments coming in. Uh, we still have five brilliant guests to come uh, to follow up on that. Uh, but I want to hear what you thought about Anthony before you get your questions in for our next speakers. Uh, I found that incredibly insightful and interesting to learn about the, uh, the campaign for Welsh independence, the Welsh Green Party's role in it, and also Anthony's thoughts on the future electoral prospects of the Green Party and the future of democracy in Wales. I'd love to hear your thoughts too. Um, just have a look on the hashtag, see if we've got any other comments coming in. Um, so, yep, yeah, so Rich Turner says, uh, the mighty Vic Slothian will be on for an interview about education cuts and industrial action soon on Bright Green Live, so please tune in. Absolutely, thank you, Rich. Uh, please do tune in and keep watching the stream. Uh, ben Samuel says that uh, Anthony Slaughter was much better than the previous leader of the Wales Green Party. I cannot remember who that was, uh, so I will make no comment, but thank you for that, Ben. Up next on Bright Green Live, we have Vix Lavian, who, for those of you who don't know, she is the Green Party of England and Wales education spokesperson. She's going to be talking about the problems currently facing our education system, specifically our schools. She'll also be talking about why uh, trade unions uh, in the education sector are currently balloting for strike action, the NEU, the NASUWT and the NAHT, the National Association of Head Teachers. Uh, so that's going to be kicking off in about five ten minutes time so please stay tuned for that in the meantime give us your questions and comments for vix we'd love to put your questions to vix uh, and so you can get them answered any questions that go in the chat i'll try and read out as many of them as possible and also those that are posted on hashtag bright green live uh in the meantime hit that like button it will help uh, more people see the stream so hammer it right 
now and the ongoing update of the number of bright green subscribers is 394 so we are now just six away from hitting that golden 400 number that means that we've added one in the last interview that means we've got six to go before 6 p.m today so make sure if you haven't already you hit subscribe it'll help bright green out massively and of course of course of course it means that you won't miss any of the upcoming interviews uh, that we have uh, any of the videos that we're putting out in the coming weeks and months and crucially the next episode of bright green live which will will be on December the 11th. Uh, so hit that subscribe button and you won't miss out. Still to come later on, we've got Chris Saltmarsh, co-founder of Labour for a Green New Deal, talking about the Labour Party's climate policies. We have Benali Hamdash, the Green Party of England Wales migration spokesperson, talking about the government's migration policies, how we resist them and what the Greens' response should be. We have Guy Ingerson from the Scottish Greens talking about the motion that was passed by the Scottish Green Party to sever ties with the Green Party of England Wales over transphobia. And finally, our headline main event is Zach Polanski on at 10 past five, talking about the constitutional crisis currently facing Britain. I hope you've enjoyed the show so far. We've had an amazing lineup of interviews. Please do get your questions in the chat for our next guest, Vix Laudian, who'll be joining us very, 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 very shortly. And also, if you want, please pop questions and comments on the hashtag Bright Green Live. You can get them on the Twitters, the Mastodons. I don't have a means of accessing them on the Facebooks or the Instagrams today. But if you do wish to to post on the hashtag there, that would be much appreciated. Uh, so Vix will be joining us very shortly. In the meantime, just a reminder, you can follow Bright Green on all of the socials on the Facebooks at uh, facebook.com forward slash bright grn, on the Twitters at twitter.com forward slash bright grn, on the Instagrams at uh, bright green online, and on the new shiny toy of the Mastodons at Bright... I mean, I don't even know how you get there. Bright Green on the UK server, maybe. Who knows? You'll find us if you search for us. Maybe, I hope. Um, we've got 12 people watching. That's brilliant. If you want more people to see this uh, stream because you've enjoyed the interviews we've done so far and looking forward to the ones coming up, please do share it on the socials with the hashtag Bright Green Live and more people will... Uh, be able to experience it. So Vix has just uh, entered the the room. Uh, I'll bring her in very shortly, but uh, please do get your questions and comments in for Vix ASAP. The earlier we get them in, the more likely we are to read them out. So, um, so yeah, pop them in the chat, pop them on the hashtag Bright Green Live, and we'll ask as many of them as possible. So I'm going to bring uh, Vix in now. Oh, Vic should be arriving any time now. So our next guest is Vix Lavin, and Vix, who is connected to the call now, is the Green Party of England and Wales uh, education spokesperson. She's also the policy coordinator on the Green Party of England and Wales executive, and you may know her as a multi-time candidate for the Isle of Wight parliamentary yes. constituency. Uh, welcome, Vix. Hi, this is brilliant. Well done. Well done. Um, I'm managing all of these hours so far. I'm really looking forward to the ones to come. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that. And uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the current uh, issues facing the education system, particularly schools. Um, and uh, yeah, what, what what's going on there? And I guess in recent months, the education system hasn't been particularly high on the news agenda. You know, we've got a really busy news cycle at the moment with the government yeah. collapsing over and over again, with the war in Ukraine, with everything else. And education has, has, has somewhat fallen off the agenda uh, in a way that it was, you know, very, very high, you know, a year ago with the COVID pandemic, with the uh, exam scandal, with uh, everything else. Um, but a lot of the systemic problems in schools are very much still there. Um, so what do you think are the biggest issues facing the school system right now? Yeah, I mean, you've, you've put there something which is central to this, which is, I would argue, education has not been high in the agenda of this government for a decade. And all of the things that we're seeing, um, the pandemic has emphasised a lot of the uh, lack of investment, the lack of attention, the lack of a priority. Uh, so... We don't have any stability in the Department for Education. Um, we've had, what, 10 um, education ministers in the last 
12 years. We've had four in the last five months. Uh, I mean, if you were running a business like this, it'd be a completely failed business. I'm just going to emphasize here for the rest of the whole program, bearing in mind what we just had from Anthony Slaughter, I'm mainly going to talk about England and education and really emphasize that um, education in Wales is um, not run in the same way here. So I just want to emphasise that before I get into any trouble about talking about as if I'm talking about Wales as well. Um, so I think instability and a lack of priority from this government when we've seen the education ministers come and go. And this has resulted in people taking their eye off the ball when it comes to um, funding. And I don't just mean funding for teachers or funding for schools. There's a whole combination of a, of a lack of investment in education at all or, or paying any attention to, to funding. So there's suddenly a, another resurgence of the school cuts campaign, and that um, was relaunched, I think, last week. And we're talking about there is a billion, a billion amount of pounds of school cuts to 90% of schools in England are losing money. Uh, in terms of, of income and they're having they're expected to be able to fund extra wages extra courses and to recover from the pandemic so school funding is a major issue and that links into the pandemic so after the pandemic with schools and young people were promised extra support extra funding to catch up so certainly to be able to have some more one-to-one -one or targeted support, particularly for students in um, less advantaged areas or who hadn't had computers and are much more disadvantaged because of that during the pandemic. And that um, has not reached down to the people who, who need it. Um, at lunchtime, I was having a chat with a, a young person, a young Green, who is a teaching assistant, but has a lot of responsibility in their school. And they were saying that um, the schools are going to have to patch up this. Um, I think every six weeks, they're going to focus on a particular child, then another six weeks, another six weeks, just so they can catch up with their age-related learning. So lack of focus, um, lack of funding, um, lack of um, being able to combat the issues of the pandemic. I mean, it's all reactive. It's all reactive because there hasn't been any forward thinking or leadership from a government point of view. So I think it's systemic with the fact that this government really don't care about state education. So you talked about a lot of things there. I want to pick up a couple of them uh, before we talk about the industrial disputes. Um, and I guess you talked there about uh, funding as being a, a crucial a crucial element of this and the, the kind of wave of cuts we've seen since uh, 2010 and the austerity years. Um, but one of the planks of uh, the government's education reforms that came in during the coalition under David Cameron was academisation and the privatisation yeah. of parts of our education system through free schools. What role do you think uh, those have played in the uh, undermining of state education? Yeah, I mean, it's a fragmenting of the education system, which has been the, the lasting legacy, I think, with this government. I mean, this government are on their way out. I cannot see how this government... Um, could barely survive another two months, never mind another two years. Um, certainly, the whichever government comes after this, whether it's a Conservative or a Labour government, have got a hugely fragmented system. And by that, I mean, you have academies, you have free schools, you have studio schools, you have uh, federations, you have some state um, local authority run schools. And this actually, um, and and the Department of Education is realising this, they don't have control over this fragmented system. So when it comes to the pandemic, for instance, and when the unions and parents stood together in January 2021 and said, we cannot reopen these schools safely, the whole um, lack of structure within the education system meant that um, it actually had empowered uh, teachers and um and local local areas in in that regard but it certainly doesn't empower the government um the fragmentation is meant to be to divide and rule and mean that um certain local areas have got much less control in their local councils um, it also means that there is confusion for parents over um, who's responsible for the education, especially special education needs education, because that still comes underneath the local authority. And yet it's having to be dealt with in a fragmented system. 
unfortunately, um, the Labour Party and um, and the Labour Shadow Secretary of State for Education and the whole team are not talking about addressing this issue at all. They're only interested in education in terms of the classroom, not in terms of structures. But it's the structural um, deficit that we've seen in the last 10 years, which is meaning that um, reform and progression and um, making changes is much more difficult to, to do um, in a top down way. So I really push the Labour Party to look again at the way in which we have private companies, hugely inflated salaries involved in our education because um, we're still as a taxpayer paying for this education, but it's not going towards what we would consider and what parents consider a, a local authority council driven approach. Um, so one of the big issues taking place in the education system right now is that we have three major unions in the education in the school se sector the neu the nasuwt and the naht uh in the process of balloting for uh strike action uh what are the key issues underlying that dispute well i mean when we go to strike action as teachers um there's lots of things we would like to strike over in terms of uh, curriculum and fragmentation educational system but one of the only things that people can legally strike over are pay and conditions and um, so paying conditions is really driving this and you've you've mentioned the um the neu or what some people think of as the nut the old national union of teachers but the national education union is looking at the whole of the education sector including support staff including sixth form teachers including all educators but it's not just that union, it is the NASUWT and the National Association of Head Teachers who are balloting for strike action. All of these ballots due in by the beginning of January. Um, and when you read the um, National Association of Head Teachers, they are having meetings for their members with their senior union leaders all over the country. I think I saw Southampton, which is the closest to me in the Isle of Wight, Newcastle, all over are hosting meetings in, in November, December, looking at this. Because it's 10 years again of a lack of um, rise in education, educators' wages. And the NASUWT have um, calculated that that's costing your average classroom teacher £50,000 of a failure to keep up with inflation. They would have been given as wages and earned an extra £50,000 and that's been taken from them. So this has radicalised even those middle of the road teaching unions like the NASUWT um, on that. And the third thing is that the rises that the government in the Strategic Review Pay Board have put forward, the wage rises of um, 5%, which doesn't keep in line with inflation, and teachers are affected by the cost of living, certainly all educators are, and certainly supply staff are leaving being supply staff, and uh, support staff are leaving being support staff, because the wages which they're being offered are not going to be able to um, let them afford the rising cost of living. But all of that um, is, again, down to 10 years of a failure to invest, 10 years to keep up with those pay rises, um, pensions as well. But all of this money um, is being expected to be taken out of school budgets. So when teachers are being awarded pay rises by the government, that money is not fully funded. So the NES, UWT and the National Education Union and the NAHT are all campaigning for fully funded pay rises. Because as a teacher, I don't want any pay rise that I deserve to be taken out of the budget for my school. I'm already paying, I'm already printing, um, printing work for worksheets and stuff in my own house, in my own time. I'm already um, using my own money to be able to supplement stuff that our school can't provide. So certainly I do not want any wage rise to come out of the school budget because that is a complete lack of long term foresight vision on what we need to do to invest in our in our kids. 
So your last point there leads me really nicely onto one of the questions that's come through in the chat, uh, which I'm going to move on to a question from the chat now. Uh, if you haven't already, please do stick your questions in the chat uh, for Vix and we'll try and read out as many of them as possible. Uh, so Rich Turner has asked, uh, and it relates to that last point around uh, the demand for a pay rise. Uh, so Rich Turner asks, what are the prospects for a sustained campaign on teachers' pay, given that both the government and Labour are blanking on the whole issue of public sector pay more broadly? Yeah, and this is why the unions, particularly in education, come into their into their their own element. Um, the unions again showed in in January twenty twenty one. The the unions got together, especially the NEU, and tried to protect, which is their job, to protect their members and the safety of their members during the COVID crisis. And whilst the government and the Labour Party are failing to speak out about the cost of living crisis when it comes to education, it's the unions who are, and I don't just mean. Um, you know, militant unions, people that would normally strike. The NASVWT have not balloted for strike action for their members since 2011. So the last time they did this was very, very early days of the coalition government. Um, so the being a union member is the only way at the moment in the way in which Westminster government um, and Westminster is made up of MPs from the Labour Party and the Conservative Party is the unions are going to show that um, they will not um, stand for or accept this. And I'm sure that parents um, will understand that um, in the same way that they are, are needing rise of the cost of living for their wages, that teachers also need that. So um, it's a really strong case for, for being a member of the union, and um, certainly in the education sector. I'm going to move on to a very different topic now, but still within the education sphere, because I've got another great uh, set of questions in the chat, if that's OK. Uh, so Philip Davis has asked, uh, what do you think the Green Party should be doing to promote the teaching of politics within schools? Oh, fantastic. I mean, we teach A-level politics where I am, but the A-level politics curriculum is not what I would consider political literacy. And I think it's political literacy, which um, young people um, need to be much more aware of as, as, as citizens of the future. And I don't just mean at secondary schools, there's certainly opportunities for political literacy um, at primary schools as well. And by that, I mean, not just about what we get on the on the television when it comes to general elections, but local government, local politics, campaigning. Uh, I heard the political thinking interview with Carla Denyer yesterday with um, Nick Robinson on, on Radio 4. And in that, she was um, being asked about her um, routine to being a um, active campaigning citizen and a political leader. And she talked about being at school and campaigning on issues which we wouldn't consider to be party political. She's talking about, um, you know, fair trade, food in their canteen. And to be able to empower young people with the um, knowledge of how to campaign, how to be a um, an assertive citizen, this stuff is taught in the private sector. This stuff is taught in private schools about how to be articulate, how to to be able to argue that point politely. And that's what I would consider to be political literacy, to be an active citizen, um, rather than just um, you know, a, a dry um, academic curriculum. So we used to have those citizenship lessons. We used to have citizenship being a, a central point. Um, we now see schools talking about um, social, moral, spiritual, cultural education. But I think political with a small p should really be added onto that um, as a citizen, because uh, we we start to see bigger problems um, further down the line when young adults um, don't have that political literacy. They just step away from politic engagement altogether. So I, I know the young Greens have done brilliant work in um, doing political literacy uh, sessions. Um, and I think that all young people deserve to have that stuff at school rather than just our wonderful political party and the young Greens. Yeah, thank you. So uh, what looks like it might be our final question uh, is from Meg S. Foster. Uh, Meg asks, uh, what education policies from the Green Party's global sister parties would you love to see implemented in the UK? Oh, wow. Global sister policies, parties in terms of 
um, Scotland, Wales, or all, all over? Yeah, um, that's a really difficult question, Meg. Thanks, because uh, I need to be aware of all the policies from all the uh, global parties. I mean, when it comes to education, it is really important to look at internationally. I know we um, quite often refer to, to Finland. I know that the NEU general secretaries have been over to Cuba. There is so much stuff that we can learn internationally. Um, I think one thing that sticks out for me would be starting age for education. Um, our starting age for education is about four years and um, the emphasis on on nursery education, teaching formal reading and formal lessons is far too young. So I think um, with the emphasis on early years being a foundational part, I think looking at um, moving much more in line with the, a continental Northern European starting age of school um, or formal school from the age of six or, or more, I think is really fundamental. Um, trying to explain to the electorate here why that is not a cop out. Uh, but the younger that you start formal education, there is no linkage between the higher results that you get um, at the age of 16 or, or even 11 years old. So I think that that would be a game changer when it comes to young people um, and uh, mental health in young people as well. Learn through play rather than through formal, formal lessons. Thank you so much for joining us today, Vix. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. A friend of Bright Green, Vix Logan, thank you so much. Oh, thanks very much. Thank you. Really enjoy this. And I'm, I'm going to off to um, to follow the subsequent interviews. Thanks. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Vix, for plugging our next interviews. We have an amazing lineup of guests still to come. Uh, up next, we've got Chris Saltmarsh. We then have Benali Hamdash, Guy Ingerson and Zach Polanski. And we'll be finishing around 6 p.m. So thank you, everyone, so much for sticking around for Vix. Uh, she's been brilliant. And hopefully you will enjoy the rest of our interviews, too. Please keep your comments coming throughout the chat. I'd love to hear what you think, uh, what you thought of uh, the conversation Vix and I have just had. You can also pop them on the hashtag Bright Green Live on all the socials and we'll try and read some of them out too. Apologies to those of you who uh, popped in questions we didn't get around to them. Uh, there's only so much time in the day. Um, but um, yeah, let us know what you think about that conversation with Vix. Uh, coming up at half three, we have Chris Salt, Marshall Labour from A Green New Deal. We'll be talking about the Labour Party's climate policies, where they are and where they should be. Um, I'm desperate for a short break, so I am going to take a very short break and we'll be back very, very soon. Uh, but please do keep watching and uh, I'll see you very, very shortly.
Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to episode one of Bright Green Live. We are hurtling towards the two thirds mark in the show. We still got plenty of uh, conversations still to come. Thank you so much for everyone for tuning in uh, throughout the day. I've found this uh, to be fascinating, the conversation we've had so far. And we've got a brilliant lineup of speakers still to come. Uh, if you are just joining us, you're watching episode one of Bright Green Live, a new show which is bringing together guests and interviews from across the UK's Green Parties, the Labour Movement, Social Movements and the Arts. Um, we still have, how many? Three... Four fantastic guests to come this evening. We'll be finishing off around six o'clock. Uh, first up, we have Chris Saltmarsh from Labour for a Green New Deal, who will be joining us very, very shortly. We then have Ben Ali, Hamd ben Ali Hamdash, uh, who's the Green Party's migration spokesperson. We'll have Guy Ingerson from the Scottish Greens and Zach Polanski, the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. That's all still to come. We've also had a fantastic series of interviews throughout the rest of the day, uh, which some of you will have seen. You can go and scroll back through the live stream and watch any of them that you want to. Please feel free to do that. Uh, we've had Vix Laudian from the Green Party. We've had um, Anna Oppenheim from the Labour campaign for free movement. We've had Jay Kerr from No Sweat. We've had a bunch of amazing people speaking to us throughout the day, and I hope you have all enjoyed it. Uh, I'm going to read a few comments from the chat. Please do keep comments and questions coming in on the chat and on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Uh, so Adriana uh, says, hello, I'm at work, so can I have any volume? Uh, I hope there's some sort of live transcription. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I hope there is. Uh, if there is, great, and I'm glad that you're subverting uh, your workplace and enjoying Bright Green Live when you should be working. That is very much encouraged. Uh, Rich Turner Music said that the Vix interview flew past in what felt like two minutes uh, and that they would have liked to have asked her what she thinks about homeschooling, both in the COVID context and more generally. Yes, that would have been fascinating to talk about. Uh, luckily for you, Vix is a great friend of Bright Green and I'm sure she will be on uh, future episodes and we'll speak to her again in the in the coming months and years. So I'm sure we can we can uh, ask her about that in the future. Uh, but thanks uh, for the comment. Um, we let's have a look a little look at the hashtags. If you have any comments there, uh, so Anthony Slaughter, um, who was our guest earlier on, said thank you to Bright Green for the opportunity to talk about the Wales Green Party plans and uh, plans for the future, including more electoral success. And uh, he's looking forward to hearing from Vix, who we've just heard from. Uh, so thank you, Anthony. Um, and we also have Benali, uh, who is a guest coming up very soon, uh, has said that they're joining at four to talk about the Greens' kinder and fairer approach to refugees and migrants. That is correct. Benali will be on the live stream at four to talk about migration, the government's reactionary policies on it and what a green alternative would look like. So for those of you who are joining, uh, if you haven't yet clicked the subscribe button, please do click it now. We've got a little game running today where we're trying to hit 400 subscribers by the time we go off air at 6 p.m. We're currently at 394. That means there's just six people uh, we need to hit that subscribe button. There are currently seven people watching, so only six of you watching right now need to hit that subscribe button and we will reach our target. I can also see there's a bunch of likes on the video. Please do hit that like button if you haven't already. Helps feed the algorithm, means this will appear in more people people's feeds and more people will be able to watch it. If you've enjoyed this, these interviews, I'm sure others would too. And of course, do share the stream on the hashtag Bright Green Live across all of the socials and uh, we can, uh, it means that more people will see it there as well. Uh, so before we get going with our next interview, uh, which is going to be with Chris Saltmarsh. Now, Chris is the uh, one of the co-founders of Labour for a Green New Deal, the group within the Labour Party that's been pushing for a radical approach to climate uh, policy. They're campaigning for a socialist Green New Deal and campaigning for Labour to adopt that as its policy. He's also the author of this book, uh, Burnt, the uh, Fighting for Climate Justice. I would recommend you go and get a copy now. It's a brilliant book published by Pluto Press, one of the, the good radical left-wing publishers in the UK. Uh, highly recommend this book. Uh, have a read. It's very stimulating and interesting, so get a copy of it uh, while you can. I mean, presumably it's not going out of print, so get a copy of it whenever you want. Um, please do pop your questions in the chat for Chris. We'd love to put them to him. I've got some questions prepared, but would obviously like to, to hear what you would like to see put to him as well. And he'll be joining us in around five minutes. Thank you to the person who just hit like on the video. That is much appreciated. Thank you to those of you who have shared the stream. And of course, those of you who've been with us since 10 a.m. this morning, uh, let us know in the chat 
uh, if you are one of the people who's been here the whole time. I've recognized some names that have been here for a very long time. Ben Samuel been uh, messaging away in the chat, so it's been why. Uh, Meg, Rich, you're all brilliant. Thank you so much for joining and for contributing to what hopefully has been an enjoyable show for all. Thank you again to the other person who's just clicked like. That is hugely appreciated. And to our latest subscriber, we are now on 395, just five to go. Uh, let's see if we can hit 400 by the end of the stream. For those of you who don't know, Bright Green is an online publication that uh, covers the UK's Green parties, the Labour movement, social movements and the wider left. You can find all of our uh, articles on bright-green.org and obviously here on our YouTube channel we put out videos, interviews and so on throughout uh, the year. If you want to keep on track of Bright Green across the socials, we're on all of the major providers including the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Instagrams and the Mastodons. On the Facebooks we are facebook.com forward slash bright grn. On Twitters we are at bright grn. On the Instagrams we are bright at bright green online and on the Mastodons we are bright green on the UK server. I think you'll be able to find us if you type that in. So get those questions coming in for Chris Saltmarsh, who will be joining us very, very shortly, and he'll be followed by Benali Hamdash, Guy Anderson, and Zach Polanski throughout the rest of the show. We will be live until 6 p.m. today, um, and I would love to put your questions to all of our guests, so please do get them coming in. Um, and of course, you can do that in the live chat or on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Um, We are we are going to be joined by Chris in just a couple of minutes time. Uh, so get yourself comfortable, strap yourself in. 396 subscribers, brilliant. So just four to go till we hit that 400 number. Thank you to whoever did that. Um, we've got some questions coming in in the chat for Chris. That's brilliant. Um, we will pick up as many of those as we can. Um, and I'll put them to Chris. Um, if you are just joining, uh, we've had an amazing day of interviews with some brilliant uh, guests, including Jean Lambert, uh, the former Green MEP for London, who was talking about her uh, friend and colleague, Keith Taylor and his life and legacy. Uh, Keith sadly died uh, just, over two, just about two weeks ago. Uh, and she gave a really moving uh, uh, interview about uh, her experience of working with him. Uh, so you can scroll back and watch that or you can watch it back afterwards. Right. Now, Chris has just joined the call. So I'm going to bring Chris in uh, very, very soon. So while he is connecting and doing that weird thing where you have to find the button that says joining audio, um, I'll just introduce Chris, uh, who's joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, so Chris Saltmarsh is, well, he's a friend of Bright Green. Uh, he's been a long-standing contributor to Bright Green, used to write a fortnightly column and still occasionally contributes, uh, which is brilliant. He's also the co-founder of Labour for a Green New Deal and the author of this book here, uh, Burnt Fighting for Climate Justice, uh, which you can get a copy of at all good retailers, I am sure. And Chris is gonna be talking to us today about the Labour Party's climate policies and what Labour for a Green New Deal are pushing for them to be. Uh, before we get onto that, Chris, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Yeah, good. thanks very much. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great, thanks. Good, good, good. Brilliant to have you. Um, so let's get straight to it. Um, so, at the Labour Party conference, Ed Miliband said the next Labour government will make the UK the first country to achieve zero carbon power by 2030. And uh, the conference itself was branded uh, Brighter, Greener Future or something. It was the fair whole shebang future. was Fairer, Greener Future. <laughs> um, I was adding the bright green uh, tinge to it there. <laughs> They're not quite um, stolen your whole, branding. This. <laughs> not yet. Um, <laughs> The, the whole thing was kind of uh, pitched as being, you know, Labour pushing on the climate crisis. Um, and obviously one of the big announcements that came out of Labour conference was Keir Starmer saying the next Labour government would set up a publicly owned renewable energy company. So do you think this is a sign of Labour moving in the right direction on the climate? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess my takeaway is that there is a distinction between an improvement, which I think is, and the right direction. I think it's clearly an improvement because before this Labour Party conference, 
there was a lot of confusion about what Labour's climate policies were, which bits of the 2019 manifesto they were planning to keep and which bits they were planning to ditch, whether they were taking it in a new direction. I think with this, we have some clarity on not just what the party's ambition is. We also have some clarity on what their kind of overall economic strategy is and how that fits and how climate fits into that. The reason I say I don't think it's quite the right direction is that I think, you know, what Labour for a Green Deal, what I've been calling for is uh, a socialist approach to climate politics where we're expanding public ownership across the whole economy. I think what Labour laid out at this Labour Quiet Conference was that they would be taking on a distinctly kind of Fabian social democratic approach to the economy where they're prepared to intervene in markets. You know, maybe that's with some targeted public ownership or some targeted, um, you know, state intervention, disciplining of capital, but it's not about transforming the whole economy. And so, um, you know, when we think about Labour's 2019 manifesto, that had a commitment to be as close to net zero, really, um, as, as close to net zero by as close to 2030 as possible. Now, the ambition we're seeing is zero carbon power by 2030, but that's that the energy sector is only about 20% of all emissions. And so there's a bit of a, there's a rowing back there. And obviously it's jarring for me because the kind of intervening few years dealing with a climate crisis, bringing down emissions has only become more urgent. So there's a, there's a big gap there in terms of labor, labor's plans. It leaves out big sectors like transport and agriculture. So even this, this target um, of 2030, as well as for, for, for power, as well as being inadequate on its own terms, I don't think is, is particularly substantiated by the plans that Labour's laid out. And I think that brings us to the kind of the relative inadequacy of the, the pledge of a publicly owned renewable energy company. Now, I think the big gain of this is that it is really good that the party has recognised there must be a role for public ownership in the energy system. I think that's been a big battle we've been fighting. We've been arguing that there, you know, it's important um, in order to accelerate the transition, make sure it's fair um, and rapid. Um, but I think the crucially the difference is that this this policy of a relatively small public energy company that will have the power to generate some energy, but also invest in private energy capacity um, with the aim of becoming the size of a company like EDF eventually isn't isn't quick enough. It's not enough investment. You know, if we have, say, seven, six years to decarbonize all of the energy sector well how much of that time is great british energy going to spend building itself up to be the size of edf i think what we need at the very very minimum is a public company of the size of edf to start with because otherwise it's going to be crowded out of the market it's not going to do anything to bring down energy prices because it's going to be competing in that market it's only going to be able to bring so much renewable energy online because it's going to be undercapitalized compared to those other big established companies. And it's not gonna be able to scale at pace because it, um, because as I say, it won't have the investment from the state that it needs. So I think this is this is better than, you know, what we were thinking it was gonna be like before. I think Labour clearly will have climate policies into the next election. And as yet, I'm not convinced that they're good enough by the standards of the climate, which is an objective one rather than a kind of political electoral one. So, in terms of that, those uh, that 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 vision for for climate policy that you've kind of alluded to there, and what you said is the the necessity of the objective reality of the climate crisis. You've talked about uh, a socialist Green New Deal mm. as being what you and Labour for Green New Deal are pushing for. Uh, what does that look like in practice, and what do you want Labour to adopt as part of that program? Yeah, I think when we talk about a socialist Green New Deal, there's a few core elements. One is about the pace of decarbonisation. You know, we're really clear that for kind of both domestically, but also our international obligations, it's really important that we're decarbonising, you know, within a 10 year time frame, but ideally quicker than that. Um, the second pillar of it is about scale of investment. It requires stewarding, you know, much larger amounts of public funds than what we've seen certainly over the kind of last 10 years of austerity, um, but also before then as well. I think perhaps most crucially, uh, a socialist Green New Deal is about expanding public ownership across the whole economy. So it's about uh, where there are failing private markets, it's about taking out the profit motive, it's about taking out private competition, and it's about saying the state can provide these basic core strategic utilities so that it can centrally plan and coordinate a transition make sure it's quick, make sure it's fair. 
Um, I think the fourth of kind of five pillars of a socialist Green New Deal is about internationalism. It's about making sure that we're not just decarbonizing within the borders of one country. It's about ensuring that we're also financing just transition internationally as well. And finally, I think, and really crucially, it's about trade union power. It's about ensuring that we don't just decarbonize our current political economy, where capital and the rich kind of dominate um, workers and the poor. It's about fundamentally rebalancing our economy so that we can repeal anti-trade union laws, um, reinvigorate workers' rights, and ensure that workers are leading on the transition in the campaign for a Green New Deal, both campaigning, but also in their workplaces. Um, that's the kind of socialist Green New Deal vision we've sketched out. In terms of what we're demanding currently, I think there's a recognition that where we're at in terms of our economic strategy, it's not the same as where Keir Starmer's party is at. That's, we, we clearly come from different ideological positions on that. That's to be expected, although it's frustrating. I think what we're really focusing on is saying within that context of a kind of different political view on how we should run the economy, we do think that full public ownership of the energy system is a basic. So whatever you, whatever your broad economic principles, the climate crisis really commands that you have a fully publicly owned energy system. And I think where that's a little bit different to what other people have been saying in the past few years is very often there'll be an argument for say, well, we want to bring the big six into public ownership. Um, those are the kind of supply companies that you and I would deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Or there may be a policy around, we want to bring the national grid into public ownership. Perversely, the national grid is currently owned by a private company called National Grid. Um, or it might be some policy around, well, we want cooperative renewable energy production, or we want publicly owned renewable energy generation. These are all the viable and I think really important policy positions on different bits of the energy system being publicly owned. But our argument is that the energy system should be a unified whole. It has been fragmented. It has been marketized. It has been privatized and sold off to profiteers. Um, some elements of the energy system, like transmission, are the most profitable sectors of any sector in the UK economy. But that's just, it's a fake market. It's a natural monopoly that has been sold off. And so we're saying what we need to do as a matter of urgency in order for there to be a coordinated and accelerated energy transition is unifying this energy system, bringing it all together so it can be coordinated and planned, uh, but also taken out of the profit motive entirely. Um, there really can be no role for profit in an energy system when we have bills as high as they are and when we have fossil fuels still pumped into the atmosphere. You know, there really is no time to in, even intervene in markets at this point. It needs to be a total supplanting of markets. So I've got one more question specifically about the Labour Party and I guess Labour for a Green New Deal's role in it before we move on to some other things and mm -hmm. potentially some questions from the chat and from Twitter. Uh, if you do have questions, please do pop them in the chat. Uh, we'll try and get uh, as many of them put to Chris as, as we can. Um, before we do that, so your the the kind of uh, approach you've kind of outlined as to what you and Labour for a Green New Deal are pushing for with regards to tackling the climate crisis, uh, decarbonising the energy system, reshaping the economy and so on. Uh, that's, you know, quite a distance away from where the Labour Party currently is in terms of its approach uh, on energy policy and economic policy and so on. And also the context in the Labour Party is, you know, you've got a leadership that has, you know, moved substantially to the right, both in terms of, you know, Keir Starmer himself, but then also the people that he's appointed to, to shallow cabinet positions, uh, to to advisor, advisory positions and staff position within uh, his office uh, and so on. You've also got, you know, the, the purging of left wing members of the Labour Party, either the self purging because people can't stomach being a member of the Labour Party under Keir Starmer or the active purging uh, through the weaponized disciplinary process. And you've got the what we've seen in recent weeks, the quite clear rigging of the parliamentary selections process uh, taking place with left wing candidates being kept off the ballot and the long list and the short list um, for selections. So in that context, what's the strategy and how do you organise and agitate for the kind of policy shift that you're looking for when you've got a party that is, um, I guess, institutionally trying to stop radicalism from within its own ranks at every turn? Yeah, that's a that's a stark and long list of the kind of anti-democratic measures that the current leadership has uh, has very gleefully um, brought in over the past I don't know, two, two and a half years or so. And it's really challenging. The Labour Party is a really challenging environment to be organising in right now. I guess our perspective as socialists within the Labour Party 
is that despite that, the Labour Party remains a key terrain of struggle within British politics if we're on the left, because uh, for better or worse, and I'm sure many of your viewers will have strong opinions about our electoral system and its flaws within the current political context, the Labour Party is the only viable alternative to the Tory party. And it is likely that the Labour Party will form the next government. And so we believe it is still politically essential to contest the Labour Party. As you say, that's an incredibly difficult thing to be doing right now. Our argument would be that there are still spaces for the left to contest and win uh, and build up bases of power. I think the Labour Party has a flawed and often rigged democracy, but it is an internal democracy nonetheless. And I think the left does have scope to be better organised, to mobilise more, to elect more left-wing delegates to Labour Party conference. You know, this year, the right wing had more delegates to Labour Party conference. That It wasn't a massive majority. It was a majority nonetheless. That's something we could flip next time round. We could have stronger, more disciplined um, left-wing caucuses in constituency Labour parties, um, which would help in terms of passing policy and holding like local MPs to account. But I think really crucially, um, the biggest opportunity for any any wing of the party, but particularly the left, for building a base of power is in local government. You know, there was lots of discussion during Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the party about open selections, mandatory reselections for MPs. We already have that for councillors. Um, there is a lot of scope for socialists within the party to be elected to local government. And there's a lot of Labour councils where just a few socialists being elected would at least be a significant major, m minority of a Labour administration would be able to exert leverage and make key demands, but even potentially um, run councils in a way that is as humane and socialist as possible. You know, we've seen this in places like North Ayrshire um, and Preston, where alternative economic experiments and models have been pioneered um, with great success within very difficult and challenging contexts. And so I think, you know, what we see is you know, I think the right wing of the Labour Party has been given free reign by Keir Starmer to r run it organisationally, but there's only so much that they can control. And there, I think there are clear examples of socialists in local government basically being left to get on with it. Um, and I think that will continue to be the case. And I think when we think about what are some of the preconditions for climate justice in this country, I think it's not the be all and end all, but I think a more democratic local politics is a really important precondition. It's about giving people more say over how we run our housing, how we run our transport, how we run our energy, for example, having socialists and local government able to make those demands uh, and implement those policies uh, is really crucial. And that's something that we should continue to organize around. So I'm gonna move on uh, to another question that I've got, which is, on a completely different topic, but I'll be uh, interested to get your thoughts on it. But in the meantime, please, if anyone does have questions, do stick them in the chat and I'll try and stick them to Chris if we've got time. Uh, so, Chris, you, you've you've been uh, very critical in the past of the uh, the international process for dealing with climate. And we're mm -hmm. having this conversation today um, as COP27 is taking place in Egypt. Um, you've previously written about your, uh, you know, your deep criticisms of that process and also your criticism of the, the climate movement for spending a significant amount of its energy uh, trying to influence the, the COP process um, in the international kind of negotiations. Um, so I wanted to get your sense of what you think of uh, the current COP that's ongoing in, in Egypt, uh, what, if any outcomes you think we're going to get from that, and sort of, yeah, re-articulate why you think that the, the, the COP as a moment is a distraction for the climate movement. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the caveat I'd say is I I kind of I don't take a particularly hard line position that nobody in the climate movement should pay any attention to COP. I think clearly it's an institution uh, that is very flawed, but it exists. And I think there's actually a parallel you can draw with the Labour Party, where you'd say you know the Labour Party in the context of UK politics is deeply flawed. There's lots wrong with it, but it is what there is. You say the same with trade unions, often very flawed institutions, but they are the institutions of the working class uh, in this country. The COP process is the is the kind of international institution that, that that we have that exists for kind of international diplomacy around this, around climate mitigation and adaptation. Um, and so I think it is right that some climate activists, especially internationally, coordinate to make interventions, to make demands, um, to yeah, to extract concessions. I think that's right. 
I think the the critique that you're you allude to that I've made in the past, I think still stands. I think those activists making those interventions need to have a really clear sense of what are the limitations. It's the same if you're organizing the Labour Party, you need to understand what the limitations of that are. Um, the limitations of it. And for me, it is the the UNFCCC COP is a process that has been constructed in the context of an international political economy that is um, hegemonized, that is dominated by the US, by the West, by capitalist countries. I think if you look at the process, the history of COP has been one of countries like the US bullying poorer countries who have made very reasonable demands about rapidity of decarbonization, of finance and support, um, of the polluter, play, polluter pays principle, um, whenever these justice-oriented demands have been made in that process, they've been sidelined. Um, and I think sometimes the climate movement has, I think, a real problem with um, an impulse for like immediacy. I think it's really understandable that the climate issue, which is one that has a really clear like time-bound nature, impels in people a sense of urgency a sense of wanting to do something anything now and i think you know i think we see that with a lot of the protests whether it's just a oil or extinction rebellion that we see recently i think it's all about very quick immediate gratifying action i think we see the same thing with cop you know every year it comes around in one form or another um it makes sense as a kind of big set piece event for the climate movement to target um, but uh, my view is that too much energy goes to that when actually more energy should be spent on a longer view of, well, how are we building power locally? How are we building up and demanding alternative structures? How are we building power such that we can eventually reorganize the international political economy so that these negotiations can happen in a structure where power is more equitably distributed, um, where it's not just about coming up with trade deals that benefit the US and the West uh, under the guise of climate action. Um, and yeah, I think too often we we default into having a big march and saying, well, we support climate justice and this process has failed. Um, I think as a climate movement, we need to take it upon ourselves to build power and demand an alternative. Sometimes that will involve making interventions at COP, more often than not, it will involve doing the hard work of working through our trade unions, working in our communities, um, working in our political parties as well. Thank you so much, Chris. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time for more questions, uh, but it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you as always. And I'm sure uh, your contributions have triggered lots of uh, thoughts and uh, questions and responses from people, which I'm looking forward to seeing later on. But yeah, thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. Thanks for having me. So that was Chris Saltmarsh, who was the co-founder of Labour for a Green New Deal and also the author of this book, Burnt uh, Fighting for Climate Justice, which you can get at all good book retailers, uh, probably. Uh, it's published by Pluto Press. It's a good read. Uh, there's lots of stuff I think your people will agree with, lots they'll disagree with, but it is nonetheless thought provoking and a brilliant read. Um, you can find Chris on, on Twitter elsewhere. He's also, as I said at the beginning, been a long term contributor to Bright Green. He was one of our uh, regular columnists for two years, writing a fortnightly column about all things climate, uh, about the uh, related to the climate movement, the Labour Party, climate justice and the campaigns uh, to achieve it. Um, so let us know what you think about that in the comments. I'm sure there'll be some Green Party members watching who will be uh, who will take issue with some of the things that he was saying about the role of the Labour Party. I can see uh, we've got some of those comments in already. Uh, please do let us know what you think in the comments in the chat on the YouTube's live stream, but also on the Twitters on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Um, for those of you who've just joined us recently, please hit the like button on the stream. It will help us out massively and get this in front of more people. Uh, we have three fantastic guests still to come uh, this evening in the last two hours of the show. Um, for those of you who've been watching a while, you know we're on that little race to 400 subscribers. Uh, we are now on 397, which means we just need three more people to hit that subscribe button. So if you haven't done already, hit subscribe. The reason I'm asking you to hit subscribe, well, there's two reasons I'm asking you to hit subscribe. The first one is it helps Bright Green out a great deal. It means that uh, our videos get uh, uh, presented to more people on YouTube. It means that 
more people will get to see the interviews that we're doing today and in future weeks. But for you, it means that you won't miss out on any of the uh, interviews and the videos and so on that we're putting out in the coming weeks and months. Uh, so you won't miss out on any of that. Uh, like the second episode of Bright Green Live, which is going to be out on the 11th of December. You'll get a notification on your phone or your laptop or whatever, uh, and you'll be able to, to watch it live uh, with a little reminder. So please do hit subscribe right now. In the meantime, before I introduce our next guest, I'm just going to go to some of the comments. Sorry, I didn't get to read all of your questions. So Ben Samuel says that Labour seems keen on offshore wind power, but doesn't understand that we share these waters with our European neighbours. Um, Rich Turner Music says the Labour Party has reverted to its 2015 identity. I cannot share Chris's optimism for change. Those are some interesting comments. Uh, let us know if you agree or disagree with them in the chat. Um, I'll see if there's anything on the old hashtags on the Twitters and so on. Uh, I think we are pretty dry on that front. But nonetheless, please do keep your comments and questions coming in on the hashtag Bright Green Live and also in the chat. Next up, we've got an amazing guest who is Benali Hamdash, who is the Green Party of England and Wales is a migration spokesperson, also a councillor in Islington. Uh, and he's going to be talking about the uh, government's migration policy, why it's wrong, what a green alternative would be and look like, and uh, yeah, how we can stand in solidarity and support migrants and refugees. He'll be joining us in just eight minutes time. So stay tuned. Following Benali, we then have Guy Ingerson, um, uh, who will be talking about the motion that he proposed to the Scottish Greens conference to get the Scottish Greens to cut its ties with the Green Party of England and Wales, what that means in practice, what its impact is, and what he's looking for the Green Party of England and Wales to do on transphobia. And finally, our headline main event act is Zach Polanski, the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, who will be talking about the constitutional crisis currently facing the country and what we do about it, how we build a better democracy out of the ashes of our current system. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who's been watching throughout the day. It's been a pleasure to be joined with you all, particularly those who've been uh, with us from the start or with us for a long time, thinking particularly about Ben and Finn and Philip and Rich and Meg, who've been around for uh, a decent chunk of the day. Uh, please do stick around till the end. Um, we will be going till six. We are three quarters of the way through the show. Uh, I've had a lovely time with you all and with our guests. Um, I hope you found them interesting, engaging and inspiring. If you have, then other people you know will feel that way too. So please do share the link to the stream on your socials, on Facebook, Twitter, and all the rest of them, uh, and get more eyeballs on it so more people can enjoy and experience it. Um, we've had some amazing guests. Um, we had Jane Baston from The Young Greens earlier talking about the student movement and the Young Greens role in it and how we build a fighting student movement that built, built, that, that, that creates a... Uh, free and fair education system. We had Anna Oppenheim talking about the Labour Party's migration policies and uh, the what the Labour Campaign for Free Movement is pushing for the Labour Party to adopt uh, on migration. We had Matthew Hull right at the start, hours and hours and hours ago, talking about trade unions, the current wave of strike action, and how Greens can, can support and should support the trade union movement. Uh, you can scroll back through, watch any of those back uh, as and when you like. Uh, they're here on the stream, so feel free to, to flick through and find those um if you haven't already hit like hit subscribe share the stream and let us know how you're doing in the chat we're on 398 subscribers we have just two to go till we hit that 400 milestone we've got two hours let's do it one one per hour as an absolute minimum we need to do between now and six o'clock uh we've got uh three guests i'm sure we'll make it but we'll make it with your help uh, so as I said, very, very soon, we'll be joined by Benali Hamdash, the Green Party's migration spokesperson. Uh, Benali and I would love to hear your questions and comments. So please do pop them in the chat and I'll put as many of those questions to Benali as I can. You can also pop them on the hashtag Bright Green Live um, and we'll pick any questions up that come there. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on all the socials on Facebook. We are facebook.com forward slash bright grn. On the Twitters, we are twitter.com forward slash bright grn. On the Instagrams, we are at bright green online. And on the new shiny toy of Mastodon, we are at bright green on the UK server. I'm sure you'll be able to find us if you search the hashtag bright green live or if you search bright green. About two dozen people have followed us today, I'm guessing from the stream. Um, so clearly my instructions uh, on a platform that I don't understand 
have been effective. Um, but uh, yeah, please do follow us. Uh, it means that you won't miss out on anything we're putting out in the future, including all the content on our website, all the articles, comment pieces, news pieces, interviews that we have running throughout um, the year. Uh, we've already got some questions coming in for Benali. That is brilliant. I'll continue to put, I'll put those to him uh, when we uh, are joined by him. In the meantime, please do keep them coming in. I want to get as many as possible. I can see a new name uh, that's clearly joined recently. That's the first question. Thank you, Ed, for that. I'll try and put that to Benali when he joins. Um, and he'll be joining in around five minutes time. Uh, I haven't introduced myself for a while, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris. I am the editor of Bright Green and I'm hosting the show today, which is the first episode of Bright Green Live, a new monthly show that is taking place on the second Sunday of every month and will feature interviews with a range of guests from across the UK's Green parties, the Labour movement, the social movements, and from time to time, a bit of the arts. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get any arts bookings today, but in the future, we're going to have interviews with musicians, poets, authors, uh, filmmakers, um, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, so uh, please do keep tuned for that. The best way to make sure that you keep on top of everything that's going on with Bright Green on YouTube's is to hit that subscribe button and uh, you'll get a notification every time we go live, uh, every time we put out a video, it'll appear in your little feed and you can make sure you don't miss out. It also helps out Bright Green massively, it feeds that little algorithm uh, so it means that our videos will appear in more people's feeds and what that means is that the interviews that you've enjoyed, that you've appreciated will appear in front of more people's faces. The people, uh, you know, if you've enjoyed these interviews, other people will do so do too. So if you hit that subscribe button, more people will be able to watch. So we're going to be seeing to Benali at four o'clock. At 4.45, we're going to be joined by Guy Ingerson from the Scottish Greens, uh, talking about the motion that was passed to sever the times between the Scottish Greens and the Green Party of England and Wales. And after that, closing the show at 10 past five, we're going to be joined by Zach Polanski, uh, who I'm sure you're all looking forward to hearing from. And he will be talking about the current constitutional crisis in the UK uh, and uh, what a new democratic settlement might look like. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the show thus far. Um, it's been a new experiment. We've had a few technical issues. It's been a bit ropey and chaotic in places, but um, I think the conversations we've been having have been really valuable, useful, interesting, inspiring, and I hope you agree with that too. So again, questions in the comments, uh, questions and comments in the chat for Benali, who is up next. You can also load up some questions for Guy and Zach too, um, and I'll try and get to them. The earlier they get in, the more likely it is that I'll be able to get them and ask them. Um, and of course, if you haven't already, please do hit the like button. If you hit the like button, it means more people will see the video. And, you know, it's just a little dose of dopamine from hitting that little thumbs up. Everyone likes the thumbs up. Don't hit the thumbs down button. Nobody needs that. And um, it doesn't feel as nice for you. So hit the thumbs up. And very, very soon, we are going to be joined by Banali Hamdash, the Green Party's migration spokesperson. I can see now he's just entering. So as I let Banali into the room, I'll introduce him. So uh, next up, our next guest is Banali Hamdash, who is the Green Party of England and Wales is migration spokesperson and also a councillor in Islington um, and a long-standing member of the Green Party of England and Wales, well known amongst the membership and also a long-term friend of Bright green uh we're going to be talking about the government's current migration policies what the greens response would be um but before we get into that banali thank you so much for joining us how are you doing i'm good thank you um it's been a long day uh with remembrance sunday but an important one so yes good thank you so much for joining us uh today banali so i'm going to kick you off straight away um with the first question so at the moment in the current political context you've got both the tories and the labour party who seem intent on trying to outdo each other on anti-migrant rhetoric uh and also on policies so you've got the rwanda deportation policies proposals from labour to introduce id cards how should progressives be responding to this uh current uh cacophony of reactionary rhetoric on migration 
Yeah, well, it, it's it's all hauntingly familiar, isn't it? Um, I worked in the migrants' rights sector back in 2014, and there's lots of uh, echoes from that time, starting with Yvette Cooper back as Shadow Home Secretary once again. Now, I think centering the rights of refugees and migrants is really important for our politics because they are the canary down the coal mine. I think as soon as politics is ready to sacrifice and attack and other one group of society it, it, it's a warning sign for how the rest of politics and the rest of priorities will be shaped uh, and yeah again you know Keir Starmer's Labour Party seems very much ready to abandon the more progressive approach that we saw under Jeremy Corbyn which still wasn't perfect it wasn't as good as the Green Party's approach but was much better compared to Ed Miliband and yeah, I mean, ID cards this week. Now, Yvette Cooper quite quickly said that the Labour Party were going to back off that idea. But I think we have to really focus in on what that messaging piece told us about where Labour is. ID cards were suggested as a way of making sure that the hostile environment was better enforced. It's about keeping undocumented migrants out of work, unable to use bank accounts, unable to, to use um, to rent. And if we look back at where the hostile environment policies come from, they were originated as a term by Liam Byrne under the last Labour government. So unfortunately, there is this authoritarian uh, strand within the Labour Party that is coming at the forefront. And I think we have to expose it and we have to challenge it. I think there is a fight within the Labour Party. There are more liberal attitudes. And I think we shouldn't be afraid of welcoming and celebrating when Labour get it right, right? Like they are going to scrap the Rwanda uh, refugee deal if they are back in power. That's really important. But they are very much arguing on a kind of logistics and financial uh, uh, argument. They're not arguing on the moral principle that it is simply wrong to send people to Rwanda. And yeah, I mean, the Tories, I mean, ultimately we've seen the Tory party hijacked by their far right, uh, kind of movement from within um you know long gone uh, you know are this is this idea of this one nation tory party you've got some really unpleasant characters that are at the forefront of rishi sunak's government whether that's suella um or other characters and i think actually what is heartening is that both this hardening rhetoric from both parties is increasingly out of step where the, where the public is, from human homes for Ukraine to public polling. Uh, the British public have never been more supportive of the rights of immigrants and migrants. And I think now is the time to start getting and getting the green voice out there that we are the party that has you know, the progressive policies that the public are looking for. So you've mentioned, I guess, the, the, the public attitude towards uh, migration at the moment. And, you know, if we were having this conversation 10, 15 years ago, uh, you know, the context then was you looked at opinion polls and opinion polls were constantly saying that migration was one of the top issues people cared about. And when they were saying they cared about it was because they wanted less lower migration. You couldn't knock on doors 10 years ago without, you know, you knock on 15 doors and at least one of the people there would, would mention migration as an issue uh that 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 definitely seems to have uh shifted and you look at the public opinion poll and that has happened but so with regards to some of the policies that are coming out of the government some people have argued that things like the rwanda deportation policy it's not it's not a serious policy proposal and indeed we've we've not seen deportation flights taking off yet partially because they've been resisted by legal challenge and, and, and campaigners but some people would argue that it's not a serious policy proposal what it's designed to do is to um to whip up kind of uh hostility towards migrants and to use migration as a culture war issue uh, rather than as a serious proposal to 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 uh, w when when we're looking at migration what do you make of that 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 suggestion I think there's le levels of things going on. Um, I think one of the things that I've been doing is working with um, our Green MEPs in Europe who have been visiting um, Manston, asking civil servants questions, challenging some of the, the decisions that they're making. I think one of the, the, the biggest interesting bits of insight that I glimmered from those conversations most recently is that for lots of civil servants and high up decision makers this is simply replicating the Dublin third regulations so this was a deal under the European Union where 
under certain rights, you could send migrants back to the first country of origin. Now, so the Conservatives have cooked this up this slightly bizarre sense of logic where Rwanda is just the new version of Dublin 3 because Europe won't take back um, uh, our asylum seekers. So we'll just find another third party to do that. So there's some very kind of warped logic that equating um, you know, someone being sent to Spain as to someone being sent to Rwanda, which based on human rights, based on you know, the, 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 the deal having to be negotiated, based on the plight of refugees in that country, is absolutely not the same. Um, I mean, I think also, you know, very clearly, this deal came out when it was all about saving Boris Johnson's job, right? It was Operation Red Meat. They were dialing out hard right politics as quickly as possible to save Boris's job and distract us all from party gate. And, um, you know, it's very clear that Boris Johnson was calling up Priti Patel asking, what about Rwanda? What about Rwanda? I mean, from some by some newspaper reports, Rwanda was actually on a list of countries that shouldn't be looked at in terms of this, these deals. And it was from political pressure from number 10 that it got back onto the list of priorities. So I think there are some civil servants who have cooked up some very warped logic based on the political priorities of saving the, <laughs> the Conservative Party's bacon. But there is i think unfortunately there is some serious commitment to making this happen because having left the european union and having lost the opportunity to work with our european neighbors to support refugees and work together um the the as a result civil servants are cooking up kind of half-baked schemes like this and we're hearing paraguay is on the list um you know the idea of sending refugees to paraguay for all the way from the uk is 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 it's just it's wild and um, we you know i think we are witnessing a conservative party that has run out of ideas has run out of bumps only has the fight uh, with itself and with labor and i think we're going to see some very strange things over the next few years before the general election kind of barked out and some very strange logic so we've talked a little bit about policy uh, and the impact of that what i wanted to talk a little bit about is the impact of rhetoric um when it comes to migration so the the, the policy conversation part of it is uh you know the the, the conversation that we have is is largely about rhetoric when it comes to migration so you know you've seen recently the you know sorry i referring to migrants as an invasion and we've seen similar rhetoric taking place um, across our politics um, in recent weeks. Um, I wondered beyond the, the kind of direct policy implications of, uh, of, of the things that are being introduced, what do you think is the impact of the kind of anti-migrant rhetoric we get from government and the media and from politicians on the real lives of, of, of actual people, whether they be, you know, refugees, uh, asylum seekers, migrants, people of colour and so on? Well, I've seen that, you know, day to day in my life. Um, you know, I'm the son of an Algerian migrant. And in the wake of the Brexit referendum, he experienced some of the worst racism that he'd had in this country in decades. I mean, similarly, like um, soon after the referendum as well, I had to go to the police to report two racist incidents on the bus. It did feel like um, politicians and certain parts of the media had given permission to the worst kind of behaviour in the public sphere. And uh, yeah, I think when you've got politicians using utterly unacceptable language, there are consequences. And civil servants warned Suella that her language and her rhetoric risked giving a green light to far right extremists. And then we saw what happened um, with a terrorist attack against refugees in this country by a person who had clearly been radicalized online over a number of years. And I think I think politicians who are playing this game need to need to pause and they need to think about the consequences of their actions. We've had two MPs killed um, in the service of their duty in the last decade. That is the direct impact and direct consequence of the polarization and the the worsening of the public sphere um refugees have much less uh security much less help we've got incidents of far-right activists go storming hotels and videoing refugees and it only takes a little bit more for that to turn into violence 
I think politicians, we can inspire, we can provide hope, but, you know, our words can do the direct opposite. And I think, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's deeply troubling to see where the Tory party is and to see some of the rhetoric coming out of the back bench, the front bench, um, all in pursuit of trying to save uh, what seems like a doomed attempt to not lose the next election. And at some point you have to, you hope that maybe some morality and some sense that things are more important than an election and that the fabric of society matters. But then you look to the Republicans in America and you realise that, that, you know, that some politicians don't care. So I've got a final question for you before I look to the chat uh, and see if there's anything that we can pick up from there. So uh, people watching, please do pop your comments or questions in the chat. Uh, so my final question to you is looking forward, uh, rather than looking at the kind of current situation we've got now and the, the awful things that we've talked about thus far, what would a humane migration policy look like? Well, so I'm really proud. I mean, the, the policies that we have and the values that we have are actually one of the biggest reasons I joined the Green Party back in 2012. And actually, all over the world, the Greens are leading this conversation from Australia to Germany to New Zealand and Sweden. So, you know, Green parties have led the argument for a kinder and fairer process and quite cha often challenged parties on the left to do better. Now, I think, first of all, it has to start with safe routes for people to be able to come to this country. The best way to put the people smugglers out of business is to let people come over to this country um, with permission and then climb asy asylum here. I mean, I think Canada is a good model to follow. They, I mean, they're not perfect, but they allow people to get visas to come here to come to claim asylum and do much better work than, than, than us. Um, you know, when you look at the channel and you look at the Mediterranean, you see the people, the amount of people dying or, you know, deeply in danger because of the conditions. You, you can't help but struggle to wonder why we aren't opening up safe routes when we know that so many people who are making the journey are refugees. They are, and, you know, they, they are fleeing desperate conditions. So safe uh, authorised routes is is number one. Um, I think number two, and I, you know, this is something that I, I want to talk more about, is about an amnesty of undocumented migrants. Now, the Irish Green Party led on this in Ireland. So refugees who didn't have papers, or migrants who didn't have papers, who had been in the country for a long time, had a pathway to naturalise and to gain British citizenship, um, so Irish citizenship. We should be doing the same here. It, it allows people to come out from being exploited in the criminal market, from and be, uh, you know, uh, out from the cold, and you know pay tax, be part of society. You know, this used to happen in, in Republican America and it's not on the agenda here. And in fact, once upon a time, Boris Johnson supported an amnesty for undocumented migrants uh, back when he was uh, nicknamed some kind of liberal. Um, but I think that, 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 that it's something that we should be kind of champing in the bit at the Greens because so often when we're debating uh, migrants and refugees, we're trying to hold on to what we've got right, rather than actually for what you know, pushing the narrative and pushing the envelope on what policies might seem challenging now, but are absolutely needed. Um, we need to invest in the asylum process. I mean, one of the, th the most notable things under the Pretty Patel's Nationality and Borders Bill was scrapping the target of how, how student asylum seekers should get a response. Actually. People should be getting responses and answers much quicker uh, and, that, and we should be processing people um, so they get a decision and not wait years and years and years for some kind of decision on, on, on their application. I think also one of the things is that we need to reverse the hardening of the process as well. Another thing, a feature of the Nationality and Borders Bill was that um, you the, the, the measure of evidence that you have to provide early on has become much higher. And you know, we, we know that this government is deporting LGBT people back to places where it's illegal. We know this government is ignoring evidence of people being people trafficked. So kind of putting resource back and making sure that there's ethical processes to properly listen to people's cases. Um, I'm really excited about the Green Party's rewrite of our migration chapter. And I think one of the ideas that is coming out of there is that you know anyone who has a job officer should get a work visa. Um, I recently wrote for Left Foot Forward about how the transition from freedom of movement to 
the kind of short term work visas that are kind of being put out to fill gaps in the employment sector and leading to massive amounts of worker exploitation. Um, and, you know, we've got people in debt bondage who are coming over to work in farms in miserable conditions who are vulnerable to their employer because they're here on, the, on as, a spon as sponsored by their employer. I think the Green Party have great principles about actually giving power back to the employee, um, working with trade unions and kind of relaxing some of the hardening that we've seen um, in, 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 in policy. I mean, it wasn't long ago that international students were allowed two years to stay in the country after their degree to find work. That, you know, again, I think that was Theresa May that that was removed. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, there, there is a finder care, a finder, a kind of fairer approach. It's not too hard to imagine but it's become so clouded by the kind of lack of courage from mainstream politicians but actually you know the hardening has only creeped in over the last few decades and, and just peeling back some of the changes under new labor and this tory party would take us back to where we were uh, and it's sad that we've lost that So I'm going to go to questions from the chat now. Um, so for people watching, please do stick any further questions in the chat whilst we've still got Benali with us. Um, so Steve C asks, um, how would the Green Party build a system for end-to-end -end management and welcoming of migrants? So from reception to support into housing and work. Yeah, so I think we need to change the approach that we've got that is very focused on detention. I mean, the conditions in Manston uh, are absolutely horrifying and they're done so deliberately. Now, most recently, the Home Office actually did a trial of um, asylum seekers being looked after in the community and, uh, you know, uh, potentially people who are perceived as high risk. Um, but and the trial worked perfectly. I think we could be making sure that asylum seekers are not detained, that they're kept in uh, the community. And there's lots of reasons why that's important. I mean, particularly for LGBT plus refugees who are expected to prove their sexuality and gender. And how do you do that when you've been kept in detention? Um, you know, how can you prove an out and proud life in, in those conditions? You know, I think resourcing is a really important matter. Um, you know, I think the, the lack of temporary accommodation that's suitable for refugees and asylum seekers is a huge, huge problem. You know, some of the quality of these hotels that people are being left in, I mean, the amount of Afghan refugees who've been in miserable hotels, moved around more than once, some of them, not able to build any stability. It is absolutely heartbreaking. And so the austerity and the, the cuts that are behind this agenda um, have to be reversed. And we have to invest in, in this part of the public service. I think letting asylum seekers work is another really important part. I mean, actually, if the public are really supportive of the idea that asylum seekers should be allowed to work. Um, and it allows people to build a life and not to be stuck in a hotel day to day with nothing to do. Um, I think it's a really important part of, you know, welcoming and building people's lives. And yeah, I mean, I think, I think the other bit that I would talk about would be the, the absolute pittance that asylum seekers are given every week. Um, yes, people are provided with accommodation, but the amount of money that, you know, can bear, wouldn't be able to cover travel or wouldn't be able to uh, cover like um, essentials like clothing, um, particularly during cost of living crisis. And, um, you know, just like benefits, it's been frozen for a long time. And we all know, we all know, we're all increasingly familiar with the impact of austerity on the welfare uh, of people claiming benefits. Benali, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. It's been an absolute pleasure and really fascinating, interesting, insightful as always. Thank you so much. No worries. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks so much, Benali. And thank you to everyone for watching. Uh, I hope you found that as insightful as I did. Um, apologies to those questions we didn't manage to get to in the chat, but please do let us know what you thought about uh, the conversation that we've just had. I would love to hear it. Um, so we have two guests left uh, for this evening. We have uh, Guy Ingerson from the Scottish Greens to talk about why he proposed that the Scottish Greens cut their ties from the Green Party of England and Wales. And finally, we will have Zach Polanski talking about the current constitutional crisis in the UK and what we can do about it. Um, 
But uh, before we get to them, I have a few things to ask of you. The first of which is please do hit that like button. Uh, it means that the stream will appear in more people's feeds. The interviews and conversations we've been having today will reach more people. And uh, if you've enjoyed them, other people will too. On that note, if you could please share this stream on all of your socials, on the Twitters, the Facebooks, wherever else, uh, it means more eyeballs will get on it. If you've enjoyed them, other people will too. And um, it will mean that more people will get to see it um so we're gonna take a short break soon uh before i bring in guy um but please again do let me know what you thought about the conversation we've had just there with benali um about uh the current migration policies in the uk also for those of you who are around at the beginning um and uh were able to hear the interview that we did with anna oppenheim from labor campaign for free, Mo free movement it'd be brilliant to hear um your thoughts on you know how Benali and Anna's contributions compare um you know they make similar points they made some very different points it would be lovely to hear uh, that comparison I'll just go to some comments now that we've got coming in so uh Rich Turner Music says Benali was a brilliant guest it was a good wide-ranging chat thank you very much I agree entirely um with that comment Benali is always excellent and uh a great friend of Bright Green a long-term contributor um and um has long supported what we do and is a great advocate for a fair and just migration system before we go to a quick break i am going to give you the update you've all been waiting for we are now on 399 subscribers we need just one more to hit 400 we've got to do it before 6 p.m please do hit that subscribe button it helps bright green out massively and it means that you won't miss any of the interviews that we're putting out uh, in the coming weeks and months as well as the next episode of bright green live which will be taking place on december the 11th we'll be joined by ria patel at croydon uh, green party councillor and dozens of other guests yet to be booked um so i'm going to take a short break we'll be back in two or three minutes and uh we'll bring in guy Anderson from the scottish greens very very soon please do let us know what you thought about the conversation banali put some questions in the chat for guy and also anything that you'd like me to answer to about bright green about anything else i would love to answer them so i'll see you very very shortly we'll be back in two or three minutes
Hello, hello, hello. We are now back with episode one of Bright Green Live. The sun has set. We're in darkness. We're into the evening. We're into the last 90 minutes of the show. Thank you so much for every to everyone for watching thus far. We still have two brilliant guests to come. But before we get to that, I have one really important announcement to make. For those of you who've been watching for a while, you know that we've been counting down until we hit that 400 subscriber mark. And we've done it. Thank you so much to everyone who subscribed today. It makes a massive difference for Bright Green, but it also means that you won't miss out on all of the upcoming videos that we have going out, including episode two of Bright Green Live on the 11th of December. Now, our next guest is Guy Ingerson. Now, Guy is a uh, activist in the Scottish Greens from Aberdeen. And Guy proposed a motion to the Scottish Green Party conference earlier this year, which was passed. And that motion called for the Scottish Greens to sever its ties with the Green Party of England and Wales. The reason? Because the Scottish Greens deem the transphobia problem within the Green Party of England and Wales to be too big. And they've said that they will not reinstate those ties until the Green Party of England and Wales sorts out its problem with transphobia. So we're going to be talking to Guy about that motion, what it means in practice, and what the Scottish Greens want to see from the Green Party of England and Wales. I can already see some questions coming into the chat uh, for Guy. Please do pop more in. I'd love to put your questions to Guy um, and to find out what he thinks about what you think about that motion. After Guy, we have Zach Polanski, the Deputy Leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, joining us to talk about the UK's current constitutional crisis and what a fairer greener democratic settlement for the UK would be. Now we've had, <clears throat> apologies, my voice is starting to wane after nearly eight hours of doing this. I'm just gonna do a giant cough, so apologies to you all. <laughs> uh, so we've had lots and lots of guests out today. I would love to hear what your thoughts were on all of them. I would love for you to let us know what you've learned, what your favorite conversation has been, uh, anything you've enjoyed from the day, please let us know in the chat, but also on the socials on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Um, we've got some questions coming in for Guy. Let's get some comments in. Let us know what you think of the day so far. As you know, this is the first of the streams that we have ever done. So it's been a bit ropey, a bit chaotic, but hopefully you've enjoyed the conversations thus far and are going to enjoy the two remaining that we have today. Um, so Benali went down a treat. We had Benali Hamdash on just earlier talking about uh, the current migration policy. Bridge Time Music said Benali was a great guest. It was a good wide ranging chat. I agree. Uh, and there's some comments come through about various uh, elements of the things that Benali was talking about. So Left Hasty says a work visa for anyone with a job offer is a great idea. And it seems ridiculous to think that it's not already the case. Uh, so you can rewind if you want to and watch back the interview we did with Benali, which was at four o'clock. Uh, earlier in the day, we also spoke to Anna Oppenheim from the Labour Campaign for Free Movement. And uh, Anna talked about the Labour Party's policies on migration and where the Labour Party, where the Labour Campaign for Free Movement wants to see them go. Uh, that was earlier today at um, a lot earlier. I think it was about 10.45. So you can you can look back through the live stream and find that there. Steve C says it's been a great mix of guests today. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, that's great to hear. What I'd really love to hear from you people watching is what guests would you like us to book for next time? So at the moment, we've only got one guest booked. We've got a couple of others um, who are in the works, but we've still got very much an open program for the next episode of Bright Green Live on December the 11th. And I would love to hear your suggestions for guests that we can get in to interview then. So please pop in the chat anyone that you'd like us to speak to on the next episode. Um, for those of you who are joining us more recently, Bright Green Live is going to be a monthly uh, show, which is going to be bringing you interviews and discussions with key figures on the left, the UK's Green Party, the Labour Movement, Social Movements and the Arts. So any suggestions in any of those categories, please do pop them in the chat and we'll try and book them. Uh, there's 34 people who've liked this stream. That's all right, but you can do better. If you haven't already, click that like button. It means that the video will appear in more people's YouTube feeds and it gives you a good little dopamine hit when you hit the like button as well. If you haven't already, you can follow us on the socials at twitter.com forward slash bright green on uh, sorry bright g r n that is on twitter at bright g r n on the facebooks we're on facebook.com forward slash bright g r n 
on the Instagrams are at Bright Green Online and on the new shiny Mastodon, we're on at Bright Green on the UK server. So Guy's going to be joining us in about 10 minutes time and we're then going to be finishing off the day with Zach Blansky, who is the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. <clears throat> Um, for those of you who missed some of the earlier conversations and interviews, we had a wide range of guests. We had Anthony Slaughter from the Wales Green Party and Anthony talked about the Future Cymru Forum, a new body that's being set up jointly by the Wales Green Party and Plaid Cymru to make the case for Welsh independence. He also talked quite a bit about the prospects of the Wales Green Party in future um, elections and um, the changes in the electoral system and what that means for the Greens and for progressive politics more generally. We also had Jane Baston from the Young Greens talking about the role of the student movement and the fight for a fair free education system. And we also had a brilliant, uh, the brilliant opportunity to speak to Jean Lambert, who uh, was a MEP for London for the Green Party for 20 years. Um, and she was talking about her friend and colleague, Keith Taylor, who sadly passed away very recently and the impact that he had on the Green Party, but also politics more broadly. So you can scroll back through and watch any of those interviews as you wish to. Um, got a suggestion from Steve C in the chat. Uh, he says, we'd really like to see to hear more about green economics. So maybe Molly Scott Cato or Kate Rayworth. And uh, so really understand how wealth taxes would work. Uh, those are two great suggestions. I'll see what I can do for future episodes. Um, both brilliant speakers and always make inter interesting contributions. Um, I've been lucky enough to interview Molly before and it's always a um, interesting experience. There's lots that we agree on and lots where we have different views and that's often part of what makes a great conversation. So uh, brilliant suggestions there. Um, there's a suggestion from Ben Samuel of someone called Marcus. I don't know who Marcus is. If you could <laughs> uh, explain who Marcus is, maybe with a surname, um, then maybe we can look at booking Marcus. Uh, keep your suggestions for guests in the for the future episodes coming in the chat. The one guest we currently have booked for the next episode on December the 11th is Ria Patel, who is a Green Party councillor in Croydon and is the Green Party's equality and diversity spokesperson or equality spokesperson, I can't remember the terminology. Um, Rhea is going to be talking about transphobia in the Green Party and how we tackle it, which is a nice dovetail with the conversation we're going to be having with Guy in a few minutes time. So keep those suggestions coming in the chat. And you may or may not know, but Bright Green does not have the backing of billionaires or big business. It relies solely on the kind and generous support of lovely people like you if you are able to please do consider making uh, setting up a regular donation to bright green to help fund the work that we do to fund these live streams the interviews that we put on up on our youtube channel all the articles news comment pieces we publish on our website we can only exist because of your support so if you are able to please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation or a one-off donation those are also very much appreciated if you scroll up in the chat somewhere there is a link to the donation site page on our website uh, it will be hugely appreciated whatever you can contribute but it will allow us to continue to put out uh, interviews and videos like this so very very soon we are going to be joined by guy uh in the meantime we've now hit 401 subscribers i didn't even need that extra one we were just looking for 400 but thank you very much for the for the for the 401th uh 401st sorry subscriber it's much appreciated uh and it means that you won't miss out on everything that bright is putting out in the couple coming weeks and months so guy ingerson who is our next guest is going to be a really fascinating conversation we're going to be talking about transphobia in the green part of england and wales why the scottish greens decided to cut their ties with the Green Party of England and Wales. Um, and if you are looking forward to that conversation, other people will definitely be willing, wanting to listen to it too. So please do share the live stream on your socials, particularly on Twitter, and we get more people watching and enjoying the conversation. Um, we have had another suggestion in the chat uh, for speakers. Uh, left 
Hasty says, check out Civic Square for speakers. I don't know what Civic Square is. Uh, maybe you could let us know more about it in the chat um, and we can look into it. Uh, but that's that's not a group or organisation that I know. But um, uh, yeah, please do let us know who they are, what they do, who we might be able to book through them. And of course, if any of you have any other suggestions for guests, please do let us know. So we've got about an hour and 15 minutes left of the show. Uh, first up, we've got Guy Engerson, and then later on, we've got Zach Polanski. Uh, Zach is the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, as many of you will know. He's going to be talking a little bit about the current constitutional crisis in the UK and what we can do about it, what a new democratic settlement could look like. If you've got any questions for Zach or for Guy, please do pop them in the chat or indeed on the socials on the hashtag bright green live we'll try and read out as many of the questions and comments that you put in as we can uh, but the earlier you get the questions in the more likely it is that i'm going to get to them in time for when our guests arrive so please do get questions in the chat for guy and zach i can see there's already a couple of brilliant questions for guy in there let's get some in for zach too um, and we'll put them to them when they are here I've had a great day, by the way. It's been really enjoyable. And uh, thank you for keeping me all company. Uh, this is the first of these that we've done. And we're obviously hoping to make it a regular thing once a month. Um, I'd love feedback. Uh, so please do get your comments and questions in. Love to hear what you think of the guests we've booked, format, the length, everything, so that uh, we can make sure that we're putting out something that you folks want to watch find interesting engaging and um uh what to come back to in the monthly show so steve c said how about a day showcasing voices from local parties it's great to see national spokespeople but it would be great to hear what's going on around the country i'm assuming that relates to local green parties that's a great idea um and we will be having more contributions from the local level soon so we're going to have Ria patel next time local councillor in croydon we're going to be booking other councillors and other key people from various local parties across the country so that will be happening in future episodes please do stay tuned also uh in terms of future episodes earlier today we were supposed to be speaking to emily apple from the canary uh talking about why that publication has restarted as a workers cooperative um unfortunately she wasn't able to join so we're going to book her in uh in the future uh so i can see that guy is just joining us now so i am going to let guy into the room and as guy enters and connects uh, i'll just do a bit of an introduction so earlier this year the scottish green party voted for a motion to sever its ties with the green party of england and wales the reason for the passing of that motion was the uh, what the scottish greens deemed to be the green party of england and wales's failure on transphobia now one of the proposers of that motion was guy ingerson and guy ingerson is joining us today and we're going to talk a little bit about why that motion was proposed what it means in practice and uh, what i want to see from the green party in terms of dealing with transphobia but before we get to all that uh, i welcome guy guy thank you so much for joining us how are you doing yeah good thank you good to be here Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so let's start, at the, let's start at the beginning. So why did you propose the motion to uh, cut the ties of the Scottish Greens to the Green Party of England and Wales? So just to give some background uh, for maybe people who aren't aware of this ongoing um, call, uh, transphobia has been on the rise for quite some time. Um, lots of people maybe have seen some of this in the media. And in the Green Party of England and Wales, this has become particularly problematic with former spokespeople. Um, engaging in what I believe to be transphobic behaviour and rhetoric. And the motion actually came about, we were looking at potentially implementing this motion, it must have been a couple of years ago now, um, and we've been, we've been in discussions about that for quite some time. 
The reason the motion came about is actually because of a motion proposed at a Green Party and England and Wales conference, um, which would have had an impact on healthcare, specifically trans healthcare, and what kind of healthcare could be offered to trans people. And it was UK wide, and it was deemed competent by the relevant uh, GPEW body. That's where we felt we needed to intervene because although it's highly unlikely that our sister party would take control of the UK government, I mean, fingers crossed, maybe one day it will, that would have ended up, if that policy had been implemented, uh, impacting the devolution settlement. But even, even in the unlikely event that that was going to happen, it was extremely disrespectful to deem a motion competent, let alone write a motion that would have had an impact on our capacity as a party and our reputation as a party when it comes to things like trans healthcare. So that's what I initially prompted the motion. Um, in the preamble to the motion, there was uh, several other incidences that were highlighted, for example, um, somewhat toxic language referring to the Scottish Greens as a Scots cabal or jocks. Um, other language, you know, saying that we were a danger to children um, and to women's rights. So those sort of reputational um, impacts were also taken into account as well. And that's that's what prompted the motion in the end. So in practical terms, what does the motion mean? So obviously it says that the Scottish Greens has cut formal ties to the Green Party of England and Wales. What does that mean in practice? So the cutting or severing is technically an accurate language. It's a suspension of ties. Um, so what this means is in very practical terms, Green Party of England and Wales members don't have the automatic right to speak at Scottish Green Party members. So that's the only practical implication. The rest of it is political and symbolic. Um, essentially, the symbolic value of this is we're drawing a line. We're not going to tolerate this. Um, and if the GPEW continue along this path and, and don't sort out the issues of transphobia and other forms of bigotry, such as homophobia, for example, then they run the risk of pari pariah status within the wider Green family. Um, you know, I've already heard colleagues within the European Greens that are looking at potential motions to tackle transphobia and member parties uh, from the Austrian Greens to the Green Party of England and Wales. So I think there is a growing movement within the Green Party to, to expel for want of a better term, this virus of bigotry uh, before it continues to, to infect our movement. So apologies for using the wrong language. You are right that it does specifically re refer to a suspension of ties and there is uh, a, a clause in that motion which talks about the, the moment at which those ties could be reinstated, um, which brings me on to my next question, which is what do you want to see the Green Party of England and Wales doing practically to tackle the issues that have been raised by the motion? Well, the first thing we would suggest is we've seen several action plans come from our sister party in England and Wales. We would like to see those, those implemented because from what we're seeing so far, these action plans are not actually being implemented. So that's step one, I think, is just at a bare minimum. The next step would be to actually start expelling members who are engaging in this sort of rhetoric or behaviour. Um, it's not easy, you know, we've had to do it on uh, a number of occasions um, in the, the past few years. Um, there's been some high profile people who have left as well. Um, so it's not an easy thing to do. But I would suggest that to our Green Party, you know, to our colleagues down south, that they should look at the success that we've had. You know, our membership continues to grow. We've had, you know, success in the uh, recent elections, both local and Scottish elections. And we're also now got Greens in government. So it's not doing us any harm to tackle these difficult things, especially, you know, I know how difficult it is if you've campaigned alongside someone for a long time and all of a sudden they're starting to engage in this sort of language and behaviour. But it needs to be purged. And I hate to use that word because obviously in politics that has lots of connotations in political parties, but it does. It's like an infection. If you let it continue, it will damage the patient. Um, irrepar irreparably in my view so it's really important that the the infection is is isolated and expelled as soon as possible so i've got one final question for you um for myself and then i'm going to take some questions that have come in from the chat um and so in advance of the motion that went to the scottish green conference there was some suggestion from some people from uh, particularly from within the green part of england and wales who suggested that um 
passing that motion would embolden transphobes in the Green Party to, to think it's their home. Um, what would you say to those people? Why do you think they're wrong? I think people are looking at it in the wrong way if they're looking at that. In, in, in essence, it should be seen as a tool. You know, you can actually look and say, look, if we don't tackle this, this is going to become more and more of an issue. Um, I know the Green Party of New Zealand, uh, for example, have also had issues with the Green Party of England and Wales uh, on this. So, you know, it's it's becoming a really big problem. If it's, you know, several different European and, and Green Parties around the world are saying that this is something you guys need to tackle, those who are trying to tackle this problem can reference that in debates, in arguments, in policies. Um, so I would say, actually, it's a tool that can be used. Don't get me wrong, it's... It's not a, a nice thing to be involved in. You know, um, I said in my speech to conference that we do this with sadness. Um, I know some people might have seen cheers, etc., when the motion passed. That wasn't cheers because, you know, we dislike our sister party and members of our sister party. That wasn't anything to do with that. That was cheers because we could see overwhelming support within our own party that this is not going to be tolerated. Um, and it was the only tool that we had available. We had, as you know, sister parties engaged with, with colleagues down south to, to try and assist them as much as we can, you know, give them an idea of how we've been successful in tackling this, although, of course, we should rest our laurels about that. But, you know, we, we've had that engagement for quite some time now, and we're still not seeing the kind of change that we would like to see. So I would say to colleagues down south, don't look at this as a negative, because the first thing I would love to do at any future conference is to lift that suspension. That would, that would be, you know, a wonderful thing to do. I can't wait to be able to do that. So I would say to colleagues, use that tool that we've given you in any way that you can to, to fight this, this bigotry. So I'm going to go to some of the questions that we've got from the chat, which kind of follow <clears throat> follow on from a lot of what we've been talking about. So uh, there's a question which has come in uh, about what's happened since the motion passed. Um, so Phil De Palma asks, has there been any reaction to the motion uh, or engagement from the Green Party governing bodies? So from the Green Party executive or the Green Party regional council or the leadership? Not that I have seen. So the reaction has been muted, which was somewhat of a surprise to me. Um, but I would imagine that it's not particularly <laughs> something that anyone would want to highlight. Um, and the response that we received via the press, at least, was, and I'm being polite, less than ideal. Um, it seemed to, to paper over, over this as, a, as an issue. So I would suggest, I mean, I haven't seen any other um, you know, private conversations that have taken place. So, you know, I can't speak for other bodies within the party who may have had conversations or dialogue. And that this motion actually doesn't prevent that dialogue from taking place. Um, so I, I can't speak for them, but I can say that the reaction that I saw in press comments were was was less than ideal. And so we've got a question here from Steve C, who asks, um, how can the Green Party move forward? Um, when I say the Green Party, it's shorthand for the Green Party of England and Wales, uh, move forward while it um, has this schism on trans rights than its party. Uh, and they say, as a supporter, it pains, uh, pains them to see the party they generally see as the most progressive in this situation. And can the Scottish Greens help uh, beyond just this motion? Well, yeah, I mean, when, when I gave the speech, we had we had Zach Polanski, who I know is going to be speaking after this. Um, we had him at our conference and, you know, there was discussions with him about how we could assist. So we can still assist in, in you know, dialogue has not been cut off. Um, that's why I'm always reluctant to use, you know, severing of ties and cutting ties, etc., because it sounds as if we're just, you know, saying, hey, we're not going to speak to you again. Um, and that's not the case. So dialogue is still available, you know. I think some of us, I know I would certainly be more than willing to, to go down south and have conversations, uh, any of uh, the meetings of our sister party to see if there's any way we can assist. And I'm sure other colleagues would want to do the same. In terms of what was the other part of that question, Chris? I may maybe missed that. I've forgotten it. So I guess the question was how the Green, how can the Green Party move forward whilst we've got this schism in the party on trans rights? Well, it's not for me to say. Um, obviously, you know, we respect each other's uh, independence, but, you know, my suggestion would be that um, making sure your selection procedures 
weed this out, uh, vetting procedures weed this out. You know, we were very disappointed to see, you know, um, certain selections. I won't name seats, but I think people will know where they are in, in places like Sheffield, for example. Um, making sure your candidates aren't um, engaging in transphobic rhetoric or behaviour, I think, is really, really important. And you can, and I wouldn't say that's a negative thing. You know, you often hear, you know, of uh, diversity and equality training as a, a punishment um, in, in other parties, when really it should be a, a progressive um, learning uh, situation. Um, and I would say that that's something that could definitely, definitely be implemented. I would say engaging with branches who maybe have transphobic members, there's loads of different ways that that can be done in a safe way. Um, obviously, there are going to be some people who are not going to make it so safe. So I wouldn't encourage trans members to go to hostile branches to talk about these issues. But if it's, you know, a couple of people who have questions, you know, lots of people have questions. I was, I was looking at some statistics uh, for Scotland. I mean, the trans population in Scotland is roughly 24 to 23,000 people, which is 0.5% of the population. So one of the reasons why trans members are so easy to demonise is because there's so few of them, you know, in the general population, in, in stark contrast to, to gay, lesbian and bi members, you know, we roughly make up of maybe about 10% of the population. So there's more of us. Um, so there are going to be questions and there's ways that those can be addressed. So I would say those are those are ways to move forward. And I would also say looking at the code of conduct and um, at the end of the day, you know, I've heard some some colleagues down south use legalistic language, you know, gender critical beliefs are protected. The belief is protected. Staying in the political party uh, who doesn't share that belief and whose code of conduct you're tearing into and policies you're contradicting, that is still grounds for expulsion of any political party. So I would say, say those are the ways that uh, our colleagues can move forward in down south and, and anywhere where this is a problem. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Guy. It's been really interesting to hear from you and I'm sure it will stimulate lots of debate uh, in the chat. And it's good to hear sort of firsthand uh, from one of the people involved proposing it uh, for members in, of the Green Party of England Wales or people who follow the Green Party of England Wales uh, to hear kind of the rationale behind that and um, kind of where you're seeing that motion going next. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for your time. It's been an absolute thank you pleasure. So much. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Sorry thank you to so interrupt much. you. Thank you. Bye bye. No, not at all. Not at all. It <laughs> happens. We're on Zoom. We don't have the normal interaction. So, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Um, so that was Guy Ingerson from the Aberdeen Greens and the proposer of the motion to uh, suspend the ties of the Scottish Greens from the Green Party of England and Wales. Um, before we move on, I should just say uh, there was a individual that was being uh, referred to, not by name, um, uh, in that uh, interview, I, I I have to say that person, if they were here, would be would uh, and has consistently denied that they hold transphobic views, um, and so I uh, just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, so Steve C in the chat says thanks, Guy, for the illuminating talk. Uh, we've got lots of comments and questions uh, coming in there. Uh, please do uh, keep them coming in. We are hurtling towards the end of the show. Uh, we have one final guest joining us, uh, which is Zach Polanski, who will be with us in just 10 minutes. Uh, he will be talking about the current state of democracy in the UK, the constitutional crisis, and the what a fairer, greener democracy would look like for Britain. Uh, if you've got questions for Zach, if you've got thoughts about the interview we've just done with Guy, please do pop them in the chat um, and we'll try and pick up as many of the questions as we possibly can. Um, I can see Philip Davis has just said that they've just tuned back in to Bright Green Live and seen that we've now hit the 400 mark of subscribers. We absolutely have. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed today uh, and being part of our wonderful club of now 402 subscribers, um, which makes a massive difference to Bright Green and uh, talking uh, and will mean that you won't miss out on all of the content and videos that we're putting out in the coming weeks and months. Uh, there's 14 people watching. That's brilliant. A lot of you I can see are new. I'm recognising new names in the chat. If you haven't already, hit the like button. Uh, it means that uh, the video will appear higher in the algorithm. More people will see it. More people will get to see these interviews and we'll get to hear from Zach. Uh, Zach will be joining us in just 10 minutes time. So please do make sure you stick around for that he'll be our final guest of the day and i'm sure you have lots of things you want to ask him so please do pop them in the chat and also on the hashtag bright green live 
on your socials uh, so that we can pick them up there and we'll try and get as many of them put to Zach as possible. Questions in the chat. Also, let me know thoughts on the day so far, particularly on that last interview with Guy. Um, it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts on Guy's perspective on um, tackling transphobia in the Green Party of England and Wales, why the Scottish Greens voted to suspend ties. Also, obviously, we talked about trans rights in the Green Party with Anthony Slaughter, the Wales Green Party leader earlier. I'd be interested in hearing your reflections on that conversation as well in light of what we've just heard from Guy. Uh, so Phil De Palmer is saying that he's logging off now, uh, but nonetheless says that it has been amazing work. Thank you so much for joining us, Phil. I hope you've enjoyed it. Sorry you don't get to see Zach, but it has been a long day. Uh, I'm glad you've enjoyed it. Please do uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, please do uh, stick your comments and questions in the chat. Um, and uh, about what you've heard, what you're about to hear. And I would love to get lots and lots and lots of questions to put to Zach uh, Polanski at the end of the show. So we are moving towards the final moments of the first episode of Bright Green Live. Um, for those of you who've joined recently, the next episode will be on December the 11th. We don't have a full lineup of speakers, of guests booked for that yet. Any suggestions for guests, please do pop them in the chat. We currently have Rhea Patel, who is a councillor in Croydon, uh, booked for that. And also uh, they are the Green Party's equality spokesperson. We'll be talking about this very issue we've just been speaking about now, which is transphobia in the Green Party of England and Wales. Rhea will be talking about their perspective on how we tackle that issue uh, within, the, within the Green Party uh, in light of the conversation that we just had with Guy about the Scottish Green Party motion. Um, I'm just gonna have a little sip and then we can continue. So we have in the last seven hours, which is a long old time, uh had a big wide range of interviews now you can you can go back through and rewind the live stream if you want to watch any of those we kicked off the day with matthew hull from the green party trade union group with anna oppenheim from the labor campaign for free movement we then had jane jean lambert the former green party mep for london jay kerr and kaim zaung from the uh from no sweat and the industrial workers federation of myanmar respectively we also had uh, Jane Baston from the Young Greens, Anthony Slaughter from the Wales Green Party, Vix Lothian from the, uh, as the Green Party's education spokesperson, Chris Saltmarsh from Labour for a Green New Deal, Benali Hamdash, the Green Party's migration spokesperson, and just now we had Guy Ingerson from the Scottish Greens. Please do scroll back through, rewind and watch them. Uh, there's some fascinating conversations in there and um, I'd love to get your thoughts on them if you uh, haven't yet watched them, please do. Um, so comment here from ben in relation to the interview coming up soon uh ben says i felt like seven years ago the public were not open to hearing about the green party's ideas for a people's constitution convention they just wanted a yes no on eu membership we obviously then had the referendum we may get into issues of the proposals for a constitution convention with zach uh shortly um we've got lots of other lots of other interesting questions that we might want to get through um the uh the chat is buzzing it's hard to keep track of but do keep putting your questions in i'll try and keep track and read out as many of them as i can for zach before we get zach in uh just a few bits and pieces of final little bits of admin and plugging uh so bright green is on all the socials you can find us at bright group bright grn on twitter that's at bright grn on twitter you can find us on Facebook also at BrightGRN, so facebook.com forward slash BrightGRN. On the Instagrams, we are, are at Bright Green Live, and on the new Shiny Mastodon, we are on Bright Green on the UK server. Hopefully, you can find us there. Please do follow us. It means that you won't miss out on uh, the other interviews uh, and videos that we put on our YouTube channel. But also, for those of you who are new to Bright Green, uh, you may or may not know that on our website we host regular news coverage and comment pieces of the UK's Green Parties, the Labour movement, social movements, the wider left, uh, bright-green.org. If you follow us on the socials, you won't miss out on anything that we are covering and you can uh, keep track of everything we're doing and all of that coverage. Um, 
You can also hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Please do that too. It means that you won't miss out on any of our future videos. Um, I can see, so 402 people have now subscribed. Keep those subscribes coming. We've got less than an hour left of the show. Let's hit 4, 415. I'm aiming for another 13 subscribers by the end. I think we can do it. You can do it. Hit that subscribe button and you won't miss out on anything. So very, very shortly, we're going to be joined by Zach Polanski, um, who, if you don't know, is the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. He's also a member of the London Assembly. He sits on the Assembly, London Assembly as part of the Green Party group alongside Caroline Russell and Sean Berry. And he also, uh, as if you need any more titles, is the Green Party spokesperson for uh, citizenship, uh, citizenship engagement and democracy. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on in our conversation in a few minutes time. We're going to be talking about the state of democracy in the UK, particularly um, in relation to the current constitutional crisis we've been experiencing. Uh, specifically, uh, obviously, we've had three prime ministers in three months. They've uh, come to office you know, their party was theoretically elected uh, to government. However, they have changed uh, significant portions of their policies without ever asking the electorate. We've also seen uh, Boris Johnson, the disgraced former prime minister, in his resignation on us, appointing a series of cronies, former political advisers, unpleasant editors of national newspapers to the House of Lords, and an elected chamber, uh, which is an anathema to, to democracy. We're going to be talking about that what it means for the UK's democracy, but crucially, what a better democratic settlement could look like and how we get it. And so we're going to be talking about that with Zach Polanski very, very uh, shortly. Uh, a few more comments in the chat. Peter Barner says, uh, well done, Chris, for a very absorbing session and has asked me to take a well-earned rest. I absolutely will be resting in roughly 52 minutes time when we go off air. Um, but stick with us till then, because uh, you can rest while listening to and watching the show. Uh, please do stay on for Zach, who will be with us very, very shortly. Uh, Philip has said, well, make sure that I get a well-deserved rest and a drink uh, after all this good work today. Uh, thank you. I will be uh, resting and I, uh, I'm i teetotal, so I'll be having a soft drink. Uh, I think I've got an Orangina in the fridge. Uh, and now I don't know. I'm not going to shill for whoever owns Orangina, probably Pepsi or Coke. But Orangina is one of the best soft drinks, so I'm very much looking forward to that. And that'll be my post live stream treat. Uh, so in a couple minutes' time, Zach Plancy is going to be joining us. Um, as I mentioned brief uh, before, please do give me your questions for Zach in the chat, and I'll put as many to them uh, to him as possible. Um, I can see there's quite a few comments and questions coming through already. I'll try and scour through them and pick the best, uh, the most interesting and engaging. So please do keep them coming. You can also tweet them on the hashtag Bright Green Live um, or stick them on other platforms that take hashtags, whatever they may be. And I'll try and encapsulate as many of them as possible. Uh, so just a reminder, Zach Blansky, Deputy Leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, joining us imminently to talk about the state of the UK's democracy and a little bit about how we build a better one. Uh, so as soon as, as, soon as Zach uh, arrives, materialises, um, we'll get going. There's 16 people watching. That's brilliant. If you have enjoyed what we've been doing today, please do share the live stream. It means that more people will be able to see this video. If you've enjoyed the interviews, other people will too. Um, and uh, of course, hit that like button so that it appears in more people's feeds as well. And I'm delighted to say that Zach is just joining the call now. So it's my absolute pleasure to do a little bit of a preamble while Zach is connecting to the call about uh, who Zach is. I'm sure many of you are aware of him and know him as the recently elected deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. He's also, of course, a member of the London Assembly uh, alongside the brilliant Sean Berry and Caroline Russell, sitting as part of the Green Party group. And he's also the Green Party spokesperson for issues around democracy. Uh, so before we get into the conversation about the current crisis in democracy in the UK, uh, welcome to the show, Zach. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. How are you doing? Thanks, Chris. I'm doing really well and just want to compliment you. I'm sure it's been happening all day, but this is a really cool initiative and quite a marathon for yourself to do. But actually, it is really important that people hear from both voices in the party 
but also I saw someone on Twitter applauding the fact that you were including voices from the arts and culture too. So well done on all of those things. And <laughs> I'm good, thank you. You are very kind and you've done well to compliment your interviewer and hopefully that will mean they'll be a little softer. It's a very good well media framed. technique. So. <laughs> um, so I'll kick us off with some questions from me and then we'll go to some questions from the chat as well. Um, but it won't surprise anyone for me to hear me say that our constitution right now is an absolute mess. So we've had three prime ministers in three months, none of which, uh, w w w and th th those prime ministers have changed without there being a general election, without the electorate ever getting a say in the policy program that they're putting forward. You know, Boris Johnson's resignation on us is stuffing the House of Lords with yet more cronies, political advisors, uh, unpleasant media editors. What do we need to do to fix our democratic mess that we're in right now? Yeah, it can't be over uh, overspoken how bad things are right now. And in fact, in the short time that I've been deputy leader in these last couple of months, we've had three prime ministers and two monarchs. So things are certainly in flux right now. And also, I think whenever we speak out and say uh, there should be a general election and it's not right that Rishi Sunak should gain someone else's mandate and keep claiming he's going back to the original manifesto. So pretending Liz Truss disaster didn't even happen. People say, but we don't have a presidential system in this country and actually there is no need for a general election. And to be fair, they're right if we're looking purely in terms of uh, the rules. Yes, absolutely. They don't need to have a general election and they could go until the very end. But you also have to have a moral and uh, frankly, ethical authority to govern. And I think that was lost in our first prime minister after, um, well, the first prime minister since the last election, which was Boris Johnson. It gets confusing with all these prime ministers. I think Liz Truss was clearly pushing it already in terms of that should never have really been allowed to happen, let alone the fact that she sent everything veering off a cliff. But even if she had carried on uh, under Boris Johnson and carried on with kind of that ide ideology and programme, there would have still been an argument that it wasn't right to keep doing that. But now that we've got onto our third prime minister, there is just no acceptable or coherent form to say that they shouldn't now be going to the people to decide what to do. But in terms of your question, a lot of this more is about prevention because we're in this situation where the Conservatives have a big majority. And frankly, we can shout general election as much as we want to. And I think it is important that we do because I think after 12 years of the Tories, people frankly do want to see people on TV and radio and on their doorstep saying, yes, we agree, there should be a general election. Um, but I think the fact that we know it's probably unlikely doesn't mean it should stop us doing it. But it does mean we need to coalesce both as a green movement, but also with people that we share these values with and have these important conversations about how do we make sure these things don't happen in the future. I think the most obvious priority is we need a written codified constitution. Whenever I say written constitution, uh, pedants, and they're quite right, always say, no, we have written constitutions, but they're just not all in one place. So I think, you know, that is a fair point. Codified constitution that's in one place and is very, very clear what the rules are. And I think that runs throughout politics, by the way. When I was elected to the London Assembly, uh, which is by proportional representation, so there's a really good uh, culture and atmosphere where you work with other parties, but there's often times where as a new assembly member, you would come up to things and you would turn to secretariat. So they're a bit like the civil service, they're neutral and say, what, what's the rule here? What, what do I have to do? And they kind of just shrug and they can tell you what convention has been, but convention is only convention until someone decides to change it. And hopefully they're changing it with goodwill for the better. But I don't think you should run a country like that, particularly when we've seen that often the conservatives have not uh, governed in, in good faith. So that's one thing is a written codified constitution. So it's really clear everything that's happening. Then I think there's a whole conversation that needs to be had with the media. Now, this is a complicated conversation because as a party, we believe in the free press. We believe in the rights to be, uh, for people to be able to say what they want, as long as it's not hurting anyone and it's not trampling on anyone's rights. But at the same time, we have seen a conservative government that has been far too cosy with the mainstream media in particular. And that is not the um, government's fault in some ways, like they shouldn't be doing that. But actually, we should have a system where the media feel empowered to go, well, that's clearly not appropriate. And we don't need to do that. And that's against the rules. So we're not going there. I think it's inevitable when you have some of these conservative politicians in government, that they will push it as far as they can. And ultimately, you need the integrity of those journalists to be able to say no. 
It's a side issue, but it's really important to talk about is local journalism. So that is massively being degraded. Uh, this is probably a, a good moment again, Chris, to plug Bright Green and the brilliant work you do. But actually lots of organisations that are doing similar work in different spaces that absolutely need people's support. And in fact, the BBC right now are facing huge cuts in their local radio services. And literally minutes before I came on uh, on air here, I just saw that some of their Afro-Caribbean local channels are also under threat as well. And essentially you need those local stations both geographically because they bring communities together but also across ethnicity divides or sexuality or culturally those things are really important to bring people together and ultimately if we just end up with homogenous national radio and national tv that is not good for local democracy or good for communities so that's really important too and then finally in this very long answer i've left it till last but of course we need proportional representation and um, i've left it till last because i talk about proportional representation all the time and i think that's important i think we're coming to a point where other people are now talking about proportional representation so i'm starting to make the new point which um i've heard you made before chris actually when you did a, a really good lecture with the young greens where you talk about democratic reform cannot just be proportional representation it needs to be a whole host of things and i agree um, I used to say proportional representation is not a panacea. And then the brilliant Kleiner Jordan, who runs Make Votes Matter, uh, said to me, stop saying it's not a panacea, because when do we ever say anything as a panacea? And I think that's quite true. Nothing in politics should ever be a panacea. So when people try and paint proportional representation as not being a panacea, it's kind of a ridiculous argument because nothing in and of itself is ever going to be the thing that solves everything. But I do think it's fair to say that with the barrier of an unfair electoral system, things will never change sustainably. So actually, we need to get that electoral system fixed. So then we can look at the codified constitution, a different relationship with the media, the way that we fund political parties, the way that people are allowed to lobby, the way things campaign, there's a whole host of issues. Uh, rallying against voter ID, then we're into public, uh, public order and, and policing protest. All of those things are vitally uh, important things that often get missed. But I think the big barrier to all of them right now is the first pass the post broken voting system. So you're right. Whenever I talk to anyone about proportional representation, I always want to move the conversation slightly broader than that one issue. And that's what I'm going to hopefully do now. Um, so beyond the, the setup in Westminster, the electoral system, how Westminster and Parliament works, um, what do you think a good, effective, genuinely democratic system uh, of governance in the UK would look like? So I think a lot of it is about politicians in power being willing to share that power and redistribute it in the same way that we should be redistributing wealth and, and income. So uh, to give a very specific example, actually, is my relationship with London Mayor Sadiq Khan. Now, I'm always careful when I talk about the mayor not to be unconstructive or uh, needlessly critical. And I would say being a critical friend is absolutely something that we've looked to do along with Sean and Caroline to build those constructive relationships. And we've really seen that be reciprocated. So there's plenty of time where the mayor has credited the Greens with ideas and often gives us meetings where we meet with some of his top policy advisors to talk about how we can navigate things. And frankly, I'd like to see more Greens in the London Assembly as I'd like to see them in councils and nationally. And I'd also like to see a Green Mayor. But if, aside from that, the thing that we're doing is seeing Green policies be implemented and make millions of people's lives better, then that clearly has to be the point of all of this too. So I think it's always important to work with people constructively. But the very first time I was ever able to challenge him in Mayor's question time and ask him about anything, I asked him about citizens' assemblies. So bringing the public's voice into the chamber. And the answer he gave me was really telling. He said that I was in danger of making myself redundant and i think this is a real difference between the green party and some of labor some of labor get our get our kind of values but i think the top of labor particularly at the moment don't and it's that real top-down authoritarian kind of we have the answers and if we can just implement them then everyone's lives will be better whereas we believe in a much more community grassroots way of decision making now anyone who's in the green party knows that, that can be chaotic and it can be slow sometimes and i think within that you need to make sure you have red lines to make sure that the most vulnerable people in the conversation are always protected and of course I'm referring there in particular to making sure we're defending trans people in the party and their their identity. But I think on most issues, a healthy debate uh, in a democratic way where everyone gets to put their voices forward and things are voted on is a really good way of doing democracy. And I think we need to see more of that, both at national politics and at local politics or citizens assemblies. And then there's a slightly different thing, too, that I'm pushing in London at the moment, which is something called the London Climate Panel. Now, the mayor's really good at working with big organisations like Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth. And I applaud that. I'm not saying any different. It's really good that he's working with climate organisations. But what he often misses, and I see mayors all over 
the UK and council leaders doing this too, is they often miss those hyper local groups because they just don't feel important enough or they don't have access to the same representation. So they kind of get missed in the mix. I'm talking about groups that are trying to save a tree at the end of their road, or they're looking at an abandoned building that's in the area that shouldn't be knocked down, but could actually be turned into a community space. And I said, I'd really like to see these groups, particularly ones that are from working class backgrounds or people of color, get, being given a platform on a panel where they're able to make recommendations to me as chair of the Environment Committee, or ideally even to the mayor. So to be able to directly speak to him and say, these are the things we would like in our communities. The mayor was pretty warm about this until I made a vital point that these people should be compensated for their time and labor. It doesn't seem right that you would take people who are struggling to feed their kids or um, heat their homes and say, we need all your lived experience, all your trauma, all the problems that you've had. We're going to take all that expertise, but we're not going to re recompensate you. We're just going to make everyone else's lives better. And he said to me that I shouldn't knock good citizenship and that all over our city, you had scout leaders and boxing coaches working for free. Now, that's undoubtedly true, but it really rings of David Cameron's big society, which wasn't a bad idea in and of itself. But when you're doing it as a cover for austerity, then it clearly is a huge issue. So uh, to wind back to the beginning of the question, I think there's clearly something to be done here between the relationship between citizenship who volunteers, but actually how do we make sure that everyone is involved with that and people aren't volunteering who can't afford to, but actually we're turning those things into jobs and that people are being recompensated and that actually we have useful jobs that serve the society. Care workers are a very often uh, obvious example of that, where it's something that's often been done by free, uh, done by done free, often by women in the family, but not always. And so sometimes it is less valued than very much in inverted commas a proper job and actually i think there's a whole conversation there about making sure we're valuing everyone's work and everyone's contribution to society so to finish off a proper democracy would look like where everyone's value is contributed everyone has a voice at the table everyone has a stake and also we still want politicians to represent people so i'm not doing away with politicians but those people need to be able to be held accountable and we need to end the culture of safe seats so I'm going to get some questions from the chat in a moment. And uh, one thing you mentioned there was citizens assemblies. And I can see there's some questions come in on that specific issue. But before we do that, I've got one final question for you from me, um, which is you talked quite eloquently there about the kind of vision for a new democracy, the critique of the current constitutional settlement. And I think a lot of people watching this will be thinking, well, that's all well and good, but one of the problems with the um, campaign for political reform is that the very people that we are asking to deliver it are the ones that currently benefit from the status quo. So the Tories obviously massively benefit from the first past the post electoral system. They benefit from the House of Lords. They benefit from our current centralised, uh, I mean, I think it's the most centralised um democracy in in europe um the tories could very clearly benefit from that realistically we're not going to get any meaningful democratic reform out of the tories the labor party also significantly benefit from the status quo uh you know the first past the post system maintains them as one of two parties of power and um, even though at the moment it appears to be slightly rigged against them nonetheless it still um significantly benefits them relative to other parties but also it maintains that that party's uh, grip on power and it maintains the the political contradictions that are within the labor party within the labor party and you don't get for example um a um a you know a political party of the left in the labor tradition outside of what is now the labor party so it doesn't make any sense in any in any in any real world for you know the likes of jeremy corbyn and john mcdonald to be in the same political party as we're streeting and yet they are and that that's maintained by our current democratic setup and so i guess the point i'm trying to get to really is you know we're not going to get democratic reform anytime soon from the tories and it looks unlikely that we're going to get meaningful democratic reform from the labor party because they they are the two primary beneficiaries of the current status quo so what's the strategy there? How do we ensure that the next Labour government, or even if you think it's possible, the Tory government, to introduce meaningful political reform and start to move towards the kind of democratic setup that you want to see? Yeah, so I winced a little bit because I don't think it's going to come from the Tory government. I think that uh, I just had a pause where I thought, well, actually, maybe if we do have another Tory government, we've got to think, how do we get to that? But I think yeah, if we have another Tory government, apart from the 
the chaos and the absolute devastation that will cause for so many of the most vulnerable people in society. I also think that will push political or uh, democratic reform further down down the road as well. And, and that's something we can't afford. Um, I think I've got two caveats before I answer the question. One is, um, I, I think it was fair to say that we would talk to Labour tomorrow morning if they wanted to talk to us. So something I hear frequently, but particularly since I've become deputy leader and I go in certain spaces is, why are you not talking to the Labour Party? Why are you not trying to reach out to Keir Starmer? And why did Caroline Lucas shun uh, the previous le uh, Labour leader? And I think the important thing to say is none of those things are true. So uh, Caroline Lucas in particular wrote to Jeremy Corbyn several times and tried to reach out. And I don't think it's any secret that we shared more in common with Jeremy Corbyn as Labour Labour leader than we did with Keir Starmer, but actually both Labour leaders have suffered from what I would say is a culture of Labour Labourism. So I'm not equating the two people, they're clearly two very different politicians with different ways of working. But I think they both share in common that feeling that the only answer to all of our problems is a Labour government. And I think that's been incredibly damaging to the general left, but actually to politics and to society. And I think it's been damaging to Conservatives too, because the current system means that people who are in parties together should not be in parties together. And I'm I'm always in danger of uh, or always cautious about praising previous Conservative MPs because I think it's very easy to uh, make them sound like Anna Subri was fine and, and she wasn't, for instance. There were lots of things wrong with Anna Subri and a lot of the MPs that left and Ken Clark. But actually, I think it is fair to say they were better than the current group that we have. And what first pass for post meant is that all of those people had to exit the party and we've ended up with this party that's lurched even further to the right because they literally couldn't be in the same party anymore. And I see that happening in Labour Party. I, I do think it's quite weird to think of the examples you gave, Jeremy Corbyn and West Streeting, although of course Jeremy Corbyn isn't in the party at the moment, but uh, John McDonnell and West Streeting, for instance, being being in the party together. Like, genuinely, what do those people share in common other than not wanting a Tory government? You could go very easily into a policy and you, after a couple of sentences, you would see very different views. Um, on how to do things. And the second caveat I want to give, and I'm obligated to give this one, but it is true, is uh, Carla Denyer did a brilliant interview this weekend with Nick Robinson, Political Thinking. I'd encourage anyone to watch it. And Nick Robinson, I would say, almost snooty question was, well, you're not going to win under the current system. So how, you know, what is the plan? And Carla immediately interrupted him and said, well, I, I totally disagree with that. And actually, in places like Bristol West, that will be Bristol Central once the boundaries have changed, there are genuine opportunities for us to win even under the first pass for post system. Is that easy? Absolutely not. There's a huge amount of work to be done. And I would encourage everyone who can do to get to Bristol um, and help uh, support Carla's campaign there. But I'm always careful when talking about proportional representation to point out, of course, the breakthrough that we've had at local levels too, where we're winning council seats, even under first pass for post system shows we can and do win. It's just particularly unfair and we have to work, you know, significantly harder. Um, so to answer the question, though, what do we do about a Labour Party that just doesn't want to cooperate? Well, I think the first thing is we keep having to take the high ground, ground and the moral high ground, which is why I started by saying we do want to talk to the Labour Party. I don't think that ever gets to a point where we say we would never talk to Labour, we would never work with Labour. I think we need to keep that door open and recognise that after 12 years of a Tory government, people are really feeling it. And I'm talking about people who aren't involved with political parties, but actually they don't even consider themselves particularly political, but they just absolutely want rid of this government and their cruel and callous ways and uh, their treatment of refugees just being the first example that comes to mind. So I think we need to recognise that people are feeling that. And um, as much as I talk about proportional representation and democratic reform, I do recognise that is a different conversation to what people are viscerally feeling when they need food on the table. But of course, the link there is strong and that's the, the link I'm constantly making. So I think that's the first thing is to make sure we keep a high ground and always say that we are willing to talk to people within reason, of course, and that, you know, for any negotiations, proportional representation would have to be a red line on that. I think the second thing is to keep working with politicians and recognise people can change their mind. And I've seen Labour MPs in the last couple of years go from significantly anti some of these ref reforms to saying, yes, I actively support it, to being someone who is signed up and campaigning for it. Um, not proportional representation, but to give an example of universal basic income, I've been in meetings recently with Andy Burnham, uh, who is the mayor of Manchester, um, who is being brilliant on universal basic income. And there's no other way of describing that. I don't think there's any need to score political points on that. He is speaking loudly and clearly and making good arguments for why the universal credit system isn't working, why it's dehumanizing, and why making sure that we have a universal basic income that protects people, particularly people on disabilities, uh, people with disabilities, sorry. All of those important points is telling the narrative in the right way that it needs to be told. And I think we need to recognize we never have a monopoly on truth or the good, you know, the right policies. So I think every individual person in their constituency 
continually writing and lobbying their politicians, especially if they're from the Labour Party, is a really important part of that, especially now that Labour have backed PR. And then I think the biggest thing, and I don't like giving this answer, but it's the true, is it's a little bit of a roll of the dice. So for me, the worst outcome of the next election, unsurprisingly, would be a Tory government. But the next kind of scenario that I don't particularly want is a big Labour government, because we know that they would not listen to people. We know that particularly under Keir Starmer, they would be very happy to lean to the right and, and you know, just to get things done. But I think if they don't have that huge majority, they're already going to be thinking about the next election and they're already going to be thinking about the fact that there is this rising movement of democratic reform. So I think we essentially need to be ready for that moment to make sure that we're pushing uh, a Labour government, which would hopefully be in coalition or a Labour minority government into the right direction. I think that's a really exciting space again for the Greens. We see time and time again on councils where we're not in power, but we're in opposition, how we are the voices in the room that are demonstrating the difference that makes. And I think we would need to do that at a national level too, whether we had two, three, five MPs. I think it would be a really important role those MPs would play in informing that national conversation. I don't think that should be underestimated. Sorry, that was a very long answer, but it was a big question. Yeah, thank you so much, Zach. So we're running a little over time, but if it's OK with you and you've got an extra five minutes, I might just take one or two questions from the chat. Brilliant. Um, so please do stick any questions uh, that you have for Zach in the chat uh, and we'll try and take them. Um, and uh, the first uh, is from Ben Samuel. Uh, so Ben asks, what is the Green Party view on citizens assemblies? Um, so we're pro-citizens assemblies, I believe. We want people to come together and have those discussions. I think the caveat I always put in, and this is just because the media go, well, why have politicians then? Let's just get rid of politicians. There's a really important moment where you both need experts in terms of scientific detail and in terms of analysing things and, and presenting arguments. And there's no reason why a layperson shouldn't be able to listen to those arguments and make really informed decisions. I do think there's a point, though, where it's unrealistic to expect people to do that on every single issue ever and be constantly giving that their time to do that. So a politician, in terms of its their most fundamental duty, which is to represent what the people want, I think is still uh, a role that is really important in our society. So we support citizens' assemblies. I put the caveat in there that it should always come back to politicians in order to enact the the guidance that citizens make. But I think ultimately, we believe that power should be at the most local level it, it can ever be. And uh, that's why we constantly talk about uh, the importance of local councils too. And actually, I think it's always important to point out that we're not, we're, extra cash for local councils is really important. And I think it's worth calling for. But the bigger thing to call for, I think, is for local councils to have the ability to generate their own cash. And um, because otherwise, we're constantly in this kind of uh, hand-me-down uh, culture from government where they have to go with a begging bowl, whereas actually I think councils should be able to generate that revenue. I think we need to be careful with that because I think it increasingly looks like if gov uh, the government starts to say to councils, you know, you control your own council tax in, in this area, and then they start to punish local councils because they've not raised their tax enough, but not fund them in other places. And that's a cover for austerity. That is clearly messy. But the general principle that we should be giving more power to local councils, I think, is, is an important one. And citizens' assemblies is a natural extension of that because power is going to the most local level it can. Brilliant. Thank you, Zach. So uh, one last question for you. Um, so Philip Davis says that the current Green Party policy on the head of state needs to be rewritten as currently it would hand the head of state role over to the Speaker of the House of Commons. Um, so firstly, do you agree that the, the current party policy needs to be rewritten? And secondly, what would you what would be your preference for electing uh, an elected head of state? Um, I do think it needs to be rewritten. I think uh, we're in a different time now where there's a different moment where these conversations feel more possible than than maybe they were uh, for, for obvious reasons. Um, this is going to sound like a get out, but it is true. I'm almost proposing a citizens assembly on this in terms of it would be good to get a group of people together to go, actually, what is the best policy here? And I could generate a few ideas. So this isn't avoiding the question, but I think ultimately it's something where um, I would have a very London centric focus on this and I would want to hear what people in other places uh, think. Uh, I think of places like Gloucestershire, for instance, that would be very monarchy heavy. I'm not talking about Green Party members there, but talking about members there generally who would probably want it to look like one thing. And then you've got places in urban areas that would probably want to see another thing. And I think it would just be important, that actually, then rather than going, this is why I think and this is what we should do. We brought people together from different regions and different areas. And of course, 
uh, Wales as well, being its own separate country, to say, what, what, how do you want to feed in on this too? Um, and working with our party in, in Scotland too. So I think that's a really important conversation to have. I agree that it does need to be re rewritten. I think it's now out of date considering the, the very um, pronounced change circumstances to for one of a better metaphor. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's time to get together and, and create a better policy there. I think the one we have, um, it, it, it just isn't, I, th I think, you know, if the media got hold of that in a, a kind of long-term way, I think there's holes there in ways that we don't have with other policies. And I think one thing I'm proud of with as a party, we always want watertight policy. Thank you so much, Zach, for joining us this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. Uh, it's been a brilliant, fascinating conversation. Um, and thank you for joining us. I've loved being on episode one and I can compliment you again now without sounding like I just want an easy interview. <laughs> well done again. Thanks so much, Zach. And uh, Zach very helpfully segued me there to what I wanted to say to you all next, which is, of course, this is only episode one of Bright Green Live. We are going to be host hosting these uh, these shows once a month on the second Sunday of every single month going forward. So we will have an amazing array of guests and interviews coming up on future episodes. The best way that you can make sure that you uh, keep track of the future episodes is to hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. That means you'll get a notification when we go live in the future, but the next episode is on December the 11th, so pop it in your diary now. So uh, we're coming to the end of the show. Uh, we've had more than a dozen guests and interviews throughout the day uh, since we kicked off uh, this morning. I would love to hear some final comments and thoughts of what people have uh, thought of the show today so far. Stick them in the chat. We'll read out some final comments before we head off the air. Before I do any of that, though, please do remember to like the stream and to follow us on the socials. On the Facebooks, we're facebook.com forward slash bright grn. On Twitter, we are at bright grn. On the Instagrams, we are at bright green online. And on Mastodon, we are uh we are where are we are mastered on we are at bright bright green on the uk server uh so philip davis in the chat uh thank you so much philip for joining throughout the day it's been brilliant to have your comments and questions philip says cheers to zach for a good for the good answer presumably on the head of state and says well done to chris that's me uh and enjoy the rest of your sundays everyone please do let me know any other final thoughts people have on the stream uh before we go off air i wanted to say a quick shout out and a thank you to all of our guests that we've had throughout the day. As I said, there's been a dozen of them. They've contributed immensely uh, to some really fascinating and interesting, and intriguing, exciting, insightful discussions that we've been having throughout the day. Um, you are gonna be able to watch back uh, the stream as a whole, but also on the YouTube channel, we're gonna be putting out individual clips with the interviews so that you can watch them piece by piece. You can share the best bits that you enjoyed most with your friends, relations, and so on. Um, so those are going to be coming out in the coming days and weeks. I also want to say a massive thank you to everyone who has uh, been on the live stream throughout the day. I know that some people have been here since 10 a.m. They had, they were here with the panic as the uh, the live stream wasn't working. They survived, they, 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 they drove through and they kept going until the very end. So thank you to everyone who's been here since the beginning. Thank you to everyone who's been watching throughout, who's contributed to the chat, to the conversation on the hashtag Bright Green Live um, and has made this what, uh, what I think has been a really exciting first episode. And of course, thank you massively to uh, our donors who uh, have uh, made this happen. If you want to become one of those wonderful people, if you've enjoyed what we've been doing today, the only reason we, we can make that happen is through the kind and generous support of people like you. So please head to bright-green.org forward slash donate if you are able to and make a regular contribution of around five pounds a month. It means that we can put on more of the Bright Green Live episodes. It means that we can host more interviews on our YouTube channel. We continue our coverage uh, on the website bright-green.org of uh, the UK's Green Parties, Labour movements, social movements and the wider left. If you are able to donate, please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate. I'm just going to read through a few final comments before we finish off the stream for today. Uh, so Steve C, who's been a regular throughout the last few hours, he's given us a little round of applause. Thank you, Steve, for that. Um, Deborah, Deborah says, uh, thanks. I was listening on and off all day and I enjoyed all of the interviews. Thank you very much, Deborah. That's lovely to hear. I'm really glad people have enjoyed this first episode. We will be back on December the 11th for the second episode of Bright Green Lion. We'll be back 
every second Sunday of the month. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all very, very soon.